have been fighting on the social pediatrics front uh, for the on the neonatology side and of course uh, from um, dr tony and mambuli i can see and uh, our iap also salvas dr narayan and uh, uh, dr balajendra and dr um, joni as well as from the naushid and uh, from badagara side dr prem raj and uh, dr uh, prashant who always been spearheading the badagara activities over the years maybe 10 years he is spearheading all the activities and vishnu is always there to to take the and uh, roni as the convener and nelbi um, the and enough secretary so i am so happy that uh, the whole team is working around and uh, we hope we'll have a um, dr sandosh of course from batalasheri supporting all our activities so the whole our team is around and i wish uh, we'll have a great academic session here today and uh, this will contribute uh, we'll be looking forward to taking up our um, uh, a partnership with the, the foxy as well as obstetric fronts as, as a, on a perinatology front and uh, the moving ahead we will be hearing more about perinatology maybe with the, the active partnership from uh, our neonatology uh, friends in, in our fraternity so thank you very much and um, i wish uh, i am proud to officially formally inaugurate this um, perinatology conference um, the pericon uh, third pericon of um, the nnf kerala as well as indian academy of pediatrics kerala state branch and i wish uh, we will have more perinatology sessions very actively conducted by our <laughs> friends and uh, i wish a great scientific session for all my friends who have joined today congratulations again to vadagara branch and enough kerala as well as iap kerala and our foxy friends thank you and i wish you a great sunday thank you madam unmute yena madam unmute yena madam unmute yena വിഷ്ണു ഒന്ന് അൺമ്യൂട്ട് ചെയ്യാൻ പറ്റുമോ ആ മാഡം അൺമ്യൂട്ട് ചെയ്തിട്ടുണ്ട് ഒരു മിനിറ്റ് അല്ല മാഡം ഒന്ന് അൺമ്യൂട്ട് ചെയ്യണം സാധാരണ ചെയ്യുന്ന പോലെ തന്നെ ആ ബട്ടൺ ആ സൈഡിലുള്ള Okay. Thank you Ramesh sir for the thought provoking inaugural address now i call upon dr rajit s president kf og and today's guest of honor for his address good morning all good morning respected president ap dr tp jayaraman my dear friend dr ramesh kumar president cf 2022 Dr. T.V. Devi, Dr. Leda Subramanian, Dr. Vishnu Mohan, Dr. Jody Sebastian, Dr. Nelby George, Dr. Ronnie Joseph, Dr. Prashant Pavitran, Dr. Naushi Dhani, respected faculties, you can see uh, EMC Sir, Ambujem Madam, Dr. Jody, so many seniors are there, seniors and dear friends. I am privileged to be present here with all this dignity actually i could attend pericon 2 years back in vinad before the pandemic and has very sweet memories of that of that uh, conference great hospitality by the vinad team coming to the pericon we all know that the infant mortality has uh, decreased to very low levels now we have to address the perinatal mortality as president iap suggested there is a need of the hour to have a perinatal mortality audit because that is the yardstick of obstetric and new, newborn care a proper understanding of the perinatal period even though it's only a very short period it is very important in the life of a, a, a person and we need more collaboration between obstetricians and neonatologists and it will again sure that it will definitely prevent many stillbirth and the the, the infant mortality and if you go through the, the selection of topics excellent topics and we have great excellent faculty today i take this opportunity to congratulate the the badagra team iap team and the the neonatology forum and the iap for conducting it 
and would like to thank the whole team, especially Dr. Vishnu, for inviting me for this pro program. And once again, best wishes for this meeting. Thank you, Dr. Adikes, for your kind words. Now, I call upon Dr. T. V. Ravi, President, NNF Kerala, for his address. No, she is muted. No, she is not unmuted. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Unmuted. Yes, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, once again. It's indeed a pleasure and privilege to be here with you all this morning on a Sunday. On a Sunday. And that too for a very important event of IAP Kerala, which is Kerala Pericon 2021, hosted by the dynamic Vadagara branch under the able leadership of uh, Dr. Lada Supramaniam, Nevshi Dhani. As Chairman has mentioned, it's a teamwork between the obstetricians and neonatologists, which makes a vast difference in the outcome of newborn and the survival of the newborns, which is what we all aim ultimately. Because the last thing we would like to have is an IUD, which we want to prevent by all ways and means. And so parentology is rightly called as a fetal, fetal maternal medicine. And it's a specialty concerned with the care of the fetus and complicated high-risk pregnancies, which we need to handle as a team. Hats off to Dr. M.K. Sandosh, the visionary who gave birth to the perinatology chapter of IAP during his tenure. While Dr. P.R. Jayagumar was the chairperson and Dr. Vishnu Mohan was the secretary. This chapter was further reinforced by none other than Dr. M. Narayan during his tenure. And now T.P. Jaraman takes his able initiative to take the chapter to newer heights. Aim of the paleontology chapter is to strengthen the harmonious blend of professional skills of both obstetricians as well as neonatologists for the optimum benefit of the neonates, whereby we can bring down the infant mortality rate to a greater level of expectation. I'm sure the perinatology chapter will pay way for the achievement of our goal in the days ahead. I wish to place and record my appreciation for all the senior office bearers, faculty members of NNF, IAP, FOSG, and the senior faculty who have assembled here to make this a grand academic feast. Thank you very much for having me here and wish this function all success. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ravi, for that encouraging words. Now I call Dr. Vishnu Mohan, Chairperson, Perinatology Chapter, for his address. Yes, yes. Can hear you. Audible, audible. Yeah, no, no. Senior, President, seniors, and my dear friends. Okay. On behalf of the Perinatology Chapter, I take this opportunity to congratulate and mm -hmm. Team IAP Vadakara under the leadership of Dr. Lata Madam and Dr. Naushid 
for organizing our third pericon in a wonderful manner it was very heartening to have representation from the kfog society of fetal medicine nnf and iap come together here today with so many practice changing updates in the field comprising fetal medicine obstetrics and neonatology it's very important that we all come together on the same platform to share our thoughts and refine our practice for further protection in our sdgs like mmr mmr and imr i thank dr tp jaraman sir our president and dr johnny sebastian our secretary for giving us an opportunity today and also i place on record a humble request to ajit sir president k folk to join us to have further such meetings at zonal levels too once again a big thanks to all the wonderful faculty who have joined us today i pray that we all continue to stay safe among these testing times wish you all a great day thank you jai jn thank you dr vishnu mohan for those kind words now for felicitations i am calling dr vc manoj hod neonatology jubilee mission hospital for his address respected can you hear me yes yes ah, yes, yes sir right. respected seniors and my dear friends uh, i would not like to take any time all the video of the recon was uh, very well elaborated since the time we had the perinatology chapter inaugurated at talasheri we had various conferences uh, and uh, we were we had a grand physical meeting Uh, la, uh, uh, in the uh, pre covid era at wayanad and uh, this exercise is going on the basic idea is to have uh, a good platform to interact uh, actively and scientifically between the, uh, the maternal caregivers and the neonatal caregivers and probably this is the best platform and we are blessed in kerala to have such a great uh, rapport between the two groups so i am sure that in the future with uh, more and more programs coming up the um, the op uh, the obstetric and the, uh, the neonatal side both the sides uh, uh, being uh, uh, robbed into this program iap neonatology and uh, iap perinatology chapter has uh, really uh, uh, done a uh, wonderful job and it's going to do more so uh, let us uh, hope for the greener days ahead as uh, it is customary um, we need to basically remember our basic duty is to for the welfare of the mother and the baby as well and sometimes we forget that and that is when uh, issues happen so i wish all the success for this meeting uh, i congratulate the uh, team uh, vadagara and i and uh, iap kerala iap perinatology chapter for organizing this thank you thank you manoj sir for those enlightening words now i call upon kerala iap secretary dr johnny sebastian for his address am i audible madam yes, yes. a very good morning to all respected chairperson of lata madam president iap vadagara national president elect and my mentor dr ramesh kumar sir iap kerala president and my leader jayaraman sir guest of honor ajit sir revi sir and another president past presidents of iap kerala my dear friend vishnu mohan chairperson and perinatology chapter of iap kerala nelbi secretary nnf dr roni convener perinatology chapter dr naushi the organizing secretary and the man behind the pericon 2021 my classmate and founder president of iap vadagara dr prashant seniors and dear colleagues at the outset let me congratulate iap vadagara along with perinatology chapter of iap kerala and nnf for organizing this annual state conference the third pericon today with a galaxy of excellent speakers and also for the meticulous selection of the topics as we all know we need to utilize the enormous progressions made in the field of neonatology and perinatology for the further reduction of nmr 
and in turn the IMR. I am sure this webinar is going to be really informative for the audience today. I wish this conference all success. Jai Hind, Jai Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnny, for that supportive speech. And now I call upon Dr. Nelby George, Secretary NNF Kerala, for his felicitation. Respected seniors and my dear friends, good morning, everyone. It's my honor and pleasure to felicitate this event. First of all, I would like to thank IAP and NNF Vadagara team, Dr. Lada Subramanya, President IAP Vadagara, Dr. Prashant Pavitran, Dr. Naushi Daini, and the entire team for taking up the responsibility of conducting this state pericon and can have a common platform for the obstetrician and uh, pediatricians with an ultimate aim of improving the neonatal outcome. It's my honor to thank our IAP State President, T.P. Jairaman Sir, and St Secretary, Dr. Johnny Sebastian, for their valuable support. I thank our guest of honor for today's meet, Dr. Ajit S, President of KF4G, for accepting our invitation. It's our privilege to welcome Dr. Ramesh Kumar, Sir, President, Central IAP 2022, Thank you, sir. And I take this opportunity to thank PC Manoj, sir, South Zone EB member NNF for all the help and guidance. And thank our NNF president, Dr. T.V. Revi, NNF perinatology chapter chairperson, Dr. Vishnu Mohan, convener jo Dr. Ronnie Joseph for be being a helping hand in this event. I welcome all the senior faculties from inside and outside the state and thank them for, for attending and giving their knowledge to all the delegates. And last but not least, oh, thanks for all the delegates for attending this program. And I'm sure that you all will have a great academic feast. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Nilby George, for those kind words. Now I call upon Dr. Roni Joseph, Convener Perinatology Chapter for his felicitation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Lita, ma'am. Ma'am, am I audible? Yes. 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 Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. And it's my honor also to felicitate this event. And at this onset, I would like to thank and uh, congratulate IAP and NNF Vodagara for taking up this initiative to conduct this event. Your team has been doing a wonderful job since many years. And I thank Lata, ma'am, Prashant, sir, and Naushid and the whole team for the effort they took in building this up. And I'm sure the CME will be one of a kind. I welcome our guest of honor, Dr. Ajit, sir. Thank you, sir, for accepting our call for this platform. I thank our IAP president, Dr. T.P. Jairaman, sir, Dr. Johnny Sebastian, sir, secretary, IAP Kerala, for all the support which they have been giving us. Now, it's an honor to welcome our own Dr. Ramesh Kumar, sir, president of CIP 2022, who is our backbone. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation. I welcome, I thank all the NNF, IAP, as well as the KFOG fraternity team and for all the support which they have been giving us and is still giving. I thank Dr. Ravi sir, NNF State Kerala President, Dr. Nelby George, NNF Secretary Kerala, Dr. Vishnu Mohan, who is the NNF State Perinatology Chapter Chairperson, our own VC Banoj sir, who is a South Zone EBA member and past NNF President, NNF Kerala, for all the support which they have been giving us. I welcome all the faculties from the state and outside the state. And thank you for accepting our invitations. Wishing you all the best for the CMEs and I wish all the delegates and we're having a good participant this time and I wish you all the success, all the best. Thank you, Dr. Roni Joseph for those supportive words. Now I call upon Dr. Prashant Pavitran, CME convener, founder and past president, president of IAB Badagara for his felicitation. Respected dignitaries, it's a great pleasure for Vadagara IAP to host the annual state conference of perinatology chapter of IAP Kerala today, 6 June Sunday here. This is eighth subspecialty state conference of IAP Kerala that Vadagara IAP is hosting and the second online subspecialty state conference after we hosted the Respicon Kerala 2020 in September. 
In these COVID times, this perinatology conference assumes great significance to public health and also to enrich our academics and knowledge. Utmost importance has been given to the medical legal implications in perinatology in this conference. JIP Jehan. Thank you, Dr. Prashant Pavitran. Now I call upon Dr. Naushid Ani for vote of thanks. Any audible? Yes, yes. yes, yes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good morning, all. First of all, I would like to thank IAP Kerala and Perinatology Chapter to give an opportunity to conduct such a wonderful conference in IAP Vadagara. I deem it a great honor to privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this memorable occasion. Let me, first of all, start my giving glorious to Almighty God for making today's occasion a resounding success. First and foremost, I thank our special guest of honor, Dr. Ajit S., President KFOG, who despite his busy schedule, has found time to grace this occasion. I also express my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Ramesh Kumar, sir, President Central IAP, for his valuable support and presence of this occasion. I would like to thank all eminent speakers and legends in gynecology, neonatology, and pediatrics who shared with us today their knowledge and expertise in their field or our field. I also express my thanks, heartfelt thanks to Dr. Uh, T.P. Jairaman, sir, our leader, President IAP Kerala, for raising the occasion. I thank Dr. Devi, sir, state and NF president, and Dr. Manoj, sir, Manoj CV, sir, national EB member. And also, I express my heartfelt thanks to Johnny, sir, and Dr. Nelby, Dr. Roni, and Vijay Kumar, sir, and uh, Dr. Vishnu, Vishnu Mohan, who helped all this for, for this conference behind the screen. And I also express my heart thank to IAP Vadagara under the leadership of Leda Madam, Prashant Pavitan, sir, Prayam, sir, Harida, sir, Shashidharan, sir, and Murli, sir, and Shinoj. And also, I thank Dr. Nandama, sir, and Thandu, sir, for the full support of this conference. And I special thanks to Dr. Dilshad, CEO of Parco Hospital, Multi Specialty Hospital, and Ragesh for technical support for giving a virtual platform for the program. I thank all distinguished invitees present here, accepting our invitation and all good hearts who worked behind the screen. Once again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Naushi. With this, we are concluding the inaugural session. Now I call upon Dr. Vishnu Mohan and Dr. Naushid Ani to proceed with the academic sessions. Madam. So uh, let's straight away go to our uh, academic session. So the uh, first session is on updates in cord management and neonatal resuscitation. Important topic uh, that we all need to be aware about and updated about being an obstetrician or a neonatologist or a pediatrician. So to chair this session, we have our dear mentor and uh, our senior leader of IAP and president-elect of IAP 2022, Professor Dr. M. Vijay Kumar. I invite Dr. M. Vijay Kumar, sir, to, sir, to take over. Good morning to all, the respected seniors and my dear friends. My pleasant duty is to introduce Dr. PMC Nair. PMC Nair, sir, doesn't require any introduction to this August audience. He is currently a Emeritus Professor of SAT Hospital Trivandrum, and he is a consultant in Kim's and Anandaburi Hospital Trivandrum. He is the first and I tell the best neonatologist in Kerala so far. And 
apart from his uh, academics i am also inspired by his very down to earth personality and a friendly nature also and the topic is nrp neonatal resuscitation program is a ever changing program and we have to update every year <coughs> and we have now 2021 guidelines and i invite pmc nayar sir for his talk and he has already written a beautiful article in pediatric companion i think that will be released by this month end about the recent changes in the nrp program over to you pmc sir thank you thank you vijay kumar so shall i share the screen hope it is visible yes sir okay so again a warm good morning to all of you so we'll go to this directly anyway i will start with a small history of neonatal resuscitation program you know dr william keenan the director of neonatology st louis hospital missouri is considered as the father of nrp he is the third person standing from the left here and 1987 the first nrp was conducted at new orleans by ah and ap and if you look at the evolution of nrp it is very very interesting because in 1970s some of you may not be born at that time 1970s when i was doing house rinse we were taught to give sodium bicarbonate through the umbilical vein that is a treatment for asphyxia now you know how wrong it was then came the story of mcconnell stain amniotic fluid that uh, it's very interesting again amnio infusion indra patam suction we started uh, initially in the 90s and i went to i, I remember still remember going to there is hospitals to establish the suctioning machine right in the delivery room and then came tracheal intubation and suctioning for all babies born through msa then came only for non vigorous depressed babies by 2010 and by 2015 and 20 we now know there is no need for any routine tracheal suctioning so it is a very interesting story as um, was the vishnu said so and so many changes are happening every 5 years this um, nrp committee joined to come out with the best evidence based medicine so that is why so many changes are happening and if you know what is ilcor is international liaison committee on resuscitation they are uh, represented by 18 countries 281 experts they meet every 5 years and discuss all the rcts systematic reviews meta analysis and come out with a con consensus on science and treatment recommendations which comes out as the nrp test book so sometimes it looks quite uh, confusing for us but that is the reason why changes are happening every 5 years so let us with this background let us go into the nrp and what all the new changes are there we all know the basic steps are the initial steps ventilating and oxygenating initiating chest compressions and medications the time is precious delay can be damaging so each step we should not take more than 30 seconds and we follow the inverted pyramid approach that means um, drugs and intubation occur only hardly 1% of the cases so organization resuscitation for any organization to strong we should anticipation preparation and training so first we start with the four pre birth questions to the obstetrician then we counsel the mother as well as the family then form a team with a team leader with team briefing etc and also equipment check which is very important because all the equipment should be available and in working condition minimum preparation is a resuscitation corner and there should be a skilled person for resuscitation now we, let us see what are the eighth edition 2021 practice changes actually the book is supposed to be out by june 2020 this month and the first is the four pre birth questions <clears throat> now <clears throat> sorry yeah, we know that gestation age amniotic fluid whether it is clear meconium or blood stain additional risk factors how many babies is included now in the additional risk factors and the fourth is taken as a umbilical cord management plan 
So the four pre-birth questions in the last edition was gestation age, amniotic fluid, how many babies and additional risk factors. Now the how many babies are included under the additional risk factors and umbilical cord management plan has been given a lot of importance. So why this is important, we just um, go through that. You know, the delayed cord clamping means waiting at least 30 to 60 seconds before clamping the umbilical cord in term newness gives nearly about 80 ml of placental blood to the baby. So called placental transfusion. And so this is very important uh, because 40 to 50 milligram per kg of iron is also transfused to the baby, which pre can prevent iron deficiency anemia. So what is the recommendation now is <clears throat> NRP and WHO clearly states that delay cord clamping for 30 to 60 seconds for both term and preterm babies who do not require resuscitation. And I think most of the hospitals, obstetricians, and the neonatologists are following this right now. And European guidelines also support the same. They are for more than 60 seconds, even up to one to three minutes. So delay in the cord clamping, you have got a lot of advantages because higher blood pressure, higher blood volumes, less intraventricular hemorrhage of all grades, less anemia, less need for transfusions, and less NEC. And uh, in preterm babies, it is almost like nature's first stem cell transplant. It decreases mortality by 32%, decreases the need for ionotropes, need for blood transfusion, decrease intraventricular hemorrhage, periventricular leukomalacia, NEC, etc., improves hemoglobin and iron stores, increase the myelin content at four months and neurodevelopment outcome at four years. <clears throat> so recently we had this Professor Subairaj Agai from Thomas Jefferson University, Philadelphia. He was speaking for the, our Learn from the Legends in January. You, you are saying that with, despite the strong recommendations and proven benefits, disease is not routinely performed in newborns. That is why they go into the last mile. That attitude has come. And livestock trolley is also good. You can do the resuscitation with continuing placental transfusion, placental circulation going on at the bedside of the mother. Now comes the other point is umbilical cord milking. <clears throat> We know that umbilical cord milking can also be done. That is, the umbilical cord is grasped and um, milked towards the baby in a rapid time frame, usually within 20 seconds. Even uh, about um, the 50 years back, actually our obstetricians are doing that. So for that, we should appreciate them. Then that time, actually we were going and fighting with them, don't waste time, give the baby to us. But they were doing that even those days. And there are two types of umbilical cord milking, intact umbilical cord milking, where the cord is not cut. And this is the picture by, again, by Dr. Satyan Leshmi Narasimhu, who we heard his talk on PPH. It's a wonderful pictorial representation he gives, how we come compress in the cord that improves the restoration of left ventricular preload, improvement in the pulmonary and cerebral blood flow. These are the beneficial effects of umbilical cord milking. And we also, the other method is called cut umbilical cord milking. Most of the um, places they are doing that because it is easier. Cord is cut about 25 centimeters from the baby and they milk towards the baby three to four times with a speed of 10 centimeters per second. <clears throat> this again, that showing in that cord, umbilical cord milking. And this, we are doing a double blind um, RCT in uh, Anathabadi Hospital, and the Dr. Manoj and team from Tushar already done this study and cut umbilical cord milking. We have found it very useful, for, especially for cesarean sections and even in depressed babies. Now, the, what is the recommendation by the NRP is that milking the cord, routine use of cord milking for infants less than 29 weeks of gestation is not recommended. The reason is the rapid changes in the blood volume. Especially, you know, that extreme low birth weight babies, the germinal matrix is highly vascular. So it can bleed if there are any fluctuations in the blood circulation volume. <clears throat> okay, with this background, now we go to, as soon as the baby is born, three important questions you ask. Is the baby term? Is the baby having good tone? Is the baby breathing at time? If anything is no, then we go to the resuscitation warmer. Uh, other, otherwise, it will baby will be going under the mother's abdomen for tender loving care and temperature regulation. 
So the initial steps includes temperature maintenance, T, A, B, C, A for airway, B for breathing, C for circulation, and drying the baby, removing the wet linen, and during the drying of the baby, we do stimulate the baby's back, which, which most often causes baby to have good respiration. Uh, like slapping the sole, flicking the heel, all these are not advocated. Again, during um, my time in house surgeon center, we have seen the obstetricians taking the baby for the heel and then uh, what they call slapping the back very, very harshly, uh, putting in hot and cold water and dilating and sprinkling. All these are dangerous things, should never be done. So, gentle rubbing of the baby's back. That is all. Then position in the baby is sniffing position. He rosapu manakana parano. Sniffing position to open the airway. And you can use a shoulder roll also if the occiput is very prominent so that you can get a um, airway more straight. Then clearing the airway. No routine oro or nasopharyngeal suctioning of newborns in the delivery room. That is very strange because all these procedures we have found results are not that good. If, but if secretions are pres present, then you have to suction the mouth first, then the nose. So the alphabet M before N. And uh, you know about the bulb syringe, electric suction, all we know. We should not have pressures more than 100 millimeters of mercury. So the second change in the eighth edition is the initial steps recorded to reflect better the common practice. So warmth, drying, stimulate, positioning, and lastly suction. If we look at the seventh edition, uh, it was we were all following warm, warm, keep the baby warm, then positioning, removing the secretions if any, and then only drying and stimulating. But this is a common practice what people have been doing, so that has been included in the eighth edition. Warm. Dry, stimulate, while drying itself, you stimulate the baby, position the airway, suction if needed. Mm. Meconium stained amniotic fluid, even in a depressed baby, routine intubation and tracheal suction is not recommended because there is insufficient evidence of its success and more harm can be done by suctioning. So you have to be careful. So now what we do is begin initial steps of resuscitation, whether it is meconium stained or not, and still, if the baby is not breathing, go for. Uh, PPV. Now second, at the end of 30 seconds, you evaluate the baby for two vital signs, respiration and heart rate. If there is a pulse, uh, oxygen is used or a PPV is being used, then you have to add pulse oximetry also into the uh, evaluation method. Administration of oxygen. Babies above 35 weeks start with room air, less than 35 weeks start with 21 to 30% oxygen. Uh, European guidelines they say 32 weeks. Anyway, uh, whenever now the concept is in the in the labor room, you should have an oxygen blender, a pulse oximeter, and a 3D ECG. Most of most of the places we don't have it even today. Then the targeted predictable SPO, if you look at it, it takes about five to ten minutes for the oxygen saturation to reach 85 to 90 percent. That is why the color, which we used to say in the initial steps earlier, initial evaluation has been removed now because it takes five to 10 minutes for the saturation to reach up to 90%. And the first golden minute concept is also very important. You should not forget that you should not delay initiation of ventilation. So coming to the second important step is the positive pressure ventilation. Indications are heart rate less than 100, baby apneic, a gasping, or the pulse oximeter is not showing good saturation. And we have anesthesia bag, we have the self-inflating ambu bag, and TP is resuscitated and the laryngeal mask airway. We also know that the ambu bag should not be used for free flow oxygen as well as in contraindicated and diaphragmatic hernia. This, all of us are familiar with this, the basic equipment we have in all the labor rooms for resuscitation of a baby. And this is a different type of oxygen reservoir, closed reservoir and reservoir are open corrugated tube. And without the uh, reservoir connected, the baby will get only 40% oxygen because it is mixing with the air. And if you have connected the reservoir, the baby will get about 90 to 100% oxygen. 
And there are two safety mechanisms. It's also been you know, so quickly go through it. You say pop off valve or the pressure release valve, which will uh, open up if the pressure is more than 30 to 40 centimeters of water. We have also got a port to attach a manometer. And this is applying the mask. Apply the mask over the chin, mouth, and then the nostrils. That is the way how we put it chin, mouth, and nostrils. It should neither be too big or too small. And you can give it from the head end or from the side of the baby. And if you're applying the mask, the most important thing or the confusion that's happening is there will be a lot of leak of air through the side of the mask at the level of nose and maxilla. So you have to hold it very tight, like a C. Hold the mask uh, on, the, on the face with the thumb and the index finger. And the middle finger can be used as a E and the ring finger can hold the chin to the mask. So if you hold it tightly, it will be very successful. You'll see easy, shallow rise of the chest. And usually you do it at a rate of 40 to 60 breaths per minute. The mnemonic is two, three skews, two, three skews. Like that you do, it will be accurate. Okay. Most often if you do it very fast, you can cause carbon dioxide wash out. After PP started, reassess in 15 seconds. If you are not seeing an easy uh, rise and fall of the chest, Think of MR SOPA corrective steps. M stands for reapplying the face mask and holding firm. R for reposition of the head, slight neck extension. S for secretion, suctioning. O for tightly closed mouth. Open the mouth tightly and you may even have to insert an oral airway sometimes. P is increasing the pressure and A for alternate airway. This is a very strong suggestion by WHO and and our piece, we should use delivery room CPAP for all preterm infants with respiratory distress. Any preterm with respiratory distress in the and I in the de delivery room use the neopuff or a TPS resuscitator. So it is a fashion now that whenever we go for preterm babies, we if you don't have it one in the labor room, we carry it with us to the uh, delivery room for the resuscitation. Neopuff or TPS resuscitator. So the third change in the eighth edition is electronic cardiac monitor recommended earlier in the algorithm <clears throat> because the heart rate is the most sensitive indicator of response to each intervention. So when the alternate airway becomes necessary, cardiac monitor is recommended for the accurate assessment of baby's heart rate. So this is the change. Seventh edition, uh, electronic cardiac monitor is preferred. That is all I said. But in the eighth edition, it is uh, cardiac monitors recommended for most accurate assessment of baby's heart rate. Again, it's a, I know that um, ECG machines and cardiac monitors are difficult in the more, some of the, at least most of the uh, hospitals in government hospitals in Kerala. So we, that is what we used to do. First, we try the umbilical cord. If you don't have the stethoscope, based on the umbilical cord, you can get pulsations or you try the uh, auscultate and count for six seconds and multiply by 10 because time is precious, delay can be done and damaging. Then uh, pulse oximeter came into use, but pulse oximeter also is inferior to ECG. That is what they've shown in this study also. ECG picks up the uh, heart rate much faster and is more accurate in determining the heart rate, especially in the first few minutes. Okay, so, now that we come to the third stage, that is intubation. Intubation is recommended especially if uh, positive pressure ventilation, the back and mask is getting prolonged or it's not giving the desired results or suspected diaphragmatic hernia. Now, chest compressions also, it is a strong recommendation that you intubate before the chest compressions for a more effective compressions and ventilation. And it the tube size, as all, all of us know, easy to remember for preterm babies, 2.5 size internal diameter and ventricle tube, and term babies, 3.5. And uh, this is the new method of uh, measuring the endotracheal tube length, tip to lip measurement. You measure the distance from the nasal septum to the tragus of the ear and add one centimeter more. That gives the depth of ET. It's very easy. So the, as soon as the baby is brought, as we said, it may keep the, you can even keep the endotracheal tube in that position and measure the distance, how much it should go. So it is very easy. So it is replacing the previous decision of weight um, kg per six centimeters. Then correct placement means there will be a rise in the chest with the breath, clinical improvement, breath sound sequel on both sides, 
and vapor in the endotracheal tube. You can see the water vapor column moving in the endotracheal tube. And most sensitive one is said to be entitled carbon dioxide measurement by colorimetric method. Of course, confirmation by chest X-ray. This, um, some of our hospitals, we don't have it in many hospitals. This is a litmus or a color changing paper. So if the tube is in the trachea, the carbon dioxide that is coming out will change the purple to the yellow color. But if the uh, color remains purple only, that means problem. That means the tube is in the esophagus only, and that is why the color is not changing. So it's supposed to be very useful and helpful. But some of the um, Western hospitals, we have seen them using it. Then X-ray, X-ray is the final confirmation. The tube, endotracheal tube tip should be in the mid-trachea. Mid-trachea, and so they, it should be, uh, the tip should be adjusted to the first or second thoracic vertebra. Till recently, we were using the clavicles as a landmark, but now it is recommended that the location of the clavicle may vary depending upon the baby's position or the angle in which you take the x-ray. So look at the tip against the thoracic vertebra. It should be against the first or the second thoracic vertebra. Laryngeal mask airway recommended for babies more than 34 weeks and more than 2,000 grams. The main problem is it's very difficult to get size one or size zero in laryngeal mask airways. But I'm sure in the next five years, it will come up in a big way because uh, it's much easier than intubation. And coming to chest compressions, indication is less than heart rate, less than 60 beats per minute, despite adequate ventilation for 30 seconds and no heart beats. And we follow the uh, two thumb encircle in the chest. Two finger technique is no longer used. So the first of all, you decide to locate the side where you're going to do the compressions, uh, just below the nipple line or one finger breadth above the safety sternum, three is to one ratio and 100% oxygen is suggested when you're doing chest compressions. This is how we are doing it. Split the baby and giving a good compression, one third the anterior posterior diameter of the chest. And how you do it is one and two and three and breathe and. So that is how we, the person who is doing the chest compression should speak out loud, one and two and three and breathe and. Now the chest compression, the important changes are, you do it from the head end of the newborn. You can, you can do it from the head end of the newborn. Ventilation can be from the side of the newborn so that somebody else can do the umbilical catheterization. Electronic cardiac monitor is recommended. Intubation is strongly recommended prior to chest compressions and two finger technique is out now. Now coming to medications, epinephrine is the first drug. You know, previously we used to have a lot of drugs like atropine, epinephrine, and uh, sodium uh, bicarbonate. Similarly, naloxone. No, now only in the medications, adrenaline and volume expansion with normal saline are included. Uh, epinephrine can be given intravenous, intraosseous, as a rapid bolus, and every three to five minutes it can be repeated if the heart rate is less than sixty. The fourth important change is that the epinephrine fresh volume, intravenous or intraosseous, they made it 3 ml normal saline instead of the earlier 0 0.5 to 1 ml. Again, the reason is the, this much of saline may be needed to push the uh, medication to the circulatory system. Mm. And this is the important change. Seventh edition, we are giving 0 0.5 to 1 ml normal saline flush. Now they say 3 ml. And the fifth new change is epinephrine dose is simplified. Whether you are giving IV or intraosseous, endotracheal uh, or endotracheal doses are simplified. Initial IV or intraosseous, we give is 0.2 ml per kg. Previously, say 0.1 to 0.3 and all that. And on the table where we are in an ang anxious mood to save the baby, it, the calculations would all go wrong. That is why they made it easy now. Initial dose 0.2 ml per kg. And if you are using the endotracheal route for any reason, dose is 1 ml per kg. That's the seventh edition, just showing all the ranges and causing confusions. No, eighth edition, easy to remember. Initial intravenous or intraosseous 0.2 ml. And if you are using the endotracheal route, 1 ml per kg. Volume expansion is indicated, especially if there is antipartum bleed or pallor, poor perfusion. And the most important thing I have seen is poor response to recitation. And when you ask the uh, obstetricians, they may say, oh, there was uh, some antipartum bleed like that. 
So acceptable fluid is normal saline or O negative blend. Initial dose is 10 ml per kg or 5 to 10 minutes. And repeat once more if the response is not good. Then induced therapeutic hypothermia. This has become uh, very important now with moderate to severe HIE. The results have been good. So it's been suggested even in resource limited settings. Then withholding resuscitation or DNR, which all babies we should not resuscitate, less than 22 weeks, lethal congenital malformations like NNKFI, lethal chromosomal malformations like trisomy 30. But there is a word of caution also, take the family or the parents into consideration and region specific guidelines before you take the decision. So sixth new change in the eighth edition is cessation of respiratory of resuscitation efforts uh, by end of 20 minutes because you have done everything possible for the baby in the right proper way. Still, there is no heartbeat, no, no signs of life. Then you can stop the respiratory efforts around 20 minutes after birth. Earlier, it was 10 minutes. And during our time, it was hours. We used to go on bagging the baby for even six to 12 hours. So this is a new change, expanded time frame for cessation of resuscitatory efforts. So 20 minutes, Pro provided you have done all the appropriate steps in the proper way. So this is again, uh, Professor Satyan Leshmi Narasimhan's uh, pictorial representation. She is wonderful in doing this. Overview of NRB 8th edition changes. First is uh, four pre-birth questions umbilical cord management, etc. Then comes initial steps, warm, dry, stimulate. Then comes uh, alternate airway uh, and is introduced. A cardiac monitor is required. Then endotracheal dose is one ml per kg. And uh, intravenous or intraocious is 0.2 ml per kg. And the fresh volume is 3 ml of normal saline. And if confirmed absence of heart rate after all the appropriate steps, then you can consider stopping resuscitation after 20 minutes. Okay, so that is very important. And now if you come to the algorithm, 2015 and 2020 or 21 algorithm, if you look at it, it is almost exactly the same, except that the initial oxygen concentration for PPV, they included that more than 35 weeks room air, less than 35 weeks, 21 to 30% oxygen. Never go for 100% oxygen there. Then training frequency is also said that skill de 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 decay can occur by three to 12 months. So we should have more frequent uh, training sessions. Debriefing is very important, should not be forgotten. Then NRP e simulation, especially with this COVID pandemic, I think this should become more common. We have actually delayed resuscitation programs in Kerala also for a long time. The SIM new B is very good. We had training with the Vidya Sagar in this zone, but the problem is very expensive. It costs almost 40 lakhs for this simulator. Now the new NRP 8th edition, it's actually the, even the writing is slightly different. The guidelines are organized into knowledge chunks grouped into discrete modules of information. And each modular knowledge chunk includes a table of recommendations using standard American Heart Association nomenclature of uh, COR and LA. COR is class of recommendation and LO is uh, level of evidence. So this is a crowded slide. This is how they have done it for each step. So it may be becoming difficult for the postgraduates in the examinations if they start asking all this. And another important thing is the resuscitation quality improvement program for NRP focus on PPV. So this is a self-directed simulation-based mastery learning and quality improvement resuscitation program. And design is low dose, high frequency, quarterly learning and skill lessons. And Dr. Nimbalkar as well, just even in the last few months back, we had one uh, talk and he was also saying very clearly about this low dose, high frequency, quarterly learning and skill sessions. So with this, I'll stop here. So just remember that resuscitation, when it is needed, is a quick step. Time is precious because it is a question between life and death. So always be prepared. Be prepared means it is forewarned with something called forearmed. Thank you very much for the patient listening. Thank you. Thank, 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 you, sir, thank you, sir, for that really lucid presentation about most all the re recent, recent changes are included in the talk. And in the chat box, there is one question 
from Dr. Suraj Abraha. What is the maximum dose of epinephrine via ET tube? One ml. Okay. Uh, just, uh, earlier it is 0.5 ml to 1 ml. Now it changes 1 ml per kg. That is the maximum dose. I, I, ET, we were very happy giving the, my, my experience giving the um, uh, epinephrine earlier. But the American Academy of Pediatrics and Heart Association clearly say is quite erratic and the absorption you can never say. So the thing is preferably go for intravenous or intraocious technique, especially umbilical vein. Most of the time, 90% you'll get umbilical vein very easily, very big vessel. If it is very difficult, not getting in, and you're wasting time, that time you can try endotracheal. Otherwise, endotracheal is not recommended in the current version. Thank you, sir. I think there are no more questions in the chat box. Yes, yes. Uh, there is one question now. Uh, Wanted to share, Dr. Somasegar Nimbalkar, wanted to share that low fidelity stimulation is as good as high fidelity stimulation. Hence, mm -hmm. investing in... Sim newbie, he said Sim newbie, right? It's a large yeah, expense for 40 lakhs here. So that's a large expense. Uh, rather having more courses regularly is better. Yeah. We should start in the pandemic. How are we planning to restart the uh, training programs? Uh, so we have already, back. thank you, sir, for the questions. We have already made groups. I think many of the uh, uh, participants uh, have been there. And we started with the basic uh, course uh, for uh, all across India. And uh, we are training people on, on online on the basic course. And we are shifting to uh, the advanced courses soon. So even those videos are made and, and they will start soon. So we are currently kind of doing online training. We, we started somewhere in March and then this pandemic hit us and we were planning to do online also during March and April, but I think a lot of people got, uh, got a lot of relatives involved and hence we couldn't do that. So now we are planning to do online sessions at least for the next few months. Thank yeah. you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, Ramesh here. PMC, yes. sir. Okay. Ramesh here. Uh, so can I take this? Because NRP... Uh, actually, as Dr. Dr. Samashekar has suggested, we, we had some video modules prepared in the February, Jan February, and even in the regional language, so Hindi as well as English. And a beautiful, we got Dr. Vikas Goyal has taken up with uh, Dr. Samashekar. Beautiful uh, videos are there. But of course, in uh, uh, April and May, we, we could not push it further. But soon we are coming out, and it's on a hybrid, I mean, the virtual platforms as well as in the north, uh, wherever possible, we are going to take it as a on the physical platforms after August. So uh, almost everything is set just because in April, May, as sir has said, most of the members were involved in some or other ways with the COVID. So uh, sir, share a uh, share little bit de detail. Uh, regional language modules in Malayalam as well. Yeah, I'll just share it in detail a little bit. In uh, uh, NRP now, no. So yeah, so I'll about it, you know. Yeah, I'll share it in detail. Uh, so what happened is in January, in February, uh, I think Dr. Vishnu, Dr. Manoj, uh, many people had come. Dr. Ramesh also was there definitely, and we demonstrated the Hindi module of basic newborn care, and that was uh, uh, like evaluated by everyone. All the I think around forty experts have, had come from across India, and it was passed. Uh, after that, uh, the same same videos were dubbed in English. And once we have dubbed them in English in somewhere in March and April, we have now opened it out to a lot of South states. And the modules are, videos are there, the modules also there. Uh, I, I don't know who was supposed to translate in Malayalam, but a lot of people volunteered to translate in various languages like uh, Marathi and uh, Kannada. So a lot of people have volunteered. Uh, I, I don't know. Dr. Manoj, did you volunteer for Malayalam? I'm not sure. We said we will do it. Actually, yeah. we, we, we said we will do it. Yeah, so uh, the videos are there. Uh, they need to be the audio needs to be overrun on the on the video module, and we can have the Malayalam. So it's there, and uh, currently there are two languages, Hindi and English. And anyone who volunteers, the videos are available. The raw videos will be given, and we can write the uh, audio on top of the video. So then it will become accessible to everyone. So this is for the basic course. Yeah, thank you. Can I make uh, two points? Uh, can I make two points? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, one is a reality check. Regarding the when we practice NRP, uh, how many of the labor rooms do have blenders? That is one uh, very basic requirement when you take care of preterm babies and we don't have. 
So one of the suggestions was made it beautifully. PM sir, as usual, you are an excellent, uh, I mean, you are an encyclopedia of knowledge and you have given an excellent talk. Sir has actually suggested. So when you're going to uh, use um, bag and mask in preterm babies, if you do not have blender, one of the ways you can get around the situation is by not using a reservoir. Because the idea is to use around 30% oxygen. If you don't use reservoir and you connect to oxygen, you get something like 40%, which is actually much better than 100%. So these sort of uh, tricks to uh, actually, when you don't have the setting and in a resource limited setting, these things we should be very, very familiar. But there is no, that is not an excuse for not getting a blender, at least in the future. So blender, pulse oximeter, all these are not luxuries anymore, but unfortunately it is still in many delivery rooms. We, we talk so much of high theory, but what is actually happening in practice is very, very dismal. Yeah, uh, I agree, sir, some of the uh, province like um, ECG, I am not sure. We tried and failed uh, in this, applying ECG, we, ECG monitoring we do in, in NICU, in the delivery room. I am not sure whether I mean, anybody is doing. If you are doing, please share the knowledge so that because this is something that may actually un I mean, I really help in uh, preventing the overdoing or resuscitation. That is uh, one I of the things. I, 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 I can share something. We have been using uh, set, uh, the monitor, the saturation monitor since 2009 and the blender since 2009, 2010. So when in 2010, when it changed, I, I said we should get this first because before you tell somebody, then they will always ask, do you use? So I said, because I was doing a lot of NRP, I said, I, I will at least have it my, at my center. So when people ask, I can say I have it. So I think it's very important, at least for Kerala, because the uh, uh, in Kerala is... people are, I mean, uh, huh. saturation and bl blender also. I think 40. We took a, uh, I mean, uh, unofficial survey. 40 percent of senders are having blender, 60 percent are not having. But uh, my, I mean, like uh, uh, curiosity was about ECG. ECG. Anybody doing, I mean, uh, uh, three lead ECG monitoring uh, during delivery? PM sir. No, <laughs> because I even know. the electrodes we are getting are the big ones. No, so we get the correct files and we are using in uh, NICU, NICU, but uh, in delivery room, we could not enforce. Uh, can uh, I? One more point. Sir, one we, more are, point. we are 10 minutes late. Oh, so okay, okay. I'll just the make discussions make in the point. chat box. Okay, uh, okay fine. Yeah, I think sure, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Can Thank we you. wind up, Vishnu? Sure, sir. We'll wind up the session. I think we can discuss everything in the chat box. I think we are running short yes. of time. So okay. it was a wonderful session, sir. Thank you so much for that enlightening session. So Thank you. I think we can go for the next topic. Sure. Thank, Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much, Vijay Kumar, sir, for uh, moderating this session. And uh, uh, big thanks to PMC, sir, for that. Thank uh, you, Vishnu. Wonderful talk. So with this, we'll go to the next session. Uh, next session, Dialogue, Preterm Delivery and Care. I would like to invite Dr. Jairaman sir and Dr. Devi sir to chair the session. Devi sir, please unmute. Thank you, uh, Vishnu and the organizing team for giving us an opportunity to chair this important session in Pericon, that is uh, preterm delivery and care. Uh, as with the newer advances in uh, uh, management of uh, preterm newborns and increased incidence of infertility management and all those things, we are getting a lot of preterm babies and preterm care has become very much important, especially in the wake of uh, reducing the NMR and IMR. And we have uh, two very learned speakers for the day and uh, I thank for giving me this opportunity. I hope uh, from a perinatology point of view with a lot of pediatricians attending this seminar, I think uh, in this preterm delivery, I think you will be including care of the late preterms and late preterm delivery as well, apart from the extreme premature babies. Thank you so much. And I uh, invite Ravi to introduce the speakers. Good morning. Yes. 
it's in the it's in the honor to have a very, very eminent faculty audio has to be corrected now shit yeah clear sir we have uh, professor dr sarina gilwas Sorry, logged in through two devices. I think. Sorry, logged in through two sir, devices. Sir, is using two devices. Uh, sir, can stop that mobile or something? Yes, yes, Maybe, yes sir. Yes. We have uh, Professor Sarina Gilwas. Uh, Professor Nechodi Jubli Medical Mission uh, College, Tachu. From the obstetric side, and Dr. Tejo Pradam Oleti, senior consultant in HOD, Department of Neonatology, Fernandez Hospital, Hyderabad. He is a DM from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Delhi, and he is in charge of the stock home, the new state-of-the-art birthing facility. and maternity hospital under the umbrella of fernandez hospital hyderabad over to you faculty to kindly take over and start the scientific proceeding good morning everybody dr jayram dr ravi dr prashant dr manoj ladies and gentlemen i told myself at the outset i should say that i am also talking to a group of neonatologists and pediatricians apart from obstetricians so i would not go into the details of the whole thing but i'll just run through how we manage a preterm birth okay now um, what is the a format under which i'm going to talk to you about first is the magnitude of the problem of prematurity next the etiology the preventive measures how do we deliver a preterm a few case scenarios and the care of the preterm babe by dr tejo now when you define its infants born before 37 completed weeks now i did not say the onset whether it is 20 or 24 because that is still a dilemma okay now the prevalence if you see the who has estimated the problem of maturity as 15 million babies per year and the incidence of preterm birth in india is 50% among the total 27 million babies born annually so that would come to about 3.6 million babies in our country and the india tops the list of preterm neonatal death of more than 3 lakhs per year it's a phenomenal number So India actually contributes to twenty five percent of the overall global premature rates, death rates. Now, if you ask me, after all my years of experience, I will say that prematurity, the preterm babe, is the commonest NICU admission even today, and it is the one which is associated with highest morbidity and mortality, and that is more so with the very preterm. Okay, we have had a lot of advances in the management of a preterm birth, how to prevent a preterm birth, but I don't think we have made any headway. The risk of a recurrent preterm birth—that's again another problem for us. After one, we have got a risk of recurrence about fifteen to thirty percent. Supposing she had two, it's over forty percent, and so on and so forth. Now, when you come to define, actually, it is between twenty and thirty-seven completed weeks. and there are two important things that we take one is the uterine contractions and second is the cervical dilatation so when you find more than four contractions in 20 minutes or more than eight contractions in 60 minutes plus along with that you should have both cervical effacement and dilatation so a dilatation of more than 3 cm or an effacement that is the length of the cervix has become shorter than 2 cm then we say she is an established preterm birth okay now we all know that we define them as preterm as less than 37 the late and the early preterm that is the latest between 34 and 36 weeks the early is less than 34 the very preterm is less than is between 28 and 32 and the extreme extreme is the smallest e it's extreme less than 28 weeks and when you take it birth wise the weight wise the low birth weight yes we all know it is less than 2500 
the very low birth weight, less than 1,500, and the extreme, again here, less than 1,000. So normally we see around 20, give them around 1,000 grams. Now, basically, when you try to see the causes, I, I used to tell my postgraduates, everything is a cause for preterm labor, okay? Anything and everything in obstetrics. So whether she's had a recurrent bleeding in the first trimester, whether it's over distension, like multiple pregnancies, polyhydramnias, any placental problems like abruptio, placenta previa. She's had previous miscarriages, whether it be spontaneous or induced. She's got a fetal growth restriction, congenital abnormalities, and any infection. Any infection, when I say whether she's got a typhoid or she's got a cholera, she's got a cholecystitis, or she's got an appendicitis, anything will put the scales towards a preterm labor. And whether it be any symptomatic bacteria, genital tract infection, chorioamnonitis, urinary tract infection, any infection push the scales towards a preterm birth. Then, of course, the general conditions, when she's underweight and when she's obese, when she's got inadequate weight gain, she's again prone for preterm labor. Yes, smokers, whether they be passive or active. Maternal age, less the younger the age group and the older age group, the lower socioeconomic status and stress, stress. And then physical work, it's manual physical work, more than 40 hours per day. That means eight, eight hours per day, five days a week. Heavy exercises, people are doing only night shifts. All these conditions can take you into a preterm birth. When you take the overall incidence, the spontaneous or unexplained, we do not know the reason why, but 40 to 50% are going to preterm birth. Idiopathic premature rupture of membranes, and that is another problem for us. Okay, When they rupture the membranes, it's very difficult for us to conserve their pregnancy because they will go into an early chorioamnonitis. Then iatrogenic, maybe because she's diabetic or whether she's got a hypertension or an eclampsia or a health, we have to deliver them a little early. Then, of course, a higher order pregnancies. What are the symptoms they normally come with? See, labor pains, if you ask me in one word, it's actually menstrual-like cramps in a severe degree. That's exactly what it, what it aches. Okay? Sometimes they come with feeling of pelvic pressure or a low backache, lower abdominal pain, low backache, or a pressure sensation in the vagina or pelvis, vaginal discharge. Okay, she clearly tells you that it is pink. It could be it could be the show, which is normally the plug which comes out of the cervix dilates, or it could be an irregular uterine contraction. She'll say that's a tightening feel. So these are the symptoms the patient normally comes with. And let me tell you, if I'm to oversimplify it, there are just two ways in which we can prevent. I mean, that is not really 100%, but still, when you give progesterogens, you can reduce the preterm birth by 30%. And of course, we can offer them a cyclage. Now, I will not go into too much of evidence, but I'll just try to make it very simplified for you. The ACOG and the SMF have said that if there is a history of prior preterm birth, and if the ultrasound shows a short cervix, we normally say a short cervix between 16 and 24 weeks, less than 25 millimeters, that is 2.5 centimeters. Okay. So when you see a history of preterm birth with the short cervix, that is the patient, the person we can probably prevent. And then we can give them the injectable progesterogens once a week. And this has been approved by the FDA, the 17 hydroxy progesterone caproate, every week from 16 till 36 weeks. And we have found it very effective. So only if you've got a history of preterm birth and a short cervix. But the SMF has said that if you've got only a short cervix without a history of a preterm birth, then give them vaginal progesterogens. Okay. Now, when you say, where do you give a cervical cyclage? When there is a history of a recurrent mid-trimester abortion, that means she's got an incompetent cervix. We say an incompetent, normally when the cervix dilates, there should be pain. If this is a painless dilatation of the cervix. That is indication that she requires a cyclage. Or when you see changes in the ultrasound, looking at the cervix, either it's dilated or it is shortened or there is funneling of the membranes, then you see a rescue cyclage is when actually the OS, external OS is also open and you can see the bulging bag. So those are the indications when we can put in a cyclage. And the ACOG has said that we put in a cyclage, as I said, between 24 and 34 weeks and when the cervix is less than 25 millimeters. Okay. Now, this is what the emergency cyclage. We find a lot of patients coming like this. And it is very unfortunate that, you know, we can at the most prolong the pregnancy for a week. That's the most that we can do for them. But in such a situation, normally we put a cyclage between 13 and 23 weeks of pregnancy. But if it's an emergency cyclage, we can take it as far as 28 weeks, we can put a cyclage for them. 
This is how we measure from the internal loss to the external loss. We see the length of the dilated cervix and the funneling. And we take three measurements and the shortest cervix is what is taken. And as I told you, less than 25 millimeters. Now, when you come to the management, now this is what many of us are actually involved in. Okay. Now, she's already come to us and what do we do? Yes, we give them antenatal steroids. We give them tocolytics. And today they say that whatever tocolytics we give, the one who is going to deliver will deliver in spite of what we do. And third is magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection. But there are two no-nos. One is, will you give an antibiotic for a preterm? Yes, we do not have to give it as long as she's got intact membranes. She's ruptured membranes, it's a different story, okay? And progesterone supplementation as a treatment modality, no. You can give it for prevention, but not for treatment. Now, uh, rectovaginal group B strep culture. This is something which we don't do, and I would like to get Tedu's opinion on this. Urine micro and culture for asymptomatic bacteria, ultrasound, as you said, for cervical uh, assessment, fetal fibronectin. Fetal fibronectin, more than 50 nanograms. It tells you that probably she's getting into preterm labor within the next seven days. And what is fetal fibronectin? It's actually a glue. It's a glue which actually adheres the membranes to the uh, uterine cavity. And so when it starts separating, the glue comes out. So that is why we measure this glue, which is a fetal fibronectin. And we normally don't have to do if she's an established preterm labor. As I told you earlier on, if she's more than three centimeters dilated and the cervix is already very short, no place for fetal fibronectin. But if it is between 20 and 30 millimeters and she's before 34 weeks, yes. But unfortunately, even that is not available to us. Now, we do give two things. Either we give betamethasone or we give dexamethasone. Now, everybody knows the dose. It is 12 milligrams, two doses, 24 hours apart. And the best thing would be to deliver the baby 24 hours after the second dose. Okay. Now, there is a rescue. I would like to know Tejo's opinion on this also. There is a place for rescue according to the ACOG. They have said that if your initial course has been 14 days earlier and then she gets into labor, or if the first course was given before 28 weeks, and now maybe she's about 31 weeks or 32 weeks, or we are ex and we are expecting the delivery within the next seven days, we'd like to give it. But there is a problem of repeated courses. We must all remember that there is a problem of demyelination and cerebral palsy in the neonate. And of course, even uh, adrenal suppression and infection in the neonate. So we can give both betamethasone and DEXA. And uh, dexamethasone is what is advocated all over the north. And I'd like to know, Dr. Teju, Teju, what do you think about which is a preferred uh, uh, steroid? Would you prefer a betamethasone or would you prefer a dexa for your babe when it comes to the neonatal womb? Uh, so three questions from till now, madam, from the talk. One is that you said GBS screening is one thing, whether we have to do it routinely in the Indian scenario. So there is a lot of data on it, uh, in, especially in Southeast Asian region, when they had looked at the GBS uh, positivity rate, it is actually very low. Maybe the, now the socioeconomic status is improving and then cross cultures are there. And then we are also moving to a lot of Western countries and then where the GBS is more common and other things. So when we looked at our data also from the PROM, and amniotic fluid cultures and other things. Still, the Klebsiella and E. coli are the major organisms which have been growing since last five years that we looked at in the data almost from 500 cultures that we have done it for the amniotic fluid. So I don't think that routine GBS screening in Indian scenario is still should be a norm. Maybe it might change next five years, but we need to currently we need to we need not do it. Okay. And second thing we were discussing about this the DEXA versus beta is the first thing. Okay. So whether we have to go with the DEXA medicine or beta medicine. Currently, government of India will advocate us to go with the DEXA medicine. That is based on a lot of uh, other uh, discussions and uh, background check on the literature currently. So if you look at the current literature between the beta medicine versus DEXA medicine, there is no much difference in the efficacy wise, if you look at it, except one beta curve trial, which has shown that a little reduction in the grade three, grade four IVH when we have used the dexamethasone. Initially, when previously, if you look at the literature from the West, when they looked it in the animal studies and other studies, DEXA, they were saying that there could be a little more brain injury compared to beta medicine, but which has not been proven in the eff effectiveness trials or anything. 
Okay. So then they found it that it is due to preservative, which is there in the dexamethasone. Now, now that concept is gone. So currently both are advocated, whatever is the thing. However, the dexamethasone has been advocated by the government of India because of its uh, availability across the nation, because it is there in the emergency kit of WHO, which has, which are uh, primary health center, even at the sub-center level also, you will have the dexamethasone, which is available. If I am not, I think they have given the permission even for the ANMs to give one shot if they feel that the preterm delivery is imminent and then shift them to a nearby community health center, which is there. So these are the things that we need to do. And uh, I'm, I will go with your uh, slide only, madam, regarding the repeated course of steroids. We have to pinpoint to specific indications, especially if you have given the mother before 28 weeks and pregnancy extended by more than two weeks. And then with one by one discussion with the parents, I think we need to go with the that two with one single dose rather than a repeated course of steroids oh. that rather than this thing that is much better. Uh, being an institute where many people are from the trained in MRCOG and FRCOG, they advocate this in our institute. But again, we will go with one-to-one uh, -one discussion with the parents and then only we'll go. Suppose mother has extended to 34 weeks. I don't think that we will give it. 33 weeks, definitely not. Maybe the gray area will be between 31 and 32 weeks when we need to speak to the parents and then give one shot of dexamethasone. and that's the only thing we can say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Teju. So it does reduce incidence of RDS, decreases mortality of intraventricular hemorrhage, and necrotizing enterocolitis. And when you take the tocolytics, yes, we have got all these available. But in that, basically, there are only two that we normally use. And I'll tell you what we use. We use a nifedipine. We use nifedipine as a tocolytic agent. We start off with 30 milligrams. Uh, to start with and then 20 milligrams eight hourly it's preferred not to give it beyond 72 hours and today actually as i was telling you earlier we find that after that we can give a stop and then if required if she gets into preterm pains again you can restart the nifedip that will be better than giving it continuously magnesium sulfate a very poor tocolytic indomethacin yes it's very good but i just want to give you all a word of caution don't use indomethacin beyond 32 weeks okay don't use it beyond 32 weeks. It is excellent. It is very good. 50 milligrams and then 25 milligrams uh, uh, fourth hourly, but preferably not to give it beyond 48 max 72 hours. Don't give it beyond that because we have got the closure of the premature ductus. And if you give it beyond 32 weeks in you know, acetocolytic agent, what happens is there is oligohydramnios and fetal renal failure. So it is best that you don't give it. So indomethacin preferred before 32 weeks. And beta sympathomimetics, yes, we are still using a lot of duadlon. The three beta sympathomimetic drugs, one is retodrin, we don't get it anymore now. Terbutalin, we do not get it. So what we use is actually duadlon. And uh, oxytocin receptor antagonist, we have got atosuban because now today in Jubilee, we are doing an ICMR project on atosuban and so we have got it. It is a good drug. The only thing I can tell you is very little side effects. So it is good. But its efficacy, yes, I will tell you as we have finished our, as we finish our study. So if you are trying to see magnesium sulfate, yes, it is given between 24 and 32 weeks only for its neuroprotective effect, not for its tocolytic, okay? And uh, when we expect delivery within the next 24 hours, there are three different doses. One is four grams IV bolus followed by one gram per hour. There is another ACOG says six grams and two grams per hour. There are some others who say four grams bolus dose. I'll ask Teju for his opinion on that. And then actually after we have given it in case the pains abate, you can repeat it next time she gets the pains. Don't keep on giving magnesium sulfate because if you give more than a week, they say there is actually even osteopenia in the baby. Okay, so remember that. Then a good combination with magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection is indomethacin rather than nifedipin. And uh, we were talking about the group B strep. He has already told you everything about it. Even we don't do a culture, but we always give ampicillin. And when we ask the PG and we tell, I tell myself, yes, we're giving it for prevention of group B. Is that the reason why you see less of them? I do not know, Dr. Teju. Okay. So delivery normally is conducted in a tertiary care center with good neonatal facilities. Very important. Neonatal counseling is very important because we must feel the uh, purse of the patient and the bystanders. Continuous electronic fetal monitoring, preferred antibiotic prophylaxis, what we give is ampicillin, two grams and one gram for Thali. Again, then we give it for group. Is that the reason why you see less numbers? I do not know because we give it uniformly all over. 
epidural and LGCS preferred. We don't like a fetal, uh, scalp electrode or fetal blood sampling. Routine episiotomy, as was thought earlier, is not required anymore. Vaginal uh, forceps is preferred rather than a vac foam because vac foam on the fragile head, it might cause more damage. Preferred mode of delivery is vaginal, and I'm very particular about that. As long as you can deliver a non-hypoxic infant, I think vaginal mode is the best. In fact, it even reduces the incidence of RDS. Caesarean only for obstetric indications and timing of cord clamping for the preterm. Dr. Teju, don't you think that it is because we are giving this emphasis in the UCLS of group B strep? Could that be the reason? See, madam, group B, they screen before the delivery only, actually. It is not during the labor pain or this thing okay. in abroad. So I don't think that we still need to worry no, no. about that. No, no, you were telling us that you don't see many in your, uh, when you culture, you don't get so much, you get Klebsiella and other. Yes. Is sir, that sir. The, could This could be the reason I also. I don't think so, but I'm still mm -hmm. our uh, flora, sir, in the Klebsiella and E. coli okay. range. Okay. I don't okay. think that's fine, fine, fine. And then the timing of cord clamping is very important. Wait for 30 seconds, but no longer than three minutes. I'll tell you how we do it. We do it in our hospital for the preterms. It is done three times times in 30 seconds okay you make it once twice thrice you cut the cord 10 centimeters long the baby should be kept lower than the mother's bottoms okay so that there is a, a, a surge of blood to the baby keep the baby at a lower level delay the cord clamping or milking of the cord is associated with uh, uh, delayed cord clamping and the milking of the cord is associated with decreased need for blood transfusion less chance of neonatal anemia nec and ivh so, uh, what do you have to say about the uh, milking of the cord, Dr. Teju? I think uh, Dr. PMC Nasser has detailedly discussed about the previous lecture about milking of the cord. Definitely less than 29 weeks, it is still not advocated routinely. Suppose uh, it is clear between early cord clamping versus delayed cord clamping, we have to advocate the delayed cord clamping. Between delayed cord clamping and uh, cord milking, there is still debates which are going on. Whenever possible, still the proven therapy is the delayed cord clamping. But in case scenarios where we are not able to delay the cord clamping, then I think we can advocate the milking in those scenarios currently. Uh, we can go, but definitely not for less than 29 weeks babies, which is now guidelines according to the NRP madam. So, but uh, there are a lot of head to head trials, even from India, which have shown that reasonable efficacy between the delayed cord clamping and uh, uh, sorry, delayed cord clamping versus cord milking. Uh, from even from one of the Kerala studies and even from UP studies, two, three studies are there, which has shown uh, almost similar efficacy between the two, you know, even the stable babies who are more than 29 weeks. That's all. And I'll tell you how we do it. We do it uh, after one minute. So it is not too late. It's not too early, but we do it after one minute regularly for all the babies. And if you want to delay cord clamping, yeah, three minutes. Now, I'll just discuss one case scenario just for everyone to understand that here is a 29-week pregnancy. Um, uh, um, uh, now at 31 weeks of gestation, she's had a past history of 29-week delivery. She is a di diabetic on insulin. She's a hypertensive on antihypertensives. And now she comes at 31 weeks. She's coming with third trimester pain abdomen. Her BP is 160-100. Her pulse rate is 85 She's 30 weeks and there are contractions. She's got discharge. Cervix is three centimeters dilated and the membranes are there and it is also partly phased. We find when you did an ultrasound, she's got 30 weeks, seven uh, centimeters AFI, thousand grams weight, placenta on the upper segment, the line of management. Now I'll take this answer. I'll tell you what all I would do in the scenario. First, I will, the 160, 100, so she's already on antihypertensives, I'll step up her antihypertensives. Then I will give her steroids, but I should check her sugars. I may have to step up the insulin when I'm giving the steroids. I will give her magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection. And of course, I will give her steroids for lung protection. And I will give her tocolytics, preferably nifedipin in this situation. And then I will also do a neonatal counseling. So these are probably the things that I would do before I take up this patient. She may, the contractions may abate, it's, uh, but if it doesn't, then we'll have to uh, send her to a neonatal center for uh, care. Now, Dr. Teja, I'd like you to answer this. She's a 27-year-old, a twin pregnancy, spontaneous conception. She's come with leaking. Okay? And uh, the, uh, the uterus is about 30 weeks in size because it's big. There are contractions, clear like a thing. She's already ruptured her membranes. And she's about three centimeters dilated. 
the fetal uh, weight is around 750 grams. Okay, the first babe, the second baby is about 780 grams. How would you want me to manage this patient? Ma'am, I think uh, currently you're saying that it's 26 came... weeks gestation. Okay, 26 with, weeks. Yeah, with the leaking PV, and yeah. you are not sure whether uh, she's in labor or not still. Correct. Yes. Okay. So I think leaking PV is one thing that, as you have told, that antibiotic prophylaxis is one thing that we will be. Uh, requesting our uh, OBG people to start off. Uh, for the delivery, I think if that goes into, uh, she goes into labor also, though it is 20, less than 28 weeks or anything, we advocate that go with the vaginal delivery unless there is an obstetric indication. So that's what we tell. But uh, if they have any breach delivery and other things, then we have to take a call whether now, we have to continue. This is yeah, a cephalic. Yeah, so and cephalic. she's the second gravida. She's... Uh... So I'm just asking you a very personal question. What is the amount of salvageability you would give this 26-weeker twins at 750 grams in your institution? Okay. So currently with the data that is available in the 26-weeker, which we can say that now uh, 26 weeks plus and 750 grams plus, we are able to save now around 80%. Minimum. That's what I can say. I, I think in my presentation, I, I will share my data also, what is the evidence currently. But if it is 25, 24 weeker, I'm not sure about the data from others also. I think that's what but you're comfortable with how many weeks actually? Singleton weight and the, the gestational age, singleton? More, yeah, more than 26, we are still comfortable. More than 27 or more, uh, they will, uh, our data shows that 92, 93% is the outcome. Oh. That's what we can say okay. regarding the survival. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Dr. Teju, I'll hand over the mic to you, okay? Because it is yeah. each, yeah, each topic uh, itself will have one lecture. So we'll go with one by one, whatever is the thing that is uh, some, simplified way I will try to manage. So first thing is that why we should be worried. These are the four things that I will try to uh, correct. I think you can go to next, madam. Okay. So we all know what are the morbidities and what are the both the short term and long term. In the short term, we'll be worried about, apart from the mortality, we'll be more worried about more incidence of jaundice, sepsis and PDA, NEC, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, ROP and the brain injury, the, which will be manifested as intraventricular hemorrhage and periventricular leukomalacia. Apart from this, we should not stop here. We have to look at these babies in the long term for both the brain uh, neurodevelopmental issues and also growth failures and the chronic lung diseases. And even the, we have to look at that Barker's hypothesis and even for the adult onset metabolic disorders, which are more common in these cases. Next slide. So when we are optimizing the care, these are the components I can say for the preterm unit. One is the care during the golden hour, sorry, care during the birth and golden hour. Then we will concentrate on the respiratory and hemodynamics. Then the nutrition is one of the important thing that we need to look at it. And then we have to look at the infection control, then followed by neuroprotection and the follow-up, how we have to do, we will see it. Yeah. Uh, we all know if you are a single stick, we can easily broken when we make it a and it is difficult to break. So if we have, go with the bundled approach for each care on what I have mentioned in the previous slide, I think we don't do much of the wrong things and we will be able to improve the care. And a lot of checklists and bundle checklists will help. Sticking better way rather than <clears throat> simply looking at one by one, one by one of this thing. So first is the preparation. I think Dr. P.M. Sinha was telling us about the neonatal resuscitation in more detailed way. So I will just go with simple things here. One is the preparation is the major component. Uh, trained people has to be there. Already Dr. Sani and Sarina Madam has told that we have to deliver the it in the level three facility. If you are looking care of the 28 weeks or 30 weeks babies, uh, maybe 32 to 34, we can go with the level two facility, but definitely less than 28 weeks. If you are delivering, you need to do transfer is better and make your team prepared for the same and then do all these things while you are uh, giving the care during the birth. 
So for knees, the delayed cord clamping, I think uh, it's extensively covered by Dr. PMC Nayasar already. It also pro gives better hemodynamic status and uh, decreased IVH incidence is there, apart from just iron status, which is increased in these babies. So we need to deliver in a warm environment to provide warm environment in these preterm babies, especially. We need to have a little extra gadgets Simple gadget is the cling wrap, which is very cheaper. So as soon as the baby is born, you just wrap the baby in the cling wrap and then move it to move the baby into the uh, delivery room resuscitation area, which is available for you. So use delivery room CPAP if the baby has spontaneous breathing efforts, and if require a positive pressure ventilation due to uh, poor efforts or bradic. Use TP's resuscitator for the positive pressure ventilation because we can reliably give PAP and PEEP in this and also gentle ventilation is possible and more reliable tidal volume can be <coughs> delivered through this. And then you can do the saturation targeting also because uh, not to cause hyperoxia and hyperoxia related issues here. Gentle handling will prevent most of the bruises and also intraventricular hemorrhages in these babies. Next slide. So then coming to golden hour, which is very important in these babies, both in preterm and term babies, which is very important in late preterm also, it is very important. So these are the 10 commandments which we will be advocating in the golden hour. First is the antenatal counseling and briefing before the delivery is the one thing that we need to look, delayed cord clamping, I think we have already told. After the baby is born, we need to maintain the warm chain to prevent hypothermia and hyperthermia. Then optimization of the respiration that with these pair ventilation strategies I will be telling in the next and hemodynamics and early nutrition care prevent hypoglycemia with initial as soon as possible you start IV fluids or nutrition in this baby. If the baby is hemodynamically stable and more than 30 weeks, we usually start feeds as early as possible. If the baby is preterm, late preterm or this thing as that's uh, <coughs> sir was asking us late preterm. You can start the full feeds if the baby is reasonably stable as early as possible and start breastfeeding also if the baby is more than 34 to 35 weeks of gestation. And infection control, there is no need to more uh, advocacy. And then we'll move on to next slide. Yeah. So, in the respiratory man man management during the golden hour, if the baby is Spontaneously breathing, definitely delivery room CPAP is the major uh, step that we need to advocate in these cases. Then use TP's resuscitator as we have discussed about it when there is a requirement of positive pressure ventilation. Restricted use of oxygen, as even the previous lecture also, they have told that if the baby is less than 35 weeks of gestation, you can choose between 21 to 30 weeks, 30% 30 of oxygen as an initial choice of FiO2 and target the saturation according to Dawson nomogram. And after 10 minutes, saturation targeting should be between 90 to 94%. Gentle positive preservation by looking at the chest rise, give early surfactant and maintain the aseptic precautions. Yeah, go ahead. Next slide. Okay. So surfactant, when we are advocating surfactant, so surfactant, there should be a definite criteria. So most of our units, uh, criteria ranges between once you optimize the PEEP, whether it should be between 30 to 40 percent of FiO2 if the baby is even after 30, 30 to 40 percent of FiO2 if the baby has lower saturations and other suggestive features of RDS in terms of x ray, or some people will go for the uh, shake test also, then you can go for the surfactant. Natural one is preferred or the uh, then bovine surfactant versus porcelain surfactant, even in the head-to-head -head trials, there is not much of the difference back slim, previous slim, right? Yeah. So there is nothing much difference in terms of BPD and other long term. So we need not be worried. Whatever is available at your unit, you can use it. Ensure method is preferred over uh, ventilation for the longer period. Lisa, some of the units are comfortable now, but it needs a little skill that you need to look at it. Then early rescue surfactant is preferred over the late rescue. Prophylactic surfactant is definitely not indicated routinely, only based on your 
unit strategy, especially if the, your baby is born before 28 weeks and not covered with the steroid and major uh, suggestive of severe birth asphyxia is there, maybe you can go ahead with the surfactant in those cases. Next slide. So whenever these delivery room CPAP, uh, sorry, whenever even with these strategies, if the baby requires any ventilation, first choice should be non-invasive ventilation among which CPAP is time-tested one over the HFNC and other non-invasive ventilations. We use non-invasive ventilation as a rescue mode currently in our unit. HFNC you can use if the baby is more than 28 weeks, you have only mild to moderate disease. Maybe you can prefer it. Nasal high frequency is still experimental and uh, uh, Dr. Manosar has also has done a study. Still, it is in the experimental mode which is there. Try to avoid pure oxygen to give the baby. If at all you want to give, better is to use the blended oxygen and also humidified oxygen rather than a simple uh, pure oxygen that is which is more toxic for the baby. Next slide. Whenever you are choosing a ventilation, if, you are, if the baby fails on these methods, if you are choosing the ventilation, then use gentle ventilation strategy with minimal PAP and P. I use volume guarantee mode also in these preterm babies to avoid the volume trauma in these children. Use the patient triggered volume guarantee ventilation with permissive apnea because you will allow a little higher CO2s to tolerate so that we can actually decrease the ventilation induced lung injury in these cases. That CO2s are also protective for the brain. So that's the reason why we will try to accept even up to 55 to 60 also if the pH is more than 7.2. Yeah, next. Okay. Other respiratory adjuvants that we need to, apart from surfactant and ventilation strategy, time-tested one is the caffeine. I, uh, I think most of the pediatricians know about the CAP trial, which is studied in more than 2,000 new units, which advocate that all babies who are less than 32 weeks of gestation, you can load on the day one only with the 20 mg per kg of caffeine and then maintenance dose you can use between 5 to 20 mg. Lot of benefits are there with this prophylactic and continue till 36 weeks of gestation. There is a reduction in BPD, duration of respiratory support and other hospital stay and better neurodevelopmental outcomes, especially up to 18 months. Though the long term, like say five to seven years outcomes are nullified with the caffeine also, but at least till 18, 18 to 24 months when they have studied, the better outcomes are there in the neurodevelopmental. Recent one trial from Dr. Naveen Jain sir has looked at it, whether we can stop a little earlier, but very small uh, sample site, I think, uh, but it has given us a lot of wisdom whether we can go with a bigger trial for it. So maybe the future studies with the st earlier stoppage and long-term outcomes also we need to study in these if you are stopping early and then only we can advocate the <coughs> other trials, other uh, uh, strategy with the caffeine. Next slide. Apart from this, other time-tested ones are vitamin A, fluid restriction, aggressive nutrition policy and infection control policy, which can reduce the respiratory morbidity in the uh, long term, even the BPD and other things also. Uh, if these are failing and if you are having going into chronic ventilation, especially around 10 to 14 days, maybe you can use the moderately early steroids, use as low uh, dose uh, steroid regimen as possible. Lowest uh, steroid regimen is the DART regimen, which is also studied. You can go with the BPD calculators, which are available with the NACHD and others, which can give us if the risk is more than 50%, I think better to go with the DART regimen, then you can do it. And hydrocortisone pernilac regimen also has been shown to have a little benefit, both in terms of the reduction of BPD and also other things. Then we can look at it. Uh, other strategies about inhalational intratracheal steroids still experimental currently. Next slide. Okay. After the nutrition, I will more concentrate on the nutrition because this is the major thing that we need to learn about it. Within, as I have mentioned in the previous slide also, by providing aggressive nutrition, we can even improve the respiratory morbidity also. First step in the nutrition is about application of oro pharyngeal colostrum as early as possible. We have seen even in our study in the pre and post strategies, there is a reduction in infection and other 
morbidities which we have seen in the oropharyngeal colostrum application, which will act as a local physiological bar barrier. We, all of us know that this is one of the magical bullet that we can use it. It has a lot of anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory effects. Next slide. Uh, we use bundle approach for aggressive nutrition. That is, as soon as possible, we will use the early aggressive TPN. If the baby is born like uh, less than 30 weeks and then you are not able to establish, the, you are pretty sure that within the next five days, you maybe you will not be able to go into maximum enteral feeding. So use early aggressive TPN. That means that at least 2 to 2.5 grams of protein and lipid start from the day one. And then optimize the TPN according to the need by looking at the blood urinary nitrogen levels and other cholesterol and triglyceride levels. Trophic feeding should be started if the baby is reasonably hemodynamically stable as early as within few hours of life. And then colostrum application in the oropharynx. Probiotics we have started, but uh, being an institute where we have plenty of human milk supply, we have not seen much of the benefit in terms of NEC or infection control, but as it has been advocated that it might have a little uh, long-term outcomes also. So that's the reason why we are continuously using this one. Uh, early initiation of the enteral feeding and inc increasing the rapid advancement of enteral feeding, which will help us fortification and supplements will help us in better weight gain in the short term and addressing the underlying illness that I will be covering next. This is from our, one of our student study only, which we have done. So in the quality initiative approach will help us in increasing the mother's own milk. This has been published in the last year, general perinatology, as you can see how we have improved from 37% mother's own milk <coughs> uh, strategy in the beginning from the baseline to almost 90 to 100 percent mother wound milk. That means that at least a, at the time of discharge, the babies and mother's wound milk of 80 percent of the milk, then we have considered it as a complete mother's wound milk uh, usage that we have seen. So simple steps that we have done. One is the education. One exclusive lactation nurse has helped us a lot. And then interaction with the mother and one more leaflet and providing the electronic pump free of cost for the first seven days usage and early pumping within 12 hours of pumping also has helped us and night pumpings from the mother that has been done by the education. Next slide. Man. So this made us uh, help us to completely fill our milk banks. Yeah, next slide. So some problems will has to be addressed while we need to uh, going with the early aggressive enteral feeding. Take care of all aseptic precautions to prevent infection. Some of the babies can have GR. You can use simple medications like domperidone and uh, lanfeprojol, which is uh, prescribed for currently for these medications. And look for the signs of NEC as early as possible and then uh, stop the feeding for those babies and optimally treat the NEC and then go ahead with. Not enough milk is one thing, but that can be advocated uh, that can be overcome to with good education and other things. I think recent paper on IKMC is eye-opener for all of us. If you see in that exclusive breastfeeding rates between 1 to 1.8 kilo babies at the time of discharge is 88 to 93%. So that means that with simple efforts, we will be able to go with the exclusive breastfeeding. Only 5 to 6% of the mothers only will fail due to their underlying illnesses and other things. We all of us agree that these mothers whose babies are in the NICU, they, are, they might be having some morbidities and also a lot of stress. It can be overcome by combined counselings. We take the help of our obstetricians also here sometimes to uh, overcome their stress and other uh, morbid, optimally treat the morbidities and other things. Osteopenia prematurity, we need to monitor and late onset hyponatremia. We usually screen the babies every week for these two with the uh, biochemical parameters. Next slide. After nutrition, then infection control bundle is one of the important things. So in this hand hygiene, aseptic non-tech techniques, which are easily available on your YouTube. So also you can look at it, how to do the aseptic non-touch techniques while you are doing any procedure, clap other bundles while we are using invasive procedures like 
Plat C bundle, that is central line bundle and ventilation bundle, standard housekeeping procedures and stewardship program and regular HSCC audits will help us to control the infection. I don't need to tell about the importance of hand hygiene because we all know all these seven steps. In septic precautions, we have to follow at each step. We always think that while we are putting a central line is the most important thing, but it is not. Most of the times infection will be with the peripheral line. So we are when we are putting a peripheral line and common procedures like you are uh, doing a OG tube insertion, these are also important things while we are doing the procedures in the new unit. So be careful while you are doing the simple procedures. One of the common problem is the water stagnation and water which you are using for utensils and that is <coughs> important that you need to take care of these things with a good sterile water that is important. Yeah, go ahead. Next. Okay. So these are the checklists we use. One is the first one is a central line insertion checklist and then maintenance checklist and wrap bundle checklist. We use it regularly in our unit, which will help us in decreasing our uh, collapse rates. Uh, eight years back, we were also struggling with almost 50 to 80 per thousand days was our collapse rate. But now we were able to come down to less than 10 per thousand days. And our VAP is almost one to thousand days or one to two per thousand days currently with all these bundle approaches that we are doing it. Next. So developmentally supportive care is very important in the any baby who is in the NICU whether it is a preterm or late, uh, extreme preterm or late preterm or anything. So as you see here, the brain still developing while the baby is getting born between 28 to uh, 20 weeks to 40 weeks of gestation. Then slowly only they will, <coughs> next slide, they require all these supports. A healing environment has to be there in the NICU for the better brain going in this, uh, during this NICU stay. Next slide. We are, uh, sensory systems will develop in a sequential manner. So depending on the gestation and other things, you can start implementing your just uh, strategy based on the baby's uh, uh, developmental level. But we need to act upon all these tactile, vestibular, gestatory, olfactory, auditory, and visual stimulations, which are very important in these new ones. Next slide. Okay. I will be going through two, three developmental supportive cases. So we use prone position as much as possible if the baby is not on the KMC. And then swaddling technique and nesting and facilitated tuck, we promote it. And gentle massage, we do regularly. Next slide. So this is the way we will keep the babies when they're reasonably stable. So in a stable baby, you can keep them completely swaddled like this. <clears throat> And then when the baby is on CPAP or other things, then you can use the nesting and facilitated tuck procedure, which you can use. Next slide. Dental massage will help us for the even one of my, uh, when I was doing my DM, my junior also has done the same study. It has shown us it can reduce the stress level in these new units. So simple stretching exercises every day, two, three times at least. If you can train your uh, nurses, that will be more useful. Next. Uh, don't avoid dragging the chairs and avoid other uh, voice generating uh, loud, uh, loud voice generating procedures. So we use regularly uh, in our unit intermittently, we'll be checking the uh, decibel levels and soothing music, we can keep it at the babies when they are sick. That can also promote the uh, brain growth, uh, developmentally supportive care. Thank you. Next. Another important thing that we always forget is that we babies also have pain sensation. So when we looked at our own two or three years back, how many nurses have this concept of pain? Surprising that we found that many of them doesn't have the pain uh, related concepts in our own unit. So then we started putting the, these posters in beside every bed of the, our baby. And then we, <coughs> Uh, this has improved our uh, uh, sensitivity to pain. Next slide. Okay. 
So we sensitized our team and then also put up these procedures. We involved the mother also to decrease the pain. And we used non-pharmacological non measures like applying the breast milk and also applying the sucrose in the oral cavity. Next. Next slide. Okay. So you can use the daylight variation and one, uh, yeah, next slide. Next slide. So Kangaroo Mother Care is one stop solution for holistic developmental support care. It's a time tested one. Uh, I don't think that we need to go into depth of it. And we try to use as much as possible Kangaroo Mother Care once the baby is reasonably stable. Next. We promote family-centered care. We advocate that mother and father has to come into NSU. We have exclusive unit also where uh, mother and baby, uh, sorry, mother and baby can stay in the same unit. Next. Then comes to follow bundle. Next slide, madam. So we need to screen for these morbidities in the immediate, that is up to 40 to 44 weeks of gestation. Then long term, we have to follow for the neurodevelopmental problems and adult onset disorders and growth issues uh, till at least five to seven, 10 years. Better that we follow them. Next. So this is our survival data uh, last year, which has been uh, put up here. If you see here, uh, less than 28 weeks, we have around 84%. At 28 weeks, around 88%. Between 26 to 27 weeks, we had around 26 babies uh, whom survived, 92.8% uh, was the survival. We generally don't resuscitate who are less than 26 weeks comfortably, only with one-to-one -one interaction with the parent. And if it is really a uh, very pre precious case, then only we will go for the uh, resuscitation in these babies. Uh, as uh, even as a principal, Fernandez Hospital will, uh, from our unit, we will think that both the survival and long-term morbidities are also important. Till now, we are going with the less than, more than 26 weeks only as more comfortable. Yeah, next slide. Uh, this is one of our, my unpublished data from one of our, my student follow-up. You can see here, among the 130, around 125 babies whom we have followed, four babies had IQ less than 70 and abnormal hearing screening was there for three and one required even cochlear implant also in the follow-up. And one of the eight was blind in one of the baby. Any adverse outcomes, that means that even mild impairment also if you take around 10 to 13% of these babies might have some problems. Yeah, next slide. So these are all encouraging results only for us to work on. Uh, so I'd like to conclude with these things. Preterm units are at risk of both short and long-term morbidities. Bundle approaches help, help us in optimizing care, whether it is a late preterm, moderate preterm, or very preterm, or extreme preterm. And then building a team is very important step, as you have seen in some of the quality initiatives that we have done. It all goes with very simple, tiny steps and improving your team. And follow-up is also very important because as you have shown, I have shown in simple 130 sample size also, these needs lot of things and we had we have gone ahead with one of the child developmental center unique for our babies in the hyderabad currently and we wanted to follow these babies at least till 12 years of age now thank you very much thank you thank you dr zarina and dr tej for that wonderful session a comprehensive overview of preterm labor and preterm care including the neurodevelopmental follow-up for a long time uh, that is a wonderful session and thank you for the session and uh, since the, our time is uh, uh, has cruised we will have the discussion or the zoom platform the chat session both speakers will be available and then you can share the questions on the zoom thank you so much you, we'll go for the next session thank you We can go to the next session. Okay. Any questions in this? Okay. We can go to the next section. Uh,
dialogue on IUGR updates in antenatal and neonatal management. I, I invite Dr. M. K. Nandagumar sir and Dr. Jayajandran to chair the session. Thank you, Naushi. Uh, can I proceed? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Very good morning to all. Prospected office bearers of IAP and of the chapter, my dear seniors, colleagues, and friends from Badagara. Let me congratulate IAP Badagara and State Penetrology Chapter. And I think this is a great conference. We're going to discuss a very important problem our country is facing, which is IUGR. It's important because it's one of the common cause of perinatal morbidity and mortality we are facing in our country. This area needs very coordinated care and teamwork between a variety of specialists, which include obstetricians, radiologists, fetal medicine specialists, neonatologists, pediatricians, and also the adult specialist. That's a very, uh, so it's an important topic and ideal topic to be discussed in this platform. These IUGR babies need to be detected early in the antenatal period and also managed well in the neonatal period. They're at high risk of adult onset problems because their fetal programming is deranged. They're at high risk of various uh, problems like hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, et cetera, et cetera. So the problem can start from the uterus, continues throughout their life. That's the important of this topic. And we got two great speakers, Dr. Jodi and Dr. Naveen Jain to talk on this area. Dr. Jodi is the HOD of fetal medicine at uh, Calicut MIMS and also at uh, NCARE IVF Center. I'm very happy to share that she's my friend and classmate at Calicut Medical College. She had their further training and advanced education from Australia in obstetrics, fetal medicine, and radiology, and now settled in Calicut. I request my colleague chairperson, Dr. Nanda Kumar, to introduce Dr. Naveen Jain, please. Very good morning to you all. I thank the organizers for giving me this proud privilege to introduce Dr. Naveen Jain, my good friend, to this August gathering. Dr. Naveen Jain doesn't need any introduction. He is such a well-known personality, a dawn in the field of neonatology, a very good teacher, very good researcher, and is an exemplary orator. He's a crowd puller in all state and national level conferences. So at present, he is working as a he is heading the one of the best neonatal units in Kerala. I can say even in India, that is Kim's Troandrum. And if I am going to read full data, bio data, it will take more than one hour. So I am not going to that. Since one of time, I am not going to that. State I am going to Dr. Jodi to start the debate. Thank you. Jodi, please. Am I audible? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you very much um, for the and uh, thank you for the kind words, uh, Dr. Jayachandran. So I think that the significance of the topic has already been discussed by. Do this slightly increase the volume, please. Is that better? Yeah. So the significance of the topic has been discussed by Dr. Jayajitra already. So management of the fetal growth restriction includes identification of the small for gestation age babies, distinguishing the small for gestation age babies from fetal growth restriction, and deciding the follow-up and timing of the delivery. That is the headings that I'm going to talk about. Okay. So by definition, small for gestation age means Estimated fetal weight of the baby or the fetus less than the 10th centile for the particular gestation. Not all small for gestation age babies are only 30% of them are actually pathologically growth restricted. But 70% are small because they have 
no, no potential. So the aim is to identify those 30% who actually needs constant monitoring. It can be divided into early onset and late onset, depending on when it starts. If it's before 32 weeks, it's early onset, and if it's after 32 weeks, late onset. How do we identify small for gestation age babies? In order to understand the size of the baby, we need to have a concrete dating of the pregnancy. The best dating will be a dating scan done between when the baby's length is between seven millimeters and 60 millimeters. Pretty much every mother in Kerala at least will have nuchal scan at the moment. So you can utilize the first trimester nuchal scan for dating as well. So once you establish the date based on the menstrual age or the dating scan, never change it. Please go and write it on the antenatal card so that subsequent scans might give you a different date, the size of the baby, not the date of the pregnancy. When you see them for the first time, take a detailed history, which includes previous obstetric history and medical history to identify whether there are any risk factors which will make you think that they need uh, growth monitoring. Again, first trimester combined screening, which we use for the purpose of screening for aneuploidy, can be utilized for growth restriction, even though for the purpose of IUGR screening, it is not yet recommended. The, the content of the biochemistry, which is a PAPE, if it is less No sound? I think uh, she has gone offline. Some technical issue. Some technical issue, I think. It's not seen. video and audio, both are. Wait for a second. She may be logging back. Good morning, Jay Chandran and Santos and Vishnu. Greetings Hello. from Tamil Nadu NNF. I'm Dr. Jalil. Thank you. Hey, sir. Hi. Hi. More than 200 attending is a very good number. I think nowadays uh, is webinars are little, the number of webinars is not so high. I think that's okay, interesting. Hi, sir. Jayantan, can you call call her and okay. she, she, she is back she is back online she is back online okay. yeah yeah okay. Okay. please start sharing your slide yeah she is still muted I think she's back but she's muted uh, Adam. Oh, oh, uh, you can see the screen now yeah and yeah yeah yes yes, yes, yes. 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 sorry I had some sorry. So uh, when we do the first trimester screening, we can utilize the biochemistry which we use for that for the purpose of screening as well. The, the other method is by clinical suspicion. So whenever an obstetrician sees a pregnant lady, she needs to measure the symphysis of frontal height and plot it on the chart. Just by measuring may not be helpful. If you have to know the trend of the symphysis of frontal height, always chart it on the chart. Once you have suspicion, you go for the biometric examination, which is an ultrasound method. The common parameters which we use for calculating the baby's weight are biparated diameter, head circumference, abdominal circumference, and femur length. There are so many other parameters, but these are the ones which we commonly use. So after calculating the weight of the baby, if it falls less than 10 centile for that gestational age, you call it a small for gestational age. Now the next step is to identify whether they actually have pathological growth restriction or is it just constitutionally small. For that, you need to study the Doppler parameters. So the common Dopplers which we use are uterine artery, which represent the maternal side of the placenta, umbilical artery, which is the fetal side of the placenta, MCA, middle cerebral artery, which is a fetal vessel, again, ductus venosus. These are the four vessels which we, are, we use for uh, monitoring both early as well as late onset IUGRs. So the resistance of a particular vessel is calculated by 
the difference in the velocity at the time of systole and diastole, which is S minus D divided by mean. So that is that index will give us an idea about how the resistance is in the particular vessel. And you might hear me talking about cerebral placental ratio in my subsequent slides. What it means is the ratio of the pulsatility index of the middle cerebral artery to the umbilical artery. So these are the vessels which we commonly use. Train artery and umbilical artery. If the diastolic flow is good, so you can. This is the systole. This is the diastole. If the diastolic flow is good, that is actually good. If the diastolic flow is less, it is not good. So this is a normal uterine artery. This is an abnormal uterine artery. Same thing with umbilical artery. Here you you are not seeing anything at the time of diastole, so you call it absent diastolic flow. Here you can actually see reversal. So this is a reversed and diastolic flow. So the other vessels are middle cerebral artery. It's other way around. What happens is like whenever there is hypoxia. There is some auto regulation happening in the baby. So there will be preferential shunting of the blood to the vital organs, which are brain, heart, and adrenals. So when the blood flow to the brain increases, and when there is hypoxia, it is depicted as low, low resistance in the middle cerebral artery. So abnormal is high resistance, and normal is low resistance. The other vessel which we use is ductus venosus. So for the past 40 years, people have been trying to get a diagnosis or a definition for growth restriction. So this is what we currently follow, a Delphi consensus. This was a consensus statement made by experts from across the world, which came based on that the early IUGR can be identified if there are there is at least one of the three solitary parameters. That is either abdominal circumference or estimated weight less than third centile. It's not 10 centile, it's extremely small, less than third centile or when there is serious changes in the umbilical artery, which is absent end diastolic flow or reversed end diastolic flow. If you see any of the th three things in the small for gestational baby, definitely this is going to be fetal growth restriction. Or you can have four contributory parameters. So babies are not that small. It's just less than 10 centile on abdominal circumference and estimated fetal weight, but umbilical artery or uterine artery showing resistance. So when you have that combination, again, we are dealing with this. In terms of late onset IUGR, you have two solitary parameters, which are same, the weight parameters. We don't have umbilical artery parameter here. And apart from that, if you have more than or equal to two of the following criteria, again, you can call it IUGR. These are estimated fetal weight and abdominal circumference less than 10 centile or crossing centile. This is really important. Sometimes you get to miss a normally normal weight IUGR babies. That's a different entity. So how we diagnose that is, if between the scans, if you see a drop in the growth centile by two quartile, which is more than 50%, you can still consider them as growth restriction. And the other markers are CPR less than fifth centile or umbilical artery Doppler PI more than 95th centile. Again, early and late IUG, fetal growth restrictions are two different phenotypes of the same condition, but they behave completely differently. In early, you can easily diagnose it. Management is very difficult. The, the severity of the placental illness is quite high. They have very high association with the preeclampsia. The prevalence is quite low. Mortality is quite high. Tolerance to hypoxia. I'll talk about all these things together. When you have a small, that is premature baby, you have a small baby, its oxygen requirement is less. So when there is hypoxia, it has adequate time to compensate. So you get to see a series of sequential changes in the Dopplers of small babies. So first it will start as increasing the resistance in the umbilical artery, then absent diastolic flow, then reversal, then the ductus venosus. The chronology will be maintained in early onset IUGR, hence you can diagnose it better. And they have a good tolerance to hypoxia. Whereas in late, it's very difficult to diagnose. But once you diagnose, you can treat it because all you have to do is time the delivery. Present the disease is mild, preeclampsia association is low, prevalence is quite high, mortality is low, but long-term morbidity can be high because you're dealing with a mature baby, its oxygen demand is high. So even when the umbilical artery is normal, which means the placental involvement is less than 30% for a normal umbilical artery. In that case, because the oxygen requirement is high, even then the baby can be hypoxic and can have long-term neurological problems. So the identification is very important in this case. 
so so far whatever i have been talking is mainly from figo guidelines which came out in uh, march 2021 and before that we were following uh, isog guidelines which came out in 2020 the year before we had barcelona protocol so we pretty much there is a lot of overlap between these protocols and for ease of management we are still sticking to the stage wise management of uh, barcelona the experts uh, the experts from barcelona is the one who has done umpty number of work in the field of growth restriction so stage 1 means Umbilical artery Doppler shows resistance. The weight is at either less than third centile or between less than tenth centile with changes in the cerebroplacental ratio or uterine artery. So they all, pretty much all the late onset IUGA comes under this category. There, there is only mild suspicion of the uh, suspicion of hypoxia. So stage two means there is severe placental involvement. So here. the placental involvement is less than 30% here is close to 50 to 60% so there is absent diastolic flow in the umbilical artery and changes in the aortic isthmus as you move further down there is low suspicion for acidosis when you see reversal in the umbilical artery or increase in the resistance in the ductus venosus the fourth and the last one is severe acidosis where there is reversal in the ductus venosus this is one point where we have to deliver them because the mortality is quite high so now timing of delivery So this is akin to a fire in the building where you have forty steps to uh, come down. Will you jump from the top or the bottom? You will try to reach the bottom as much as possible unless a fire is catching you. It's the same in IUGA. You try to come to forty forty degrees as much as possible. And the reason, and the reason is you know that between twenty six to twenty nine weeks, one day saved in the uterus will actually give one to two percent survival benefit for the baby. So unless you have a clean indication, never deliver them before thirty weeks. So if you get a lady at twenty eight weeks with abnormal Dopplers, make sure that you wait till the ductus venosus is abnormal. While waiting, you can give them steroids, you can give them Maxerve, you can monitor, you can do everything else. But please make sure that you deliver them only if there is indication, which I'll come to that later. So this is the stage wise management. Stage one, I have already mentioned. Either the size is more dramatic, so there you don't have to deliver. You can take them up to thirty-seven weeks, provided you see them for Dopplers every week, CTG twice a week, and growth every two weeks. So push them up to thirty-seven weeks, and after that you can deliver them. Stage two, absent diastolic flow. If they are less than thirty-two weeks, again you can wait with the admission the twice daily ctg two to three times dopplers per week and take them up to 32 to 34 weeks once you see reverse diastolic flow people panic it's, it's reverse diastolic flow baby is going to die no so the the prematurity is a bigger killer at that stage if you find a lady with 20 weeks and doppler showing reversal prematurity is bigger than that was Which basically is severe malady when you have eclampsia helps in eruption. No choice; you have to deliver them. Or when there is a non-reactive CTG, or if the biophysical profile is very low, which which means over thirty minutes of observation, if you see it less than two, or over sixty minutes of observation, if you see four, or you have five parameters. NS non-stress test. And your Lyca. So when you, if you have everything normal, it's two. If it's not present, it's zero. That is how you you give the marks for each parameter. So if it's less than four, means it's really acidotic baby. You need to deliver the baby then and there. The randomized <coughs> control trial. Uh, this is what uh, lied to the man really on the IUGA. So what they have done is all the growth restricted babies less than thirty two weeks were categorized into three arms. One arm they delivered only when the computer CTG was abnormal. Second arm they delivered when the ductus venosus PI was high, and the third arm they waited till the ductus showed reversal. And the best outcome was for those babies whom we waited for ductus venosus reversal, which was true for very early as well as early pre uh, restriction. Sound is cracking. So when it comes to management, I've already discussed. Is that better? Am I audible? Hello. Okay, okay sound. You can sound continue. Sound is not clear. Madam, you are audible. Sound is not clear. It's it's breaking in between. Audible. 
you are audible maybe i have some yeah sorry corticus dots for lung maturity can be you can 24 to 34 video video you can so that sorry what am i saying dis- just disable the video when there is some problem with the net connection so probably if you can disable your video it will be better the sound won't break okay is that better now yes yes madam yes. thank you thank you for the tip okay corticosteroids and magnesium sulfate can be given steroids between 24 to 34 which has been uh, discussed by the previous speakers uh, max of less than 32 weeks and in terms of mode of delivery if there is a diastolic flow in the umbilical artery you can keep them for vaginal delivery otherwise it's better to do cesarean section so absent and diastolic flow and reversal is always advised to have cesarean section if a lady is kept for vaginal delivery with fetal growth restriction it's better to do continuous ctg and there should be low threshold for taking her up to for cesarean section Com- comparing the uh, method of induction mechanical induction has got a better prognosis than prostaglandins and the, the FIGO guidelines is actually stressing on this particular thing, which I think everybody has to uh, take home. The placenta should be sent for histopathological examination in all these growth restriction cases. The reason being, depending on the pathological finding, actually we can predict the recurrence, we can predict the association with the thrombophilias and future obstetric complications. So please do histopathological examination, send the placenta for histology for all these growth restricted babies. And before they go home, count, counsel them about the recurrence, long-term morbidity for the woman as well as the child. So I have two cases, if time permits, uh, or I can do it at the end of the talk as well. Do you want me to proceed? You can continue. Okay, so um, this is an interesting case. A primary who got self-referred to me as was booked for cesarean section at 28 weeks and one day because she had severe IUGR and umbilical artery Doppler changes. So she did not have any relevant past medical or family history. She was uh, detected to have high blood pressure three days before uh, she came to me. Urine was normal, and bloods were all normal. A scan done from outside showed eight hours back. She came to me by around three o'clock in the morning. She had a scan which showed estimated fetal weight was on the 2.5 centile. There was oligohydramnios. AFI was 5.5. Uterine artery Doppler was abnormal. Uh, CPR was abnormal. So uh, the, the decision was taken for cesarean. Because she, her cousin was working in the same hospital, she opted to come and consult us for a second opinion. So the scan repeated at the time of presentation definitely showed um, growth restriction. Baby's weight was 853 grams. Uh, it was on 4.2 centile. AC was 2%. AFA was 5.5. And to my surprise, there was diastolic flow in the umbilical artery. So because sometimes when you see absent diastolic or reversal, if you give steroids, it can actually make some change in the Doppler. So we didn't want to take the chance. So we kept her in. Uh, Dr. Spinosis was also normal. So if, when you, if you remember, before at 28 weeks, our endpoint is reversal in the Dr. Spinosis. Till then, we will not be delivering her. So um, she had seen me a couple of times before, three, four times before that. And at 31 weeks and four days, when she came to me, her blood pressure was 140 or 96. She was on labetalol, 200 milligram, uh, twice a day. Uh, albumin was one plus and bloods were normal. CTG that morning showed variability has decreased, but ac- there was no acceleration and there was no deceleration. So it was kind of non-reassuring. Ultrasound scan done at that time showed estimated fetal weight of 1.17 with 2.8 centile. Umbilical artery Doppler showed absent diastolic flow and the ductus venous is also sh- started showing increased resistance. So the decision was made to do cesarean section, which actually um, after cesarean, baby's weight was 1.1 kg. Baby was in NIC for 14 days on minimal support. And at the, at the time of discharge, it was 1.2 kg. So baby's follow-up were all normal. So this is just to show that very early IUGR with umbilical artery Doppler, you don't have to make a decision at that point. You can always try and push it as much as possible, provided you use a safety net of CTG, biophysical profile, and Doppler. Her histopathology of the placenta showed in the villus fibrin deposit, infarcted villi, areas of hemorrhage and necrosis, which according to the current FOXI guide, sorry, FIGO guidelines is, um, has got a recurrence rate of around 15 to 25%. A recurrence risk was explained. Aspirin was advised for the next pregnancy, and we sent the uh, blood for thrombophilia screening as she had very early onset preeclampsia and severe growth restriction. So that was one case. So this was at the time of presentation. Then I did the biometry three times for her. This is abdominal circumference always low, estimated fetal weight all, always low, but in the range of four, 4.5 centile. Umbilical artery Doppler remains 
remained normal for initial four or five examination done every third day, but it started creeping up. And at the end, the doctors also changed and uh, we made the decision to deliver her. And this is case two, a slightly different uh, profile. 32 year old, second gravida, first full term normal delivery, 2.6 kg, seven years back, uh, with severe growth restriction. She was referred as severe growth restriction for further evaluation. Actually, she came to me for genetic workup, thinking that this is a very early onset uh, IUGR, which needs some, uh, which could be because of genetic cause. She had an initial ANC in Oman, and uh, she came and she missed her nu nuchal scan because of the COVID and the quarantine. And she changed the obstetrician in between. So when she had the anomaly scan, there was two weeks disparity. At 20, and after that, she had a couple of scans from the periphery, which all showed that it is severely growth restricted. Some showed uh, short humerus, some showed uh, short transcerebral diameter. So there was a lot of confusion and anxiety going on. So when she came to me, obviously it was like looking very ugly. The numbers were all over the place. So when we plotted, what I understood was all these measurements are below. The growth measurements are all below, but the, the Lyca was normal, umbilical artery Doppler was normal, uh, the mediocerebral artery Doppler was normal, and ductus was also normal. So I, I asked her for the anomaly scan report. I plotted on the graph exactly parallel, mirroring the previous finding. So obviously, the commonest cause is wrong date. So I asked her whether she had any dating scan. She said, all I had was from the Gulf. I have a picture in my mobile. which showed an ultrasound scan of a gestation sac with just yolk sac at eight weeks. So this was obviously a wrong, wrong date. For that, she had six or seven scans, and she was so anxious and came for genetic workup. So this, this is just to highlight the fact that it's very, very important to have a date assigned in the first visit itself. So the take home are prematurity is a bigger killer in fetal growth restriction than actual growth restriction. Always date the pregnancy in the first visit itself. Screen using symphysia fundal height during all visits. Keep a growth chart in the antenatal card and plot the measurements. Everybody will have an anomaly scan. You can plot the anomaly scan measurement as a baseline and subsequent measurements should be put on the chart so that you can identify the trend. Once F FGR is identified, follow the protocol systematically Deliver before 30 weeks only after meeting the criteria. Steroids and Maxwell are still considered as useful for pre, uh, preterm IUGR. Postpone the delivery till 36 weeks as long as there is diastolic flow in the umbilical artery and maternal conditions are stable. Induction of labor if there is diastolic flow in the umbilical artery, otherwise you can do cesarean section. Placental histology will help to predict the recurrence. Thank you very much for patient listening. Thank you, Jyoti. Uh, over to Dr. Naveen Jain, please. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, are you able to hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Jay Chandran uh, and all our friends in the meeting, Nandakumar, uh, as uh, a perinatal team, that means obstetricians and neonatologists together, okay. Kerala seems to have done a great job actually. If you look at it, the number of babies requiring resuscitation at birth, which is an extensive resuscitation is quite low. It means that we are able to deliver most of these babies before they develop severe anxiety. And uh, what remains probably as a discussion today is whether we are able to do a better fine tuning because we are not going wrong with till birth rate or in utero death. We are managing to take these babies out before they die in utero. So I have a, a short presentation in which uh, only one point is going to be discussed actually. There is no doubt that uh, detection of IUGR in utero decreases till birth rate. We will see that in one population large study so this statement is very, very clear that if an obstetrician picks up fetal growth restriction, a UGR, they're more or less synonymous words, uh, then an early delivery will reduce the chances of a fetus being lost in utero. But the problem we will see in the next few slides that this fear of losing a baby in utero has resulted in some babies coming out ahead of time and then facing a baby as a preterm baby, not just at very extreme preterms, even at 34, 35 weeks, a few weeks of in utero life lost to the baby is a lot of loss to the baby. 
Now, this is a recent population paper from Australia asking the same fundamental question, which is the topic of discussion today. Does detection of fetal growth restriction improve neonatal outcomes? So, just like one of the panelists or uh, attendees has uh, remarked uh, that possibly it is not prematurity alone and it's a balance, I agree with both what Dr. Jyoti presented and the comment that has come in, that there is a continuous act of balancing that we should not lose the baby in utero, not only in terms of death, in terms of loss of cognition, brain function of the baby before birth. If severe fetal restriction happens, placental flow decreases, we may lose brain function. And similarly, if you deliver too early, you have a premature baby facing a lot of neonatal problems. This will look like a busy slide. It's very easy to follow. This is a, a large uh, population data from Australia, retrospective study, where they looked at babies who were born less than third centile, that is severe fetal growth restriction, compared to those born with weight of more than 10 centile. This is the fetal uh, growth. And if you look at it in a graph, which I will show you next, you can see that fortunately, uh, we are only talking about 3% babies. When you say third centile means, we are talking of delivery of babies, three out of 100. That is what is called third centile. And if you push the line to 10 centile, it would mean 10 out of 100. So of all the 100 babies that you see, what is the risk of getting the problem? Now you can see the green line represents all those babies where the obstetrician picked up fetal growth restriction and delivered the baby early. That is fetal growth restriction intervened. In the yellow one is where fetal growth restriction was detected antenatally, but the obstetrician decided not to deliver the baby. And the larger bar surprisingly to us in this discussion, but not to the scientific community, is that fetal growth restriction is not detected. The baby is born and found to be less than 10 centile. So 70% of all babies who are going to be IUGR known after birth are still not detected by the best methods available in utero. So out of those three babies we are talking, two have been already missed out. We're talking only one baby now out of 100. This is the same thing as actual numbers from the study. 22,000 low birth weight IUGR babies were not detected in utero. 3,000 were detected, but the obstetrician decided not to deliver them early. 6,000 were detected to be growth restricted and delivered. And this is an important uh, result. You can see that those who were less than third centile fetal growth restricted, if they were delivered early, the perinatal mortality was low, less than five. If they were not delivered, it went up to 15%. And in those cases where it was not detected, it's 20%. So which means the first uh, message is that, I'm sorry, yeah, is that perinatal death is very high in fetal growth restriction. So we cannot say that obstetricians are making mistakes by trying to uh, be worried or trying to deliver early when they find an IUGR baby. Death is forever, it's gone. So these are absolute numbers of deaths in the red, brown, and green. And in the purple, you have the percentages. So you would lose something like 450 babies because they were for fetal growth restricted, were not detected by the current techniques. About 50 babies, fetal growth restricted, not delivered, died. And only 20 babies, fetal growth restricted, delivered, died. So the first message for today's meeting is fetal growth rest restriction, if it is detected and delivery happens at the right time, in utero death, stillbirth decreases significantly. If we do not act on this, we may lose a large number of babies in utero. Now, the other side, which is the neonatal side, is this blue box. You can see babies who are born as more than 10 centile. 
but they were suspected wrongly to have fetal growth restriction this number is not small 12000 babies we missed 22000 babies by the current technique and we are falsely diagnosing 12000 babies now this number is 12000 is more than those fetal growth restriction who were detected and delivered double the number so double the number of babies who were delivered thinking of fetal growth restriction turned out to be good weight babies and we admitted 220 babies to an icu here and only 180 babies were truly detected with fetal growth restriction that means we are over diagnosing fetal growth restriction not because of an obstetrician's mistake but because of innate limitations of technology we are over diagnosing fetal growth restriction delivering them ahead of time and finding out later on that they were not growing poorly in utero so this was the red bar was those babies Sorry, that. Somebody so, was unmute. Okay, okay. So uh, the red bar represents those babies who were fetal growth restricted in utero but not detected, and the white bar represents those babies who we thought were fetal growth restricted, delivered them early, but they were not actually growing poorly. They should have stayed inside. So you can see this shift is happening, and we are landing up delivering these babies one to two weeks ahead of time. This is what you can see. These were fetal growth restriction in this study, 12,000 babies who were falsely diagnosed as fetal growth restriction, false positives. And these are normally delivered babies in the same population. No change in perinatal mortality, unlike those true fetal growth restriction where we showed significant improvement in perinatal mortality. And they were delivered two weeks ahead and almost 600 grams was lost in utero growth, which cannot no, be two years. So looking at the complication rates in nicu those babies who came out early because of false diagnosis of fetal growth restriction had several times respiratory problems cardiac problems infections metabolic complications need for blood products gastro complications and also they had many other problems which means that you can clearly see that by false diagnosis of fetal growth restriction we are resulting in babies who are born much more preterm. And this is true even for those babies who are truly diagnosed as fetal growth restriction. They are also coming out preterm. And they also, the black bar is true fetal growth restriction, seem to have more NICU problems than those babies who are not delivered or those who are missed to be diagnosed fetal growth restricted. In another large population study from US also, they found that false positive fetal growth restriction and ICU admissions 270 was same as true positives, which means currently technology is over diagnosing fetal growth restriction. And not to mention of babies who are born to our population of Kerala, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, we are all what we call the Dravidians who are smaller built and we have smaller length. You see when you go to the rooms of babies, the mothers and grandmothers are all looking smaller in size. Their fetuses are also smaller, and if you do not use the right fetal growth charts, then they would also be labeled as growth restricted and pulled out early, and they would be unnecessarily preterm babies. No doubt, IUGR babies have poorer cognitive outcomes. This is the systematic review, the diamond effect showing that compared to AGA, they have poorer outcomes. The currently best techniques available were analyzed in detection of fetal growth restriction so that you can find out the right babies to pull out. Abdominal circumference seems to be one of the more better ones than just estimated fetal weight. Cerebroplacental ratio, the black solid bar has better diagnostic uh, effect than or results than just using umbilical artery dopplers and middle cerebral artery dopplers. And growth velocity across from 28 to 36 weeks also is helpful. So point is that uh, do we need better markers? So instead of going to subtle markers or as uh, tangential markers, the real markers would be to find out whether placenta is getting sick or not. And therefore, there are new genetic biological markers which are being used to find out aging of placenta. They can be looked at in the maternal blood. And then you can add on value. Of course, this is still uh, on a experiment or scientific basis and not yet full-time clinical practice. But probably fine-tuning would require finding out whether the placenta is becoming older. 
and this is not going to be difficult nowadays we can do an nipt test by taking maternal blood and then being able to find out fetal dna so you can be able to find out even the placental genetic material in maternal blood and be able to tell whether the placenta is not going to continue he is going to retire early and better to bring the baby to nicu which is 100th of as good as the mother so if the mother is good that the placenta is healthy then probably we should not deliver this may be the future maybe not very long maybe within one or two years we may select certain babies by doing abdominal circumference doppler studies cerebral placental ratio and then say let us do a serum marker for placental aging and then take the baby out so this is some of the uh, just table showing that you can diagnose several of the morbidities based on the genetics of placenta so i think i'll just conclude here what we started with that if you detect fetal growth restriction less than third centile that is 3 out of 100 babies then you take them out you may prevent their death in utero but equal number of babies are being brought out because of limited technology sometimes because of fear of parents and medical legal education the obstetrician is pushed to the wall and pulls out a baby who may have continued in utero healthy and may not have unnecessarily to be brought out and this bringing out early poses a lot of medical problems to the baby do not forget to look at the mother and grandmother who are standing outside the ultrasound room and if they look very small built then consider familial small build as a possible cause of baby being growing smaller and currently we have only the choices of estimated fetal weight abdominal circumference and cerebral placental ratio or maybe some other dopplers other than these but the future lies in genetic markers which are not difficult to do from the maternal blood and find out the actual aging of the placenta and then decide when to bring the baby out thank you uh, for your attention and back to the chair persons thank, thank you dr you. navin and dr jyoti for excellent deliberation since we are running behind schedule we will take in uh, the audience can put their queries in chat box anything they are speakers they can answer them directly and uh, we okay. are Straight away, going to yeah. next session. Thank you, thank you all. So, just one sentence to conclude, please. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Navin Jain, for uh, ending with a very positive note that if you are diagnosing fetal growth restriction properly, you can prevent stillbirth, and if you are delivering them optimal at optimal time and giving good neonatal care, we can have very good neonatal survival also. So, thanks for conveying this message in a positive way. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Uh, over to the organizers. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Navin sir, Jyoti madam, for that wonderful session, and thank you, Nandan sir and uh, Dr. Jay Chandran sir uh, for moderating the session. We'll quickly go on to the next session. Uh, topic is FAQs in fetal medicine by Dr. Bijoy Balakrishnan. I invite Dr. M K Santosh, the found, founder president of our chapter, and Dr. Naushid Ani to chair the session. thank you vishnu uh, fetal medicine is a branch that focuses on managing health concern of mother and fetus the rate of maternal and infant mortality due to the complication of pregnancy have decreased over the years with the help of fetal expert by using modern equipments like ultrasound on doppler and fetal surgery and fetoscopy now we have improved a lot in our management in all high risk pregnancies so now we have an interesting topic for this session i invite dr sandosh to call our speaker for this session ne photo ka idana sir un unmute yana unmute good morning everybody yeah yeah uh, okay okay today i am very happy that. now she start sir good morning good morning everybody uh, today i am very happy to introduce this uh, young academician bichoy k balakrishna he graduated from tharwad karnataka university in uh, 1999 20 years after i joined in my mbbs and uh, he has done his ms from uh, 
Bahrampur University in 2006. After completing his uh, MS, he has underwent training in various modalities. One is the uh, prenatal diagnostic techniques in Wadia Hospital, Mumbai, and uh, 3D and 4D ultrasound medi-scan Chennai, fetoscopy from CMAST, Mumbai. Uh, he's a uh, certified first trimester scanning with the nuchal translucency from Fetal Medicine Foundation, UK. And uh, uh, he held uh, several positions in the past. He, was, he worked as a professional lecturer in uh, uh, Trishur Medical College in 2006, consultant Lakeshore Hospital and Research Center in 2007. And he was the executive member of the first trimester screen committee in 2015. And now, and uh, he's a USD trainer in FMF India 2016. Now he's head of the department of FNB course in maternal and fetal medicine at Adapal Hospital. And his current position is specialist lead consultant in fetal medicine unit, Saimar Adapal and Saimar Kochi. His special skills are many. Uh, targeted USD and fetal echocardiography are his uh, uh, favorite uh, field. He's expert in prenatal diagnostic procedures like amniocentesis, CVS, fetal blood sampling. Prenatal therapeutic procedures, including fetal blood transfusion, fetal reduction, thoracocentesis, Soraka amniotic sh shunting and bladder shunting are his uh, specialities. He, go, he has got several uh, papers and publications to his uh, credit. He was the uh, national level speaker in more than 70 occasions and international speaker in uh, three international meetings. With the uh, proud and prestige, I introduce this dynamic personality uh, Vijay K. Balakrishnan, to you. Over to you, uh, Dr. Vijay. Thank you, and uh, good morning, everyone. Let me just uh, share my screen. This. Can you see my screen? Sorry. No, sir. Not. I am unable sure. to hear myself. Yeah. Is there somebody be able to enable me or is this all this is work? Yeah, you have been enabled, sir. It's not coming. Oh, Vishnu. So can you just try it once more? Yeah, I'm the option of my desktop is not coming. So it will be uh, on the... Uh, no, I did. Place. I did. Vijay, what you can do is uh, just minimize the Zoom. Yeah. And then open it again. Uh, uh, again, the, uh, your presentation on your desktop. And then maximize Zoom. And then from the start sharing. Okay. But normally it comes as an option. But try that. Yeah. There will be a green button on the uh, downside, sir. Share screen. The green button is uh, yes, now I'm getting it. Okay, yes. Sorry for this. Is it seen now? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. I hope I'm audible and clear. Yes. Okay. You are audible and it's very clear. Thank Your you slides so are much. also good. <laughs> Thank you so much. And sorry for uh, that long CV. I, I, if I had known that you would be taking so much time to read it, I would have probably given you one. <laughs> I work in this place, that's all. And, uh, but thank you anyway. Uh, when I started out in fetal medicine, I was always asked this question, what is fetal medicine? And I used to say that I'm just an obstetrician and I just scan a bit. And then later on, I came to realize that it's, it's difficult for me to just say that I'm just an obstetrician who scans a bit. I think the best terminology would be that I am a jack of all trades. I know a little bit of obstetrics, a little bit of pediatric cardiology, a little bit of pediatric surgery, a little bit of neonatology. So I'm just that missing link between the world of obstetrics and neonatology. And so it's a pleasure to be here and answer these common questions that come up in fetal medicine. And uh, some of these questions, I've just 
brought it down to four questions because that's what the organizers said would be useful for them. And so the four questions that I'm going to answer as, as a part of fetal medicine, the first one being is, when do I scan a patient and how many scans do I need? The second one being liker abnormalities, because I know neonatologists always hear this from the obstetrician, liker is less, shouldn't we deliver this baby? And I think one of the most common indications for prematurity apart from IUGR is this fear of low liker. And then the third question is non-invasive prenatal testing. Do we uh, advise it for all women who are at high risk or how do we use it? And lastly, a short overview on the current fetal interventions that are being done and uh, practiced the world over and especially at our center. So the first question, when to scan and why? There are five scans that you need in, in pregnancy, the dating scan, the 11 to 14 week scan, the anomaly scan, and two growth scans in the third trimester. Now the dating scan is pretty straightforward. You do it at eight to nine weeks. The primary aim being there is to see the location of the pregnancy, the number of pregnancies, and if there are any uterine anomalies. And it's a scan that is again debatable. Do we need it or don't need it? But for all those people who have missed an ectopic pregnancy, they know that it's usually safer to find out that the pregnancy is sitting nicely within the uterine cavity. But the next scan is the probably the most important scan and that is the nuchal translucency scan. In this scan, we look for chromosomal abnormalities, structural abnormalities, and we screen for the two most important killers in obstetrics, preeclampsia and preterm labor. When we screen for chromosomal abnormalities in the first trimester, we use a measurement called as the nuchal translucency, which is the normal fluid collection that you see behind the neck of the fetus and combine it with maternal markers like beta, HCG and PAPE and pick out those fetuses that are, risk for, are at risk for having the most common form of mental retardation and that is Down syndrome with a detection rate of 95%. But this combined test also has a detection rate that is good within the range of around 75% for other chromosomal abnormalities as well. And that is why this combined test should be done for all patients. It's universal screening. The 11 to 14 week scan also allows to look at fetal, ana fetal anatomy, not too much in detail, but it allows us to pick up those abnormalities that you know for sure cannot survive, like anencephaly, holoprosencephaly, or there is a limb reduction defect or a huge spinal defect or conditions where you have an omphalocele or a gastroschisis or those kind of things that can be easily seen within the first trimester and gives the patient an option on deciding whether to continue or go in for an early termination of pregnancy. It also allows us to screen for preterm delivery. And I know preterm delivery is something that all neonatologists are worried about. And by doing a good cervical length assessment and taking proper history in the first trimester, it is possible to pick out, not all, the detection rate is not that high, but it is possible to pick out at least a segment, a sector of those patients that would go into preterm uh, delivery and can be put on progesterone and you can decrease their risk for preterm birth by around 50%. But as far as preeclampsia is concerned, you can't get a better screening test. As has been clearly shown that by looking at the uterine artery, by looking at maternal markers like PLGF, you can have a 90% detection rate of those mothers who are going to develop preeclampsia. And by putting them on aspirin, you bring about a 50% reduction in your preeclampsia rate. So in the first trimester, we do a chromosomal analysis. We do a anatomical surveillance. We do screening for preterm birth and preeclampsia. Uh, pre so these are the four things that we concentrate on in the first trimester scan. The importance of this is basically that normally we have one scan probably for the anomaly scan and then probably we have a host of examinations in the third trimester. But by doing a good first trimester scan, we are inverting the pyramid of antenatal care and finding out those mothers that would need high quality care and the low risk mothers that can be managed normally in a routine obstetrics unit. And it has shown that this approach can increase your outcomes a great deal. Coming to the next scan, which is the anomaly scan. Again, a common misconception here is that you need a 3D, 4D scan to do a good anomaly scan. So let me just first throw that out of the window. You just need a good ultrasound machine that can do proper 2D examination and a color Doppler machine that will allow you to look at the baby in detail. And a good anatomy scan would take around 30 minutes. 
So it, if you are not doing a scan pro pro properly, that is when you land up in trouble and you need a checklist. And I've not elaborated this checklist because I don't want you to go in the, through the details, but you need a good checklist to tell you that you have looked at all parts of the fetal anatomy. So we look at the head, the brain in all the three planes. We look at the normal normalcy of the brain and then we go further down and look at the spine. And just to give you a rough outline as to the number of sections that we take and the images that are required to look at the baby in detail. And again, this common misconception is that if you do a good anatomy scan of the heart, do we need a fetal echo? So what we are normally doing in an anomaly scan is we are doing an extended cardiac examination. So once we have completed an extended cardiac examination, the chance that you can have a major congenital heart disease at birth is almost nil. And of course, we need to do a follow-up scan at probably 32 weeks. But if a good anomaly scan has been done, then the chances of having a congenital heart disease at birth is almost nil. So once you've gone through that series of images, you'd have looked at the limbs, you've looked at the uh, placenta, you've looked at the liker, everything is normal. That's when you say, and you've documented it, taken proper pictures, that's when you say that you have done a good anomaly scan. Once you have done that, then you're reasonably safe. You've done a good NT scan, you've done a good anomaly scan, then the rest is just about growth. And you can pick up growth abnormalities if you have a growth chart. Now, I agree with what Dr. Naveen said that choosing the chart is particularly important. And that's why when you use a chart, you have to have two growth scans, one at 36, 32 weeks and one at 36 weeks to pick up those fetuses that might have growth restriction. I disagree with uh, Dr. Naveen's point that detection of fetal growth restriction is the problem with which you end up, uh, especially the false positives are the reason why you have poor perinatal outcomes. I feel that it is not the diagnosis that is the problem. It is the trigger points when you decide for delivery that is going to create a problem. It's okay if you make a false positive diagnosis of FGR. If it is, you're clear in your mind as to when you want to deliver them, your trigger points have to be clear. And if your trigger points are clear, you can never go wrong. It is when the obstetrician panics that you go in for early delivery. And that is when you are landing up with prematurity. It is not the diagnosis of growth restriction, but when you decide to deliver. Now, once you have liker abnormalities, again, that same panic sets in. People are afraid as to is something wrong with the baby? Will the baby die in utero? And I think that, that fear stems from the, uh, the understanding that liker abnormalities are related with hypoxia, but that is not true. The first and most important thing while assessing liker volume is to understand that you have to take the single deepest vertical pocket. Do not go by AFI. If you go by AFI, there is a high chance that you will make the wrong diagnosis. So whenever you find that your AFI is low, take the single deepest vertical pocket. And if you find that it is less than two, that is when you will classify it is as oligohydramnios. Now, when you have oligohydramnios, the reasons depend upon the gestational age. So if you pick up oligohydramnios in the second trimester, 50% of the time you're looking at a malformation, not hypoxia. You're looking at some malformation that is causing this decreased lyca. But if you have like, like a posterior urethral wall or, or an autosomal recessive polycystic kidney, something is wrong that is causing this baby to have oligohydramnios at 20 weeks. But if you're picking it up in the third trimester, that is when you think of hypoxia, that is when you think of premature rupture of membranes, because that is the most common, common reason why you have decreased fluid in the third trimester, provided you have done a good anomaly scan. So if you find that there is no hypoxia, there is no growth restriction, there is no leaking in the third trimester, then you would classify them as idiopathic oligohydramnios. It is isolated, it is idiopathic, and if you increase your antenatal surveillance, these fetuses can be taken to term. There is no need to deliver a baby with oligohydramnios provided the growth Doppler biophysical profile and CTG is normal. There is no indication for early delivery. So next time when somebody tells you that the liker is less and that's why they take, they're taking out the baby, ask them specifically, is the growth normal? Is the Doppler normal? If the growth Doppler CTG biophysical profile is normal, continue the pregnancy, you can wait. Polyhydramnios is even more difficult. Again, I would suggest not to look at the AFI, look at the single deepest vertical pocket. If it is greater than eight, you're dealing with polyhydramnios. And here our biggest worry is going to be GI obstruction especially upper GI obstruction. And the saddest part here is that 40% of the time, we cannot make that diagnosis. 
we can only tell you that there is polyhydramnios. So you have a single deepest vertical pocket above eight. The first thing that you need to look at is, are you looking at an LGA baby? Are you looking at maternal diabetes that has been totally missed? If that is the case, you correct that. But if you find that the baby is of normal size, the sugars are normal, there is no reason why this baby is having polyhydramnios. Remember, as a neonatologist, the first thing that you need to do is you have to rule out upper GI obstruction. So we, as a rule, if you have polyhydramnios, as soon as the baby is born, the first We don't I think he has gone offline. Vishnu, what type of... Can you see me? I think he has gone offline. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he's back. I'm back. Yes, can you see me? Yeah, yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Please continue. Sorry about that. Uh, I hope you were able to hear till this slide. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. So I was just talking about endometazin and how you should not give it beyond 32 weeks. And if you're, if you're giving it even before 32 weeks, I would not suggest that you give it for more than 48 hours. So let me just go to the next slide. Oops. Yeah. So now coming to twins, it's slightly different because the most important thing in twins is that you have to differentiate between the type of twins that you're dealing with whether you're dealing with monochorionic or whether you're dealing with dichorionic twins. Because when you look at any kind of complication, it's obvious that it is more in monochorionic pregnancies. And the reason why that happens is that in monochorionic pregnancies, there are a host of complications that are going to develop in the mid-trimester, like TTTS, TAPS, or, or selective IUGR, or intrauterine fetal demise. Now, it's not possible for me to go through the details of each and one of these entities, but the reason why we have these problems in monochorionic pregnancies is because of the vascular communications within the placenta, which means that you have two fetuses that are connected by a single placenta and that has vascular connections that are running through them, which in turn means that when one baby dies or one baby has a complication, it leads to vascular instability and causes intrauterine demise of the other fetus or neurological problems of the other fetus. And that's why monochorionic pregnancies would need more surveillance and more scanning when compared to uh, dichorionic pregnancies or singleton pregnancies. So the protocol that we normally follow is that we have fortnightly scanning from 16 weeks onwards for all fetuses that are monochorionic. And then we continue that the same thing till delivery. Now about NIPT and invasive testing, what do we do? What do, should we offer NIPT for our patients? Now the most common misconception as far as NIPT is concerned is that we think that we are taking blood and separating fetal DNA and within the fetal DNA, we are running tests. That is the first and biggest mistake. That is not what we are doing. The Human Genome Project actually identified the percentage of each chromosome within the human blood. So in your body, the percentage of representation of each chromosome is fixed. For example, for the 21st chromosome, the percentage share of that particular chromosome is only 1.3%. So when you're taking the maternal blood, you're taking a combination of maternal and fetal DNA. And if you find that that representation or that percentage of chromosome 21, the diagnosis that there is trisomy 21. That is NIPT. You're not doing a karyotype on the fetal DNA. You're just assessing 
the percentage of contribution of each chromosome and if it exceeds the percentage that has been already shown in the human genome project you make the assumption that the baby has down syndrome that's what nipt is all about but the biggest problem about nipt is one five percent of the time you might not get a result the costs are high and also it fix, fails to pick up all the other aneuploidies that you can pick up by doing a good combined test as if as i told you before 75 percent of those clinically significant abnormalities can be picked up with a good combined test and also when you do an nipt if it comes out as positive, it does not mean that the baby has Down syndrome. It simply means that you need to do further testing. And again, a very important point, the negative predictive value of both these tests, the combined test and the NIPT is the same, which means if the NIPT comes out as negative or if the combined test comes out as negative, both of them means the same thing. It's because the prevalence of this disease is quite low. So this is how we manage our patients, we do a combined test. And for those that have an increased risk between one in 100 and above, we go for amniocentesis. And those that are in between one in 100 and one in 1000, we do an NIPT. And those that are above one in 1000, we offer no testing at all. Now, having said that, we will not offer NIPT for fetuses that have an NT greater than 3.5 or fetuses that have a structural malformation. Basically because 8% of these fetuses could have additional abnormalities on your karyotype or your microarray. Now, coming to the last part of my talk, basically on fetal therapy, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the procedures that can be done right now and the, the procedures that are actually uh, proven to be of use. They are fetal reduction, intrauterine transfusions, thoracoamniotic shunting, fetoscopic laser, radiofrequency ablation interstitial laser and bipolar cord coagulation. Now fetal reduction is basically when you want to reduce the number of fetuses within the uterus. It's basically you try to save one fetus while you sacrifice the other. So the indications are usually higher order gestations or fetuses with discordant abnormalities or if you have a triplet pregnancy with a monochorionic pair. It is not a beautiful sight to see but it is something that needs to be done for the greater good. So normally what we do is we select fetuses that are either small compared to the rest or have some congenital malformation. Now this is a twin pregnancy with one baby having in encephaly. As you can see, the skull is not looking normal in there. And in this fetus, we did fetal reduction. You can see the needle coming in and we instill KCL into the heart of the fetus. When the fetus is abnormal, it's slightly okay, I guess, but when it's a normal fetus in higher order gestations, it is a procedure that does carry a little bit of guilt, I guess. And after this procedure, we confirm that the heart rate is, has stopped and we also do a repeat scan the following day. Intrauterine transfusion is a life-saving procedure. It is a procedure in which you can definitely guarantee that the baby is going to survive and the indications are RH incompatibility, power virus infections, fetal maternal infect hemorrhage, or a twin anemia polycythemia sequence. Now, the way we make the diagnosis of fetal anemia is by looking at the middle cervical artery peak systolic velocity. And if it is greater than 1.5 moms, we know that there is fetal anemia. The blood has to be prepared for the fetus. You cannot give it directly like you give for, for an adult. They have the blood has to have a higher hematocrit at the range of around 80 to 90, and it has to be irradiated for us before we can give it to the fetus. And normally when we do fetal transfusion, we try to approach the umbilical vein within the liver, or we try to catch the umbilical vein as it exits out of the placenta or as it enters into the fetal abdomen. So here you can see the needle is going into the portal vein. And once it's in the portal vein, we start our transfusion. And normally we would require at least two or three transfusions depending upon the degree of severity of fetal anemia. And this is one, one therapy that's definitely life-saving and there is no need to do preterm delivery in fetal anemia. I think that's something neonatologists would definitely agree because they would prefer to have a baby that is born at term without anemia. The other condition is pleural effusion or uh, CPAMs. Now they are cystic structures within the thorax that are causing compression of the heart and can cause eye drops and of course fetal demise. So here what we do is we use a Harrison shunt 
which actually shunts the uh, fluid from the thorax into the amniotic cavity. And this is a case of a macrocystic CPAN in which we are doing a shunt that goes into the cystic space and drains it out into the amniotic cavity. I will speed this up to you for want of time. And here you can see the shunt here located inside the cyst and the other one sitting on the anterior chest wall and it drains out this cyst completely, thereby relieving the pressure on the heart and preventing the occurrence of eye drops. Radiofrequency ablation is when we uh, coagulate vessels that are going to create a problem for the fetus, like as in choreangiomas or in conditions of selective IUGR or discordant anomalies, where you want to specifically reduce a baby in a monochorionic twin pregnancy. And here we use that needle and enter into the area where the umbilical vein and the umbilical artery enters into the liver and we fulgurate those vessels, thereby creating fetal demise. Interstitial laser is another technique, again, to ablate vessels. This is again done in twin pregnancies where you have one baby that is abnormal, like a trapped fetus, or it can also be done in conditions where you have a congenital malformation like a urethrocele, megalourethra, or chorioangiomas. This is for a trapped fetus. You can see the trap blood supply is here slightly hazy because of the electrical artifacts. And then we do an ablation of those vessels. But a particularly satisfying uh, uh, use of interstitial laser is this, where we had an obstruction to the distal part of the urethra. You can see that this is a megalo urethra here and where we used interstitial laser to fulgurate the tip of the penile urethra and thereby create an opening. And as a result of the, which, we were able to relieve the obstruction and this was how it looked post-surgery. So thereby relieving the obstruction of the kidneys and improving the outcomes. Fetoscopy is again a method by which we try to separate out the shared circulation between the two fetuses. And this is how it will look like as we enter into the amniotic cavity. We see the fetus, we trace the um, the, uh, the vessels on the placenta. And once we identify the anastomosis, we fulgurate them. That's the umbilical cord that you see, that is the uh, abdominal insertion. And from there, we try to proceed. I, I'm not going to show you the whole procedure, don't worry. I'm just taking you through small uh, bits and pieces of it so that you can understand. And that's the membrane that you're seeing between the two fetuses. And those are the anastomosis that we are trying to fulgurate. And this is how it will look when we fulgurate. We use a uh, laser, and these are the anastomoses that you're seeing, the connections between uh, the two uh, vessels on the placenta. And with the help of a green diode laser, we burn off the communications between uh, the two fetuses. So to sum up, uh, the world of obstetrics and neonatology is completely changing. And if you ask me even today, I'll say that I'm an obstetrician who knows to scan a bit, a pediatric surgeon who knows to do a little bit of surgery, fetal surgery, a neonatologist who, who knows a little bit of uh, perinatal care, but the main idea of a fetal medicine specialist is to ensure smooth transition from one world to the next so that there are no surprises. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. It was an excellent informative talk. Uh, in short of time, we can go into the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Joy, for that wonderful session. Thank you, Naushid and uh, Santosh, sir, for chairing the session. We'll go on to the next session. It's on uh, antenatal and neonatal implications of intrauterine infections. We have two great academicians, Dr. Betsy Thomas and Dr. Somshekar Nimbalkar, uh, as our speakers. I invite Dr. Christine Indumati and Dr. M. Narayanan to chair the se session. Narayanan, sir, over to you. Unmute, yeah, sir. Unmute. Yeah. Yes. Uh, good afternoon to you all. In the next uh, 45 minutes, we have an important, interesting topic uh, that is intrauterine infections in the, in the antenatal and the postnatal period, its implications. And we have two stalwarts discussing on that. Coming to Intrauterine infections, we all know, 
it has been a major inserting factor to the fetus during the intrauterine period. But apart from inflicting damages to the multi systems of the fetus, it also harms the baby by inducing premature labor. It is that, that about 25% of prematurity is due to intrauterine infections. We all know that intrauterine infections, it is better to prevent than to treat. Anyway, to discuss on this important topic, we will start with uh, Dr. Betsy Thomas, MD, FRCOG, and who is the principal and uh, professor and head of the Department of Obstetrics and uh, Gynecology, uh, Ambala Institute of Medical Science, Trishur. And she has been the organizing secretary of uh, U Uva Foxy in 2017 and uh, AKCOG in 2018, and past president of Trichu Obstetrics and Gynec Society, past chief person of Oncology Committee of KFOG, and vice chairperson on Maternal and uh, Fetal Medicine Committee, KFOG. The other speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Somashegar Nimbalkar, a pediatrician who will be introduced to you later by our, my co chair. Dr. Christine Indumadi. So now over to Dr. Bitsi Thomas, please. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Can you please introduce Dr. Somasekar also because we'll be talking side by side. Okay. So uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank the organizers and Dr. Christine Indumadi for uh, inviting me to such an important and prestigious conference on perinatal infections. Uh, I'd like to introduce Somasekar, sir. And uh, we all know him very well. He's a professor mm -hmm. from Chicken and Balkan, who is very well known as a national coordinator for us, for the NNF NRP program. And he is a professor and head of the Department of Neonatology, uh, Pramukhswami Medical College, Gujarat, and associate dean of the Baikaka University, Karansar. And he is the honorary secretary of the KMC Foundation of India. And he is an editor and associate editor of many journals, including the a prestigious journal of neonatology, NNF. And he's also contributed to many journals and research papers. So he's a well-known speaker and we all know him. Thank you, sir. Dr. Shamsheker. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I would just like to place my thanks for uh, to uh, NNF Kerala, IP Vadkara, and uh, Perinatal Chapter for inviting me. And of course, my uh, various friends in, in Kerala and Dr. Vishnu Mohan, who is... Uh, coordinating this uh, particular event. Uh, also, I'm happy to have worked with Dr. Betsy for this presentation and I should start. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, respected chairpersons, uh, my co-speaker, Dr. Somashekar, and organizers of Pericon. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, let us just get into business without wasting much time. Intrauterine infections, antenatal and neonatal implications. The word which comes to our mind would be torch, but we are not going to discuss about torch today. And from an obstetrician point of view, we have been teaching undergraduates years after years that torch can cause recurrent miscarriages, but that concept is gone now because as we all know, these patients will zero convert. By the time they are in for the next pregnancy, they would have had immunity, so it's not a cause of recurrent miscarriages, maybe except in the case of toxoplasma because it takes a long time to zero convert. So no more discussion on torts. So we are going to some important viral infections of current interest. And definitely COVID-19 is top, followed by varicella, herpes, HIV, hepatitis B. We have arranged amongst Somashekar sir and myself that we'll be talking about each topic, the antenatal part of it, the neonatal implications, and then we'll go to the next topic. So let's start with COVID-19. From Kerala point of view, as of today, like we had been the, in the forefront of with the least maternal mortality and infant mortality in the whole country. And we had been the only state in the country which had been doing a confidential review of maternal deaths of all the cases which happened here. We have a strong support system here with which Kerala Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecology do that. 
And we were quite shocked and saddened that recently we came to know that around 37 maternal COVID deaths happened in our state over a span of few weeks. And out of that, only first seven in the first wave, that was August, September, October. But 30 of them, I think still it, the reports are pouring in. Just last mm -hmm. week, we had a confidential review. That's why I'm presenting the data. 30 of them over a span of a few weeks. That is why we thought like it is high time we should draw uh, guidelines, we should publicize, we should get everybody know what's happening. And now we are having weekly meetings. Every Wednesday we are arranging a meeting on what went wrong and what good lessons we can learn out of it. And without and uh, from uh, to, to the pediatric, pediatrics friends here, majority of these patients are coming in the third trimester. And another important fact is most of them are dying of COVID pneumonia. Most of them, COVID pneumonia, maybe a few with added cytokine storm. And now the problem is, now we have taken our GCPR. That's a good clinical practice recommendations. GCPR recommends for the Kerala state, at least we can evacuate the uterus after maybe 28 weeks so that the maternal respiratory effort can be improved. Ventilation can be improved. So... For the pediatric colleagues, we may be adding to your work. Many of the premature COVID neonates can come to your side. That's the importance of this topic today. And I won't take you through this busy slide. Just remember the categorization is not A, B, and C for pregnant mothers. We have recategorized them to B1, B2, or C. This is B1 is nothing but category A, and B2 was the original category B. And we, I won't talk much about the pregnancy aspect. And so much of information is pouring in day by day. So much of literature. If you had asked me to present this last year, this time, I would have confidently said there's no vertical transmission. Nothing will happen. Even for all mothers, COVID-19 is just like any non-pregnant uh, patients. But today, after one year, we have got a lot of information on this. We have to change our wordings. Yes, vertical transmission does seem to occur in a minority of cases of maternal COVID, mainly in the third trimester. And no assessment can yet be made regarding the rates of vertical transmission in early pregnancy. And we don't get to see more of miscarriages. We don't get to see anomalies as of now. This might change. And a lot of literature I went through and maybe the most important statements from few literature search. Pregnant women show the same manifestation of COVID-19 as non-pregnant adult patients. There's no confusion on that. Even all over the world, they have agreed that the case fatality rate of non-pregnant hospitalized patients is less than pregnant hospitalized patients. And complications of COVID-19 in pregnancy, like postpartum hemorrhage, cesarean delivery. Naturally, earlier it was almost 100% cesarean. Now, cesarean is only for obstetric indication. We don't just do cesarean. And definitely, the rate of preterm labor is going to be high, maybe iatrogenic also. And this is some data on vertical transmission around 5.3% and the rate of positive neonatal COVID is around 8%. Again, uh, this is undergoing change day by day. Whatever said then, then all bodies have come to a consensus that breastfeeding can be promoted in a COVID positive uh, postpartum mother. Women and their families should be informed that infection with COVID-19 is not a contraindication to breastfeeding, provided in a routine case, if breastfeeding would have been promoted, in just because the patient, this mother is COVID-19, we don't have to withhold uh, breastfeeding. Now I hand over to Somshega sir for the neonatal part of it. Thank you, Dr. Betsy. So uh, as you said, we are learning uh, through this uh, pandemic. Uh, last year, I think when uh, the first wave came in um, May, June, July, and it was different across various states. Uh, but most of the people discussing pediatrician neonatal so looking at NICUs, the, our preterm rates have gone down. And I think that was the uh, indication in most places across the world around uh, September, October, around that time last year. And probably this was because everyone went into lockdown phase, people rested, they had food, uh, at least those people who could, uh, who had the means and excess and who did not lose jobs. And so overall, uh, those patients coming to hospitals, the preterm rates uh, came down. Uh, but as we have seen and as we have realized over uh, the, the spikes that happened in November, December and the recent spike uh, surge that happened in, in March and April, uh, 
many people got infected during their pregnancies. So last year when we had in May, June, many of the mothers that were coming to us were in their third trimester and they were getting infected during the last few weeks of pregnancy. But increasingly more, more mothers started getting infected in the second trimester and probably some in the first trimester. So we do not know what happens to those who get it in the first trimester. But as we see, as more and more mothers are getting infected during earlier trimesters, uh, as you said, there, are, there is an increased incidence of uh, preterm labor and uh, preterm birth. So our preterms, so many of our mothers that, that are delivering, we are getting more and more uh, preterm births from these mothers who are, who are getting infected. Uh, there is less perinatal transmission, as you mentioned, about 5 to 10 percent. Many of the neonates don't turn out positive, but they're actually preterm. So they end up in the NICU because of their prematurity. Otherwise, they have no reason uh, to be in the NICU. Uh, and so uh, we have various options in terms of what kind of babies we can get. Uh, we can have either a mother who's positive or, or, is, sus or is suspect. And if she's asymptomatic, uh, and then she can, the uh, baby can remain remain with the mother because uh, a recent publication in Lancet showed that uh, if you separate all the babies born to the mothers who are COVID suspect or COVID positive, uh, if you separate them, then you will be preventing about 2,500 to 3,000 COVID infections in the newborn. But by just separating them, you are actually going to cause deaths of one like 25,000 newborns because they don't get breastfeeding, they don't get skin to skin care. And they could, so the risk benefit ratio of separating uh, babies and mothers is definitely not there. The only reason why you might want to separate them is if the mother is in the, in the ICU because of uh, severe COVID, like you mentioned, COVID pneumonia. So we have had two or three deaths in our hospital uh, because of um, mother, pregnant mother with COVID. And most of them had COVID pneumonia, as you mentioned. Uh, now, so if the mother is sick and admitted in the ICU, then obviously the baby can't be kept there. So that is the reason for separation. Or if the baby is by itself small and hence requires an ICU care. Uh, so in general, so but if both the mother and baby are stable, then uh, they can be kept in the same room. They can continue breastfeeding and the baby is smaller, but not does not require admission to an ICU, then they can continue to give uh, a skin a skin to skin care and as you mentioned of course breastfeeding and discharge as as usual uh, definitely it is preferable uh, that uh, mothers wear masks all the time during the time that they're expected to be infective to others so that's roughly a 10 day period uh, so suppose they got infected three or four or five days before delivery then it's just five days after delivery and not not after that uh, of course babies don't need to have any face covering there of of any sort uh, in case uh, the baby is. Uh, you have to move the slide. I'm sorry. Uh, can I go to the next slide? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, I was moving my slide and I realized it's not my way to move. So, can you give me remote control? I. It is possible. I think. I'm requesting remote control. So you can also. Yeah. So, uh, preterm. Uh, if if the if the baby is uh, uh, preterm or term and the unit is asymptomatic. Then, of course, uh, you can have breastfeeding, etc. going on. We discussed this. And vaccination and newborn screening as usual. Uh, okay. Uh, if the baby is symptomatic, and this is not really very common, uh, then uh, what can happen is then baby goes to the NICU and gets usual care. What you see on, on, on the slide is actually not very evidence-based, and this is being used by different people. At, and so I would be very careful in kind of taking this as, as the ultimate thing. Uh, most of the babies that I, I know uh, who get sick are actually sick because of neonatal conditions, and it's very difficult to differentiate them from uh, COVID conditions. And uh, you, you're better off uh, just kind of man managing uh, them as neonatal conditions. Uh, if you really suspect COVID, then you should get all the parameters that are inflammatory parameters that, that are being tested. Uh, as positive, but it can be pretty difficult to differentiate. Coming to uh, if the baby is an outborn and comes in, and if you don't have a positive report on the mother, then uh, you can test the baby at, at, at delivery. And if it is not possible at delivery, uh, or if it is negative, then uh, test uh, at 48 hours, 24 to 48 hours later, and preferably definitely by five days. So at the earliest opportunity that you have, then you can test within within a week. Uh, so that's that's how it is. But most of the babies that we have seen, we have had at least uh, uh, 50 babies who have uh, turned uh, back COVID positive and all of them had uh, no issues at all. And as you see, most of the uh, publications that are there, uh, most of the babies really don't, don't develop very serious COVID. Uh, there are a few presentations that are being made uh, currently and we must be knowing that you're also suspecting a neonatal MIC, MIC which we can see in the next slide. Next. 
oh sorry i am confused uh, so discharge based criteria as i discussed uh, again if the baby is asymptomatic and there, there are no issues per se uh, so i am coming to mic so mic has been uh, discussed as uh, can happen between 2 to 6 weeks after a covid infection you can even suspect it up to 12 weeks but generally within 2 to 6 weeks uh, now there is something called as the fetal inflammatory response syndrome which i have not made slides for but that also exists and it is possible that the mother, the mother was infected earlier then there might be inflammation occurring within the within the body of the mother which gets passed on to the baby and the baby also starts a inflammatory response syndrome so when the baby is born uh, it can have a, 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 a mist kind of uh, picture in the in the neonate uh, it is very important to ensure that we have at least uh, signs of multi system involvement uh, with conjunctivitis hypotension or shock and and cardiac dysfunction now my, we should understand that many of the babies that are born if they are premature and this kind of uh, definition is more easy to look at in a term baby uh, because many of them may not have cardiac dysfunction if everything was okay if there was no birth asphyxia etc but if a baby is preterm then many of this uh, kind of diagnosing this based on this parameters can be very difficult so it's easier to apply all the what you say def case definitions to term stable infants rather than uh, unstable preterm infants so i think this is something that we should keep in mind while trying to make a make a lot of diagnosis uh, there is of course uh, again a lot of lung uh, ultrasound that can be done to kind of look whether the baby has a covid kind of pneumonia uh, can, yeah now can i go back so uh it, many many times uh, if, if this happens then you might want to consider ivag or steroid but i think it it should be a well balanced discuss, discussion and you should be very careful in giving steroids with the general discussion in mic in children is you give steroids and the patients improve uh as it is making a diagnosis of mic in the newborn can be very difficult and it can be very challenging so Uh, preferably, you should be very careful in deciding on giving steroid because uh, giving steroid in the neonatal period can have very harmful influences on the on the CNS of the baby, and uh, one should be very circumspect and be very careful while making this particular diagnosis. Uh, and it can be it is a very difficult diagnosis to make as of now, at least because we don't really have any indicators. Uh, the NNF and FOXI and IP guidelines, the version three of the guidelines, uh, which were released the version first in April, and, and I think. march and april last year uh, we will have the guidelines in about 10 days next and we will probably have more information on this uh, when the guidelines come out so uh, go ahead yes yes uh, thank you sir uh, so from covid uh, to viral hepatitis uh, hepatitis e is important because it is fatal for the pregnant mother as much as 50% of the pregnant mothers affected with viral hepatitis e can die but i won't be discussing that here let us go to hepatitis b uh unlike covid the risk of transplacental transmission in hepatitis b may be the rates are almost the same but peripartum transmission is very high in hepatitis b unless we treat it we pick it up at the right moment the problems for the baby can be lifelong so we do recommend universal screening of all pregnant mothers for hepatitis b and hiv maybe as obstetricians when we started this universal screening we did it for ourselves just to know whether we have to take care of our infection control practices but now we are very clear it has to be for the baby sake also and hbcg is the commonest investigation what we do if hbcg turns positive we have to go for hepatitis b e antigen and hepatitis b viral dna load and i know the slide is a little confusing but just follow me first pregnancy visit we give hbcg if hbcg is positive we go for hbv dna the importance of hbv dna is if the viral load is very high we have to start we there is effective treatment for hepatitis b virus now in pregnancy that is for the mother's sake as well as to prevent transmission to the baby and also hbe antigen hbe antigen is important for two aspects first is we can know the infectivity of the mother if hbe antigen is positive that means that mother is very infective even otherwise our infection control practices have to be pakka but this mother is going to be more infective second is to decide on the treatment and hbv dna if more than 2 lakhs international unit per ml that is equivalent to 10 lakhs 
copies it's a multiplication factor of five is there somewhere and all you will see 10 raised to six that's the same as this two lakh international unit per ml if it is more than two lakh international unit per ml we have to consider treatment starting from 20 to 32 weeks so that at least three months of treatment will be there for the baby and the treatment as of today, the safest drug is tenofovir. The same tenofovir what we recommend in HIV. The only thing is in many literature, you will see it is a TDF because there are many molecules for this tenofovir. TDF just is tenofovir disproxyl fumarate. That is found to be the safest. That's why everywhere you will see the term TDF. And even though this slide says that we can stop three months after delivery, that's again from fetal or the neonatal point of view, if the HPV DNA load is very high, we can continue the treatment lifelong as we are going to discuss in the case of HIV also. If HPV DNA is less than 2 lakh, there's no need for antiretroviral, antiviral therapy. Again, some of our gastroenterologists will differ their opinion here because what they feel is they have got two more magic numbers, 2,000, 20,000, and this 2 lakh, which is projected here. What they say is 2,000, if it is 2000, we have to think about HBE antigen. And if HBE antigen is negative at 2000, we have to consider again antiviral therapy. And if it is 20,000, above 20,000, if you suspect chronic active hepatitis with HBE antigen positivity, we have to think about antiviral therapy. So 2 lakh is not the only number for gastro people. They say about 2000, 20,000 and 2 lakh. And uh, like if the delivery is preterm or if there is a prior child with immunoprophylaxis failure also, we'll consider therapy. And as I already mentioned, it is tenofovir. We start from around 28 weeks and it is now recommended to continue lifelong for the sake of the mother if the viral load is high. Now to show, so much, Yeah, uh, so I, as uh, Dr. Betsy mentioned, this again uh, shows the same uh, slide what she uh, discussed. So I'll skip this, but we and should be, as she mentioned, uh, we have a high percentage of transmission that can happen in an hepatitis uh, B positive mother. So, uh, and so, and if the hepatitis B uh, is negative, so if you get a mother with hepatitis B positive, then doing hepatitis B uh, e uh, antigen is important because if it is negative, then the risk drops, but if it is high, then the risk is very high. So this is something which will allow you to uh, make a decision. Uh, this is the same one uh, which she showed, uh, and so I will skip this. Uh, I just kept it so that uh, it, it was there. But uh, just understand that uh, screening the mother. Uh, so there are very clear cut steps when you get a mother whose hepatitis B positive. Uh, we should always screen uh, everyone for hepatitis B surface antigen. And if it is positive, there are very clear cut ways to go about managing it. So uh, there is very little confusion in managing a mother who is hepatitis B surface antigen uh, positive. Okay, so if the if the mother is positive, then uh, we this is very important. We need to give hepatitis B vaccine along with uh, hepatitis B immunoglobulin, uh, preferably within the first twelve hours after birth, uh, and, and intramuscular and separate thighs. Uh, if you don't get it because hepatitis B immunoglobulin is difficult to get at many times, then uh, maybe you can give it later on also on by twenty four hours or even up till about 48 to 72 hours. But the earlier you give it, the better the better effect it has. Now, it is why why doing, why doing knowing a mother uh, is hepatitis B positive is important or not, because uh, the most important thing is getting that immunoglobulin, yeah, because many times in peripheral places, you may not have it available. Uh, I think a few years back, it went out of stock across, uh, across India. And so that's something which uh, we should keep in mind. And in case you don't get, uh, uh, then you can still go ahead and give the uh, vaccine by itself. Uh, at around 9 to 18 months of age, then you can do a follow-up testing for anti-HBase antibodies and HBACG testing. As you can see from the screen, uh, if the ba baby is anti-HBase uh, antibodies negative and HBACG positive, then obviously, uh, despite whatever has happened, baby has HBV infection and uh, you need to follow up uh, regularly in a GI clinic or a liver clinic. Why is it important? Because all of these babies who get infected uh, in the perinatal period are very at a very high risk of developing uh, liver liver cancer and a persistent HBV infection throughout the life, and would require uh, management uh, by a, by experienced person. Uh, 
uh, if the anti hbs antibodies are 10 10 mil, uh, international units or more and if the hbs is negative then the baby is immune and has escaped uh, hbs infection uh, but if the anti hbs is less than 10 mil units per uh, ml and the hbs is negative which means that the baby is lucky, did not get the infection, but is still not protected against HPCG if it uh, were to get it from any other source. Uh, remember that when you give a primary uh, course of immunization for HPCG to any individual, uh, about 5% of uh, people do not develop antibodies. So this baby is within that 5% and we need to give a repeat uh, vaccination of uh, three doses of uh, HB, HB, uh, hepatitis B vaccine. Uh, so this particular baby has received three doses, but still the uh, antibody levels are low and hence you need to re repeat, repeat the dosing. Okay. And uh, it is sometimes it, it rarely can happen that the person, the child can be still uh, negative. So in which case then probably the child needs to be careful and requires further evaluation. Okay. Uh, now there was a question I can see uh, Dr. Suraj asked, baby can be breastfed if so baby can definitely be breastfed. That's not an issue. So I, I don't think that's a problem as far as breastfeeding is concerned. Uh, next, uh, Madam, uh, we'll take, for, take it forward. Okay. From hepatitis B to HIV. Uh, HIV, when it started in 90, late 1980s, the first case in Kerala was actually reported in 1988. We all thought that we are going to see a large number of HIV positive mothers and it's going to be a havoc in the coming years. But now, actually, the incidence is coming down. But still, again, this is important, not only from infection control point of view, but also from prevention of parent to child transmission of HIV. Unlike the 90% what we saw in hepatitis B, here the rates are low. Even though the slide is very confusing, the rough rate is around 30% from the mother to the child. If we don't take any care during pregnancy, no treatment, no care during peripartum period, no care for the neonate, the transmission will be roughly around 30%. And till a few years back, the classical teaching for us obstetricians were HIV, if positive, the treatment need be started only very late because it's not going to change. Maybe as late as 28 or even 36 weeks. Second thing was we can stop the treatment once the mother delivers. That is only to prevent the transmission to the child. The second teaching was all the HIV positive mothers should be delivered by cesarean section to reduce the risk of transmission to the baby. And the third thing was there's no question of breastfeeding to any of these babies. All the three things which we used to cl hold closely to our heart, everything has changed during the last few years. So now we have to start treatment whenever we diagnose HIV for the mother and that treatment has to be continued lifelong for the mother's sake. We need not do cesarean. Cesarean section is only for obstetric indication in HIV. Even if the mother is diagnosed at 36 weeks, we can start with highly active antiretroviral therapy. That is heart and then deliver the baby vaginally. And we should breastfeed. For that matter, for all the infections, what we're talking today, we can breastfeed the baby. And what's the choice of the drug for ART or ARV prophylaxis? The recommended first line treatment for any of these women is TDF. Again, the same TDF what we were mentioning for hepatitis B. That's tenofovir. Three TC is lamovidin. And EFV is effavirenz. Effavirenz, there was a lot of doubt whether it was safe in pregnancy, but now there's clear indication that it's safe in pregnancy. So we give a combination of tenofovir, lamovidin, and effavirenz. It is available as a fixed drug combination in one single pill. If there had been a prior exposure to a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase in uh, inhibitor like nevrapin or effavirenz earlier for this mother, we go for lopinavir. That's the only change of drug treatment. And this is from NACO. NACO chapter 5 clearly says that all HIV infected pregnant women should start ART. Start ART as soon as possible. Earlier we used to say that we have to wait till the first trimester is over, start at 14 weeks, but here we can start as soon as possible and continue ART throughout pregnancy, delivery, breastfeeding period and of course lifelong even if the pregnant woman presents very late in pregnancy including those present after 36 even on the day of delivery we come to know that she is positive just start off hard at least give the first dose of the treatment and then deliver the baby over to sir 
Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Batsi. And now uh, I just wanted to share that uh, I think yesterday or day before yesterday was some 40 or 41 years of uh, uh, finding the HIV virus. And another significant commonality between COVID and HIV is uh, Dr. Fossey, who was Anthony Fossey, who is leading the thing in US, was one of the persons who kind of uh, propagated what is called as the PEPFAR uh, program in, in US. PEPFAR was actually a program by the US to support uh, Africa mainly for uh, HIV treatment. So uh, I think in 1994 or 1995, many of these uh, drugs started being given to pregnant mothers and babies uh, so that uh, perinatal transmission was prevented. So I, those were the first studies where it came down from one third baby, like every one in every three baby getting infection to probably less than 5% at that point of time. And over 20, 25 years, I think we have seen more and more drugs coming in and a lot of uh, change has happened and uh, we can actually have... Uh, uh, very reduced number of uh, transmission. So it's something, though uh, we don't have a vaccine for HIV or we don't have uh, uh, like anything curative for HIV, it, it, the current amount of number of drugs that are available for treatment for everyone and of course for prevention of transmission is actually uh, a very good indication how science has thrived over the last 25 years. So as you can see in the screen, this was shown by Madam and uh, the risk is pretty high if uh, nothing nothing is done. Uh, but we don't do that. We continue uh, to ensure that the mother gets uh, treatment as, as Madam mentioned and coming to postnatal period, uh, we have to uh, start uh, ARV prophylaxis. We can use nevirapine or zidovudine and uh, follow the guidelines. Uh, I actually know uh, some uh, people who are 22 years old whose mothers have HIV, but the kid has not developed HIV and, and they're pretty healthy. So it's important to understand that uh, you can have uh, children who were treated, uh, whose mothers are treated and they can be perfectly normal. Now, uh, infant feeding is one of the most, most important point. Uh, that was uh, that had a lot of good trials in uh, early 2000s or 2002, where any kind of mixed mix feeding was frowned upon, and this kind of advice continues to happen. So, if uh, uh, mother baby should preferably be preferably be uh, given uh, exclusive breastfeeding, and uh, if if the baby baby and baby also needs to be started on uh, cotrimoxazole or prophylaxis uh, at six 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 weeks of age. And uh, di diagnosing at various points of time using an early infant diagnosis by DNA PCR. And if positive, the baby can be referred to an uh, ART center. Uh, if the baby is infected, then ensuring that the baby receives uh, HIV care and uh, early treatment uh, is useful. So, uh, using the in uh, intervention as early as possible is important. And uh, exclusive breastfeeding for six months and uh, ARV prophylaxis for six weeks after the baby is born. Uh, no mixed feeding at any cost within the first six. And this is the most dangerous point, uh, which which does happen. And apart from the malnutrition, et cetera, that can happen if you give, give kind of uh, bottle feeding other things. Uh, th that also causes lots of deaths. And that has been shown by various trials. Uh, as long as the FRS criteria are fulfilled, which is affordable, feasible, acceptable, and sustainable and safe. And these are very old uh, guidelines kind of in terms of FRS criteria. They are almost, I think, 15 years or 16 years old. Uh, it's important to ensure that uh, these are very, very well followed and they have been shown uh, not to increase uh, transmission from the mother to baby. Uh, mother should also continue to receive, uh, receive, receive uh, ARV and that definitely ensures that uh, transmission to the baby does not happen. Uh, all of this is directly related to the viral loads in the mother and ensuring good treatment of the mother uh, will ensure that the baby will has very less chance to get uh, infected. Uh, so... After six months, you can uh, continue to uh, continue complementary feeding. And uh, if the mother babies are HIV negative, then they can continue breastfeeding for at least uh, 12, 12 months. And uh, doing early inf uh, infant diagnosis at six weeks of age or anytime after that uh, within the first six months of age. Uh, the dried blood spot tests are, uh, tests are there and you can reconfirm uh, at around 18 months of age um, using various uh, rap rapid tests which are there. Uh, so the six weeks uh, point earlier for, me, for babies is important where you can uh, diagnose early and if they're positive, start them on anti-HIV treatment. 
<coughs> breast feeding should not be stopped uh, abruptly is what is another indication of, of the feeding. Uh, this is the ARB regimen uh, which is there. I will not go into much details, uh, but you can see that uh, azadothiamidine and nevirapin are uh, commonly used. And this, this is well known and uh, this has not changed much uh, over, the, over the last many years. So I will skip this because this is kind of detailed and can be found from textbooks. Uh, but the point what I want to make is using ARV drugs for prophylaxis and cordramoxazole after six weeks is important and has been shown to be very useful. Yeah, I think uh, vaccines, uh, the same vaccines as uh, all babies. Uh, if uh, HIV infected uh, children with immunosuppression are there, then except for BCG, OPV and varicella vaccines, all other vaccines uh, can, can be given. Yes, ma'am. Uh, back to yes, you. Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, maybe the only infection we have chosen out of our torch is herpes uh, because of the perinatology point of view importance of it. So as you all know, orolabial herpes is mainly caused by HSV1 and genital herpes is mainly caused by HSV2. Maybe if you just do a, a, like a cross-section, it will be 90% HSV2 and 10% HSV1 for genital herpes. The frequently asked questions what we face will be, one is genital herpes for the first time, that is primary genital herpes. There are two types of herpetic infection. One is a primary genital herpes and one is a recurrent uh, genital herpes. First time, it comes in the first and second trimester of pregnancy. We can start the treatment. The drug is acyclovir. The dosage I'll put up later. And these mothers can have a next question is whether they should have a cesarean section or vaginal delivery. They can have a safe vaginal delivery because by the time they reach the third trimester and the time of delivery, all these lesions would have healed. So we can start treatment as cyclovir even in the first trimester, and they can have a safe vaginal delivery in the I mean in the third trimester. Second is if there is an active primary genital herpes at the time of delivery, if there are active lesions at the time of delivery or if the mother developed primary herpes within six weeks of delivery, there may be shedding of the virus in the genital secretions. We should go for an elective cesarean section to reduce the transmission to the newborn. Suppose the mother comes with leaking. What if already you know, the mother has started leaking and all exposure is there? If the exposure with a leaking or that's premature rupture of membrane of more than six hours, again, we can think whether vaginal delivery because already the exposure has happened. But even if PROM, if the mother reports within six hours of primary genital herpetic infection at the time of delivery, we have to take her up for an abdominal operative delivery. If it is, third point, if it is active recurrent genital herpes at the time of delivery, recurrent genital herpes, even if active at the time of delivery, the chance of transmission to the baby is less than 3%. So we can have a safe vaginal delivery. The risk is only 0 to 3%. Whereas if it were active primary genital herpes, the risk would have been as high as 41%. In case there is a doubt, better go for We are not sure whether it's a primary or the recurrent one. Then definitely go for cesarean section. Otherwise, if you're very sure it's a recurrent genital herpes, she can have a safe vaginal delivery. Breastfeeding, of course, breastfeeding can be promoted. There is no contraindication for breastfeeding. About the treatment, about the drug, for primary infection, it is oral acyclovir. 200 milligram, five times a day for five days. Same thing for chickenpox we'll be seeing later. It will be 800 milligram. Trust of the dose is same here. For genital herpes, it is 200 milligram. And if it's a recurrent infection, oral cyclovir, 400 milligram, two times a day for five days. If the mother comes with severe infection, like we have got, and if there's any contraindication to oral preparation, we have got IV cyclovir also. Over to sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so uh, again, uh, it it happens most common in the perinatal period and most commonly during intrapartum transmission. So uh, having an idea and if you know that the mother is uh, infected, it definitely helps. Uh, we have an issue when the babies come from outside and you don't have an, any good antenatal history, then that is the time when we can get stuck, especially if the baby has seizures and some CNS infection. So, and when having a good history is important. So, but if you know in advance, uh, it can it can be pretty uh, helpful. Yeah. So, you can have kind of three categories of disease in the baby. Uh, what is called as... Uh, uh, the SEM or the skin, eye and mouth where vesicles appear on the 6th to 
nine day of the neonatal life. Uh, you can have the CNS disease, as I mentioned, where lethargy, seizures, and uh, temperature instability and hypotonia can happen. Or you can have uh, disseminated infection with various organs uh, in involvement and uh, with a very severe mortality. Now, uh, where uh, pneumonitis and fulminant hepatitis, uh, if they are there, then again, it shows that there might be very high mortality. So there are basically three categories of uh, neonatal disease which are there. And uh, so if, the, if it is a maternal primary or a non-primary first episode, then having a HSV, PCR or a culture of genital lesions can, can be helpful. Uh, while you, you can offer an elective, uh, elective CS, uh, regardless of lesion status at injury or membrane rupture within less than four hours. Uh, you can swab infants, canida, uh, nasopharynx and NS for PCR uh, to determine exposure to PCV. And of course, uh, collect uh, blood as well as serum uh, and for NCSF for uh, uh, the various tests. Uh, we can and should initiate uh, acyclovir uh, when, when pending lab tests are there or if there are signs of uh, neonatal. So if there is a suspicion, uh, there's no harm in starting uh, acyclovir for, for the baby. And if the mother is infected and the baby, but the infant is asymptomatic uh, with cultures and et cetera negative, then still 10, 10 days of uh, acyclovir can be uh, considered. Mm. Uh, how do we go about uh, a, a, a diagnosis? You can have a, a viral isolation using, uh, or you can have PCR detection of viral DNA. Now, what has happened is because of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, which is there, um, the number of uh, options or number of places that are doing PCR detection of uh, viral antigens has uh, increase considerably. So I think this will be a useful thing for all of us in, in, in the years to come. Uh, if if it, if there's an infant with a mucocutaneous uh, lesion when the SEM criteria, then as I mentioned, we can have the tissue scrap from the uh, vesicle uh, and uh, process for culture and PCR. Uh, most common uh, condition that we face in the NIC is when we don't know uh, our diagnosis and we suspect HSV encephalitis because of uh, EEG patterns that we have. Uh, then an elevated CSF protein level and a pleocytosis might give a, some indication. And you can, of course, do a PCR from that. Uh, Disseminary disease uh, commonly uh, would have uh, various organs involved. And uh, more often than not, you would have a history in the mother, uh, which is also uh, there. Uh, so treatment, again, uh, acyclovir uh, is, a, is a cornerstone of treatment. Uh, acyclovir, as we all know, in all, all viral illnesses, starting treatment early is much more useful. Hence, uh, waiting for confirmation of diagnosis may not be a very good idea if you're suspecting uh, herpes. Uh, in SCM, you can have 20 milligram per kg for 14 days, while for CNS, like most CNS infections, you would want to give it for uh, 20, 21 days. Uh, if there is ocular involvement uh, in the SEM category, then you can also use topical antiviral agents and a, a subsequent ophthalmic evaluation can be done. Uh, you can continue with oral suppressive uh, therapy uh, for at uh, doses of 300 mg per meter square for six months. Uh, and it has been seen to have effects on developmental outcome. Uh, Madam. Yes, let us come to the fifth and the last uh, infection of the series, that is varicella. Why we chose this, maybe amongst the public, still, there is a thought that chickenpox in pregnancy, there has to be a medical termination of pregnancy. And many obstetricians do that also. Even if a mother gets, a, uh, gets chickenpox in the first trimester, it's never an indication for medical termination of pregnancy. So also, none of the infections, what we discussed today, is an indication for MTP. So let us just go through a few FAQs. A mother comes and asks, I'm exposed to chicken pox. What can I do? The first question what we can ask is whether she ever had chicken pox. If she ever had a varicella in the past, she would have had long-term immunity. So there's nothing to worry. If she's not exposed to chicken pox and if it's the first time, like if it's a serious exposure, that is more than 15 minutes exposure, what we can recommend is IV, IG, immunoglobulin, anti Varicella immunoglobulin is available, but the thing is, the availability is a question in many places of the country, as well as the cost. It's very costly, but abroad, they are going for uh, varicella immunoglobulin, and it has got its efficacy if given within 72 hours. So what, in the low resource settings, what we can say is, if at all she develops a lesion, let her be on the lookout for the lesion and report immediately so that we can start the treatment. 
Another question would be, I can, can I get vaccinated in pregnancy? No, it's a live viral vaccine. Chickenpox vaccine is contraindicated during pregnancy. And what happens? What is a real problem for the baby? In the first and the second trimester, that is up to 28 weeks, if the mother is getting infected with varicella, the risk of congenital varicella syndrome is only 1%. Some literature says as high as 2%, but generally it is around 1%, even up to 28 weeks. There's no difference between first trimester, second trimester. The risk is around 1%. And this congenital varicella syndrome is mainly psychiatrical lesions of the limbs, microcephaly, oreoretinitis, IUGR, if at all it is affected. But generally, we can reassure the mother and the family that the risk of affection to the baby is very less. And 28 to 36 weeks, it is a rather safe period. Maybe the best time to have chickenpox in pregnancy, maybe 28 to 36 weeks. The only problem, problems to the mother, we have to be on the lookout is development of pneumonia and encephalitis. So we just tell them to watch out for headache, unseasoned vomiting, or cough, persistent cough, then they have to come to the hospital and get admitted or else they can be at home. And perinatal varicella, the neonatal varicella is mainly for the newborns whose mother developed chicken pox from five days before to two days after delivery because they would not have had got antibodies from the mother. A few more FAQs would be acyclovir, whether it's safe in pregnancy, we are, you have already seen that it is safe in pregnancy, the dose is higher, 800 milligram orally five times a day for five days. Indications for admission already we said, mainly it's encephalitis, pneumonia, sometimes hepatitis, very rarely hepatitis. Can she breastfeed? If there are no lesions on the breast, she can breastfeed. And with all other precautions, with droplet precautions, she can breastfeed, infection control practices. In case of herpes zoster, so what if the mother develops a herpes zoster? If a mother develops herpes zoster, nothing will happen to the baby. The only problem with herpes zoster is if it is a peripartum herpes zoster or after delivery, the mother develops herpes zoster, the baby can have chicken pox just like any other adult. Baby can have chicken pox from the mother. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll just answer two questions people have asked. Uh, one is uh, Dr. Suraj asked whether if the HIV positive mother has no milk or no access to PHDM on day one, uh, can we give formula? So the answer is any mixed feeding is an invitation for the HIV virus to cross uh, into the baby. So we should not be doing it. And uh, baby mother not having milk is actually a more a uh, uh, way of looking at by the uh, how your unit is getting managed. Uh, so it indicates that uh, we are not being uh, like, uh, we are not very supportive to the mother. So I think the way of looking at it is uh, if all our mothers are getting baby's milk right from day one, or uh, then it is unlikely that a mother who is HIV positive who has come to you uh, will not get uh, mother's milk, baby will not get mother's milk on day one. So it's more a way of how uh, uh, we are practicing in, a, in, in, our, uh, in our baby. So can I think, should I be going back? Can I go back? Then there's a question on... Uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccination. I'll, I think we'll take it later. Okay. So uh, we this uh, was mentioned five days before and two days after delivery uh, where uh, baby can get infected. And we talked about congenital varicella syndrome, which is not really very, uh, uh, not, not you, you won't get it much. Uh, you can get between eight to 28 weeks of gestation, as Madam mentioned. And you can have uh, most commonly psychiatric scars, which are, uh, which, which are seen. And uh, th that, that is something which we need to be uh, looking at. So uh, coming to mainly uh, if the baby gets, uh, what do you say? Can I have the previous slide? If the baby, if the, new, if the neonate gets, uh, yeah. Uh, so cicatrice cell scars, limb hypoplasia, et cetera, are more common. Uh, the more common uh, way in where we get worried or we are, uh, what do you say, we are called upon to treat is when we get neonatal varicella. When the baby is born, uh, mother has got infected and the ba baby usually has a rash actually just after delivery. And when the baby is born, you see uh, vesicular rashes and you are wondering what to do. That's one of the most commonest uh, things that happen. And it, that rash may show up in the next uh, week or so. And here, here is again where uh, you can use... Uh, uh, Go to next, yeah, just a minute. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, diagnosis, uh, actually more, many of the times you really don't uh, require, uh, of course, to do a lab diagnosis, it might be useful to a culture and uh, of course do a DNA PCR, but uh, if you have seen chicken box quite a bit and if you know if the dermatologist kind of uh, diagnoses it, uh, you really don't require much of a uh, di diagnosis from the, uh, like, you don't require a lab investigation to tell you that this is chicken box. So it's just for ensuring that uh, you have it on, on paper. So uh, what we would need to do is uh, once the diagnosis is done, uh, we have uh, we can start a cyclopyr 60 mg per kg per day uh, for about uh, for 10 days. Uh, giving giving it uh, with uh, IV is more useful. And uh, you can, of course, as mentioned, we can give varicella zoster immunoglobulin. Again, difficult to obtain and uh, to give uh, and, and expensive. So uh, if it is not available, as Madam mentioned, you can give IVIG at 400 uh, milligram per kg uh, because that would also contain uh, NTBs, ZB antibodies. Now, a point to mention uh, as far as uh, chicken box is concerned and also for hepatitis B, uh, since both these vaccines are available, and if all children get vaccinated, uh, we are unlikely to see this in pregnant mothers. We cannot give the vaccine in pregnancy. So ensuring that at least all adolescents are uh, given uh, vaccination with chickenpox is important. Uh, since more and more pediatricians are using, and IAP recommends that everyone gets chickenpox uh, vaccine, uh, there will be a certain section of individuals or mothers who would not have got the chickenpox vaccine. And because many people are getting the vaccine, the epidemiology of chicken box would have shifted from getting it in childhood. Generally, it used to be around like uh, 10 to 15 years of age when people used to get chicken box or maybe earlier. Uh, that has got shifted to adult life and getting it during pregnancy uh, will, will cause a problem. So we are more likely to see uh, those mothers who have not got chicken box vaccine uh, getting infected with chicken box. So that is something we should be uh, careful about. Okay. Uh, so, uh, if the varicella has occurred 21 days before uh, before 20 before 21 days of delivery, and uh, there was resolution of infectious stage before hospitalization, uh, then maternal isolation is not required. But um, neonates should be isolated from other neonates. So, uh, all the babies that we get with chickenpox, we usually keep them in a separate area so that they don't come in contact with the uh, other babies. And uh, if the mother has activities on uh, admission, then isolated baby from others until the lesions are crusted and dried. So that is the most yeah. important part uh, when uh, transmission is supposed to not happen from mother to baby. Administer again VZIG to the newborn uh, if rash or symptoms are there. So next. Uh, yes, vaccination. Me, sir. Yeah. Yes, yes, me, sir. yeah, I think we are running late. Yeah, these uh, are the last slides. Okay. These are, these are, these okay. are the last okay. slides. Okay. okay, so varicella exposure in nursery is to be prevented. So again, separate. Uh, again, I think we have discussed this earlier and we can just go to the summary slide. So I'll discuss it in brief. Uh, we really don't have much uh, idea about how to go about managing severe COVID in newborn. Uh, all the medications that I use in adults uh, are not really approved for, uh, approved for management uh, in, in neonates. Uh, so while we have reports of many people saying that they manage neonatal COVID, uh, the management is more personal and based on extrapolation of adult data. And so um, why I'm mentioning is this because making a diagnosis of neonatal COVID or MISC, uh, MISN needs to be more circumspect. We should be more uh, careful in making the diagnosis and not rush to make the diagnosis. There's a general uh, impression among uh, us, most of us that COVID in newborn is being overdiagnosed or MIC in newborn is being overdiagnosed rather than being uh, underdiagnosed. So that, that is one thing I would like to stress. Uh, hepatitis B and uh, varicella, I think as long as mothers get the vaccines, we should be able to eliminate or we should not be facing it in, in, in the long term. Uh, HIV I mentioned and of course herpes, uh, if diagnosed well or because it's not going, it's not going to be possible to eliminate herpes uh, very soon and it will be there. Uh, so getting a good history uh, and uh, is would be helpful and getting uh, spotting the diagnosis early will be helpful because uh, treatment options are avail available and that that does help in, in management. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Anil Chaudhary who has helped in preparation of slides and of course uh, Dr. Betsy Thomas for 
putting the slides together and so we were able to have some kind of an interactive uh, presentation so instead of doing one after other yeah so we can discuss covid 19 vaccination for pregnant mother maybe dr betsy can answer the question Yes, yes. Okay. COVID-19, as of now, uh, the government of India has not permitted, like, uh, but so many academic bodies like IMA, FOXI, Kerala Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, so many academic bodies have written to the government to permit COVID-19 vaccination pregnancy. They have permitted in lactation. So I, I, we hope that uh, we'll soon start giving COVID-19 vaccination in pregnancy. If at all it comes, the uh, type of vaccination again might be a query. As of now, Covaxin can be given both in pregnancy and lactation, but Covishield only for lactation. Like that, there may be some difference by the time it comes because a little worry about thrombotic effects. So Thank you I, so much. I, it was I, a I just wanted to share something. So as far as the vaccines that are available, because as we understand from July or August onwards, we'll have a lot of the mRNA vaccines coming from uh, the West. Uh, they might be available. Uh, so the mRNA vaccines, there are no studies per se. Uh, like uh, RCD studies which are there but uh, because a lot of healthcare workers who were pregnant took the vaccine and they delivered and their babies did not have any problem so it is being recommended for all pregnant mothers Covaxin is a killed vaccine as you mentioned and so it can be can be given coming to covid shield now there is there are studies so covid shield is basically adenoviral uh, vaccine with a vector in which MR, uh, mrna is instilled and that is used kind of for vaccination uh, the Ebola vaccine uh, that was trialed, uh, so the COVID shield vaccine or the um, AstraZeneca vaccine which is there is modeled on the Ebola vaccine. Ebola vaccine got approval in for, for testing in pregnant mothers in, in Africa. So pregnant mother, uh, pregnant mothers with Ebola, uh, pregnant mothers are getting the Ebola vaccine in, in Africa currently under a randomized control trial which actually means uh, that it is kind of safe in, in pregnant mothers. So if you can extrapolate that data to uh, using COVID shield in pregnant mothers, uh, there is no official data, but theoretically it should be safer to even give COVID shield in, in pregnant mothers. Uh, so it's uh, if somebody, if a pregnant mother is willing to take COVID shield or wants to take, uh, that should not be a problem, but I don't think we can recommend it. So it's a little bit different. Different words. We need to be using words carefully when talking about uh, vaccines in uh, pregnant women. Coming to co-vaccine, co co it's a killed vaccine. It's supposed to be not as good as mRNA vaccine. So we we and we don't have trial uh, phase three data of co-vaccine available. So I think once we get that, we should be more. Uh, we would know more. Yeah. Thank you. I think I'll stop here. So much. Thanks. Thank you, both speakers. You yeah, have covered the topic very well. Uh, I think questions, I think there is no time. Dr. Narayanan? The yeah, questions have been already answered during yeah. the talk. Yeah, I, I to thank the, both the speakers for the excellent session, especially with the very clear messages, like there is no uh, indication for termination during the first trimester, and there is no contraindication for breastfeeding in these infections. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank, Next. you. thank you, madam. Uh, Next session, very important and interesting panel discussion, medical, legal, and ethical issues in perinatology. I invite Dr. Prashant Pavitran, past IAP president, Vadagara, uh, to chair the session. Can you hear me, Naushit? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, sir. Uh, respected, uh, respected dignitaries, uh, Dear pediatricians, doctors, seniors, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, the next talk is on uh, uh, medical legal and ethical issues in pediatrics. Um, define what is can be described as a situation in which the patient's right and patient's and professional obligations conflict. In perinatology, that is maternal and fetal medicine, includes withdrawal of life support situation and then in vitro fertilization and uh, disposable of fertilized ova and treatment of genetic disorders and substance abuse, surrogacy, treatment of prematurity, then also the MTP Act, that is 1972, and abortion is very significant in 
technology and uh, refuse of cesarean section is another scenario. We have to ethically, morally, and legally balance to have a good outcome in, your, in perinatology. Uh, death is a crisis which needs to be tackled artfully, intelligently, and scientifically by clinicians. To enlighten us on this topic, a panel discussion on medical, legal, and ethical issues in perinatology. Uh, we have a team, a good team of uh, gynecologists and pediatricians and uh, Dr. V.C. Manoj uh, from Jubilee Mission Hospital, Trishur, who is uh, also the NNFSU member, will be moderating the section, session. Over to Dr. Manoj V.C. Thank you, Chair. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, respected seniors and my dear friends, uh, we have had an excellent discourse today and the last session we are going to deal with a practical problem that most of us face when we uh, a, a, on a day-to-day -day basis. These are the problems in ethics as well as uh, the medical legal issues. Both these do uh, trouble us at some time or the other. So we, uh, we will try to look at these problems uh, systematically within the uh, shortage of time. So we have, um, and, uh, and uh, probably the time will be less now. So one hour is the time we will try to finish within that time or we'll try to cut short depending on the interest. So uh, we have an array of four experts to uh, obstruct uh, 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 doyens from Kerala, Professor uh, Dr. Ambujam. Uh, who, who is the chairperson of Maternal and Fetal Medicine Committee of KFOG and the past president of KFOG. And uh, Professor Ajit, he is the present president of KFOG. Are you both there? Yes, we are here. Thank you so much. Now we also have to look at the other side, neonatal, the other side of the court. We have uh, two uh, uh, leading neonatologists for the country. Uh, Dr. Sudendra Singh Bist from Delhi, who is also the treasurer of uh, uh, NNF Kerala, uh, sorry, NNF India, and uh, uh, Dr. Amit Ubhatyaya, another senior uh, consultant neontologist. Uh, he is the uh, director of Nutama Hospitals, Meerat. So, uh, without wasting much time, we will just look at the scenarios. So, uh, we will try to look at the issues in periviable birth and birth asphyxia primarily and then other issues depending on the time uh, constraints. So, periviable birth is a major problem that we all face, both ethically as well as legally, we, there are issues actually. Definition ACOG says, ACOG Working Committee uh, 2017 says from 20th week to 25 weeks, uh, probably the viable fetus depends from region to region, but uh, whenever the uh, fetus is viable and ready to come out, that is the time. So this period is a gray zone for most of us. And uh, whenever you say periviable fetus or periviable ne uh, neonate, the scenario that comes to our mind is a very famous and uh, the most quoted uh, periviable neonate, Sidney Miller, who was born at 23 weeks gestation age at 615 grams, uh, in Texas, USA, in the pre-historic uh, neonatology era, I would say, 1990. It, I mean, it is not prehistoric, but probably in the um, uh, much earlier days of uh, advancements in neonatology. Mother came with preterm labor uh, and pa parents did not want the baby. They opted for no restoration, but at that time, the hospitals in Texas had the policy that the baby had to be resuscitated if birth weight was more than 500 grams. And uh, uh, the, uh, Miller was uh, 615 grams. So he was resuscitated. He, he, he was born depressed, had a scores of three at uh, one minute and six at five minutes. And uh, subsequently, were taken to an ACU. In the subsequent course, he had a massive IVH. And at six years, he landed up with spastic quadriplegia, blind seizures, and required round the clock care. Now, this is a story that is being quoted in various scenarios. The parents obviously sued the hospital and then I'm not coming to the war, uh, the uh, turn of events in the uh, illegal aspects. So since then the term, uh, the wrongful birth was born, uh, which, which actually denotes a scenario where uh, and, uh, 
negligent claims are made for compensation against the doctor and hospitals where it's argued on behalf of parents bringing the claim that appropriate treatment uh, with the appropriate treatment only their child should not have been born it's wrongly born and so the key word actually is uh, up, the up, appropriate treatment now with this uh, background of a wrongful birth concept now <laughs> let's uh, discuss a case is a true case a 26 year old woman woman underwent infertility treatment for for uh, four years and then i was admitted in the hospital at 24 weeks gestation with contraction fever and ruptured membranes 24 weeks uh, uh, and so now we need to find out what is the appropriate treatment so let's see how we uh, let's ask the experts how we move around actually Dr. Ambujam, uh, Madam, can you tell us how are you going to counsel the parents and what uh, what will be the role of parents in this conversation? Very happy to be part of this wonderful uh, conference. I was there right from the beginning, but not very happy about the clinical scenario uh, because uh, the membranes have ruptured at the very viable gestational age, and rupture of membranes is a very crucial moment. especially if it occurs so early we are actually worried about two things one is infection and the other is separation of placenta but i find that the patient has already developed fever and uterine contractions and that means she sepsis has set in in this scenario actually there is no place to continue the pregnancy any further so i would go for immediately sending for the investigations like the counts the inflammatory markers the high vaginal swab and start her on broad spectrum antibiotics and of course counsel the parents which who will be very anxious because they have got this child after four years and so counseling means delivery at this point of time is not very good for the baby in fact it is uh, very, uh, the uh, the chances of survival as very very remote uh, pre viable fetus so actually i would go for termination of pregnancy i would like to accelerate labor i would go for a vaginal examination and take measures uh, to accelerate labor so uh, this has to be done because if she lands up in uh, sepsis she can go for severe sepsis septicemia and in our state sepsis severe sepsis is third in causing maternal mortality so i would uh, not allow the pregnancy to continue any further that But is madam this is, a, this is a uh, the, uh, pregnancy after infertility treatment and the yes. parents are yes but for us the mother is uh, more important so for us actually in the absence of fever of course we would have given a trial in the absence of fever but when fever has set in we always think that there is an element of sepsis so the even if the parents are insisting on they we have, they want to go ahead and uh, continue the pregnancy uh would you uh, do is termination at this stage but we have to save the mother now yes the, for us actually the mother is very important and only if she is alive she can have a next pregnancy so the second part of the what role would the parents have in the treatment option so, so the like, parents have to be counseled that there is risk for the mother and that risk could be very severe if she goes for a severe sepsis actually it is very difficult to revert so Uh, 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 I am afraid. Uh, uh, as obstetricians, I hope Ajit also will agree with me in that situation. I have a opinion which is different, sir. Uh, okay, now we will come to that. So now, uh, okay, please, Amit, go ahead. E- even I would say to... that this pregnancy will, any case, terminate very soon. There yes. is already contractions which are there. Yes, ruptured. yes. Membranes have ruptured. So uh, it's not a question whether we should continue pregnancy or not. it's the question that we have to talk about resuscitation because this baby the question should be should we give steroid or not and the question should be should we no no uh, no let us not come to steroid straight away yeah. the, the, the so, thing is now you the mother the parents have been sent to you for uh, antenatal counseling so would you <laughs> offer an ac care or just allow palliative care as madam was suggesting and then any I criteria you would use overall, to determine yeah i would look at the overall scenario this is a family who has been trying ivf for last 4 years so they are having trouble having a baby um so uh, looking at this 24 weeks i would tell them chances are very slim chances are that he could having he could be having corium mother could be having corium nitis baby could be born septic but i would 
put the ball in their court i would say that if you want to take a chance because you have been trying for this for years together so if the baby is born well that means that he cries well doesn't require too much resuscitation then we can continue uh, with the um, uh, uh, to transfer trans admit the baby in nicu and then see how the baby goes and okay, uh, fine. i got I a good point good point amit so uh, like basically what we understand now is there is a difference of opinion because of the maternal interest and fetal interest do collide and this is exactly why the, this case was brought out actually now uh, and we will uh, go on to some questions which are raised by this scenario i would uh, request dr ajit from uh, obstetric side and dr surender to answer the same question so the question is this now this is a philosophical question should the best interest of the premature child supersede that of the parents the, because the, uh, the, the obstetrician would want to terminate at this point uh, a termination i don't think uh, you would also uh, um uh, disagree because uh, uh, because of the sepsis element but anything else uh, surendra you want to add so let's uh, first ask dr ajit so is resuscitation at 23 or 24 25 weeks in the child syndrome this is a open question we are not talking about corem nitis here and is it in the interest of the society to resuscitate very preterm babies against the parents wishes so it is the other way around thank you dr binu manoj uh, very very difficult question actually to take a decision but again as uh, dr amit mentioned uh, i would i would like to involve the parents also here knowing that a baby born at this period has the full right but uh, the parents has to care the baby so we uh, we have to respect the uh, interest of the parents even though there is a right for the child so here i think uh, we have to um, best interest is uh, we have to consider the wishes of the parents here but if she is uh, 20, 25 or 26 weeks i think we have to consider active resuscitation no, we are talking uh, only about the peri viable period so we are not talking uh, about 26 weeks yeah, we have to this, like, yeah, this period is less than that uh, anyway the best interest uh, we have to consider the interest of the parents maybe uh, yes surender yeah so here comes the philosophical answer thank you first uh, for rnf kerala for uh, making me this part and uh, it's so lovely to listen to all the doyens who have spoken so far uh, uh, the question is who makes a decision how does it make a decision how is the conclusion to where is the information they have got it who gave them the information you are giving them information we are giving them information or they have got it from somewhere they are, they, are, they have got it from where, what is the source of information which Heli is helping the parents make a conscious conscious decision. So, whether a process of making a shared decision was there, was there some um, there's a there are ways to do that. Whether some tool was there, whether they use some calculators. We'll come to that. We'll come to that. We'll come to the. So it is it is about uh, who, whose interests are there. So in in some centers in some centers in. Um, California, they did, and they did a survey, and they found it. So, in the centers where the doctors were very pro of actually taking, uh, continuing with the pregnancies, could counsel it in a particular way. Whereas in some centers where the, when you were asking questions to doctors, what is their feeling about uh, having a baby taken out at 23 weeks or 24 weeks? So they had a different outcome over there. So, uh, what is the best interest of the very pre premature baby in different level of centers? Tejo was very happy with 26 weeker and 27 weeker with 80% survival, but that may not be the case in all the hospitals in India. So, okay, in, fine. So we got the point. It is probably you know the uh, there are three factors here: the parental wishes, the uh, the uh, the primary in, uh, interest of the mother, the primary interest of the baby. All these are the uh, three different things, and then we need to strike a balance of shared decision may be required. Let me now complicate it a little little further. This mother did not deliver. Uh, and uh, or rather he had pre pre had presented at 24 weeks and opted for no resuscitation and did not deliver and then delivered at 26 weeks now 
you have taken a, a previous resuscitation consent no resuscitation consent will it hold at this point do we revisit the resuscitation option, uh, options and uh, if there is no time to override the consent do, uh, can, can we do what is in the best interest of the baby slightly a twisted question uh, uh, dr ambujam and dr amit please feel free yeah definitely i think we should revisit the resuscitation options because the baby has gone two weeks more so a, a single day inside the intrauterine uh, environment is going to make lot of difference so uh, we need to uh, take a consent again we have to inform them that the baby has gone two weeks more so we'll get some amount of and i hope that even at 24 weeks we still give uh, corticosteroids maybe if there is no infection and uh, with the benefit of steroids and uh, we should take a consent again and uh, can say that the baby is uh, a little bit better and we what, should what if you don't have the second part of the question is what if you don't have time to take a, a revisit the consent and baby is born now what do you do do you do what is in the best in the interest of the baby or do we stick to the consent no i think we should do it in the best interest of the baby and uh, uh, we should and face medical best. legal uh, litigation uh, no later? then no but no. we can counsel the parents yeah. because uh, they have got this child after four years of infertility treatment and when we have no time uh we actually we should get some time if it should said if we are busy with the delivery or whatever it is we should have somebody speaking to them that the, she is going to deliver and uh, maybe the chances are better now so what about your option we have to get the uh, consent and i think uh, we should get some time we should get it so uh, thank you thank you thank you ma'am okay. so now so four things there. can happen uh, if we are going to uh, decide to go ahead Uh, or rather when you are going to counsel we discuss counseling now when you are going to counsel four things can happen either parents don't agree to resuscitate in perivariable bed so the baby will die or parents offer treatment but the baby dies after few hours or survives with disability or without disability so there are four options now so now how do we get the best option out of it so actually we uh, for when you look at the data we have uh, sufficient data Uh, in the nichd cohort or in the uh, periviable uh, worldwide survival data and so four factors we have gestational age gender birth weight single is a singleton or multiple uh, 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 pregnancy and antenatal steroid coverage now based on this now we have a new tool that is what dr surendra was mentioning the uh, calculator nichd neonatal research network calculator so how useful is this in calcu- uh, predicting the outcome dr surender again uh, and oh, even uh, would is it relevant to our country and the last second the last part of the question is it may if, even if you say it is relevant since you don't have any other option would it help for an individual baby uh, uh, thanks uh, manoj but uh, this uh, calculator has the uh, five parameters which usually are gestation age birth birth uh, birth weight uh, rupture uh, yeah singleton pregnancy and receiving antenatal steroids and uh, what is the sex so these are the uh, five parameters and uh, this is telling you some calculation some kind of survival but it is not applicable to our scenario certainly uh, this is certainly don't have fetal growth retardation to that extent though they have mentioned weight over there and uh, uh, this has Since not the time is low i would request all the experts to give clear messages to the group Yeah. Like, so uh, this this doesn't apply whole to to uh, uh, our country certainly uh, because our survival percentages are not there and uh, in fact we are waiting for good centers we don't have a network like a government oxford network or an icc network who has given us uh, uh, data and survival data so we cannot just predict anything some individual uh, hospitals some isolated hospital are just claiming that they are surviving they they have the survival this much so i don't know uh, but this doesn't hold uh, true to our centers and how does it ha- help a baby uh, certainly there are many other reasons uh, like chorionitis is one reason uh, and and antenatal ultrasound showing some uh, ventricular dilatation and other things ivh uh, fetal uh, inter, uh, fetal bleeds in somewhere would have a different uh, uh, connotations okay fine so now uh, we uh, saw that the calculator may not be appropriate but we don't have any other tool to 
when you counsel to tell them this is a uh, this is the outcome but then again with lot of riders so we it's a very dif difficult scenario now uh, we are proceeding with we are decided to uh, proceed with the uh, delivery when you prepare the so golden rule we were discussing in the uh, right from the first stop preterm delivery the gold standard is antenatal steroids and now the antenatal max sulfur has also come for neuroprotection what is the uh, the question is to dr ajit what is the evidence of use of these in the peri viable period in 24 weeks the american college and the royal college actually recommends steroid and magnesium sulfate yes eh is definitely it has a place fine uh, what about maxelf maxelf definitely it has a role from we don't have data so it is actually a gray area all these are gray areas steroids yeah. also uh, the recent rcg guideline and uh, american college guideline recommends from 24 weeks exactly that is why it is from 24 in the... to 30 weeks there is no doubt yes because that is why it's even though we don't have the, the evidence is as weak as what is there but the recommendation is very very strong that is what you see in steroids in these cases so now this baby uh, now the uh, in the delivery room uh, suppose this baby is born depressed what are you how are you going to would you resuscitate this baby this baby so, 24 weeks what you did i would go ahead and uh, give the initial steps of resuscitation and also do positive pressure ventilation to see if uh, you know if the baby comes over just with ppv but if the baby has no heart as well at birth or uh, the or uh, severe bradycardia then probably i would i would be taking family in with me and uh, do as the family also has consented so if there is just simple apnea is there and i give resuscitation some suction and positive pressure ventilation the heart rate is good then i think my management would be the same as discussed in the consent we have already discussed all scenarios in the consent i would presume that suppose uh, you, you have a uh, antenatal data that saying baby is 24 weeks but baby is active weighing 650 g uh, and uh, when you did your nb new bellard scoring system uh, on the spot probably not the right way can we uh, and you found it soft 26 weeks so now can uh, can you assume that baby is of greater gestational age and proceed with active care i yes because uh, there can in gestation assessment there can be a margin of error for 2 weeks plus minus 2 weeks can be there so uh, i would go ahead resuscitate give a chance so you would anyway then... resuscitate whether baby is depressed or not you would resuscitate isn't yes. it Yes. now what about uh, how far will you go uh, after uh, we were hearing about nrp after you initial steps you uh, uh, if at all you are state that means you are going to give post pressure ventilation and yeah. ventilate the lung but if the heart is further? there consistently then i would no. uh, go ahead and uh, intubate and uh, so to dr surender would you <laughs> give chest compressions and epinephrine for resuscitation there is why the question is because there is a growing consensus or rather good growing evidence that interventions like this increase the chance of neurodevelopmental uh, circulate because of the ivh and things like that but the, still the recommendation ilco recommendation and bapam uh, recommendation is to resuscitate in these babies less than so, 20 again um, um, manoj so the recommendations once uh, you have assessed the risk of a baby uh, and discussed it with the family uh, and they are ready for it and your baby is around uh, 24 weeks uh, and more something like that and this is a baby which according to uh, bapm british association of parental medicine falls into a moderate risk Uh, in a case with because the baby had if you could think of some unfavorable risk factors like chorionitis then it comes into some uh, risk factors i agree so uh, so this baby is started on resuscitation uh, first so you would go all the way out you would you just come with epinephrine because uh, if once started the resuscitation then uh, fine, fine. The, you there's no way to stop it in between okay so we'll end the periviable period discussion so probably the 10 commandments are there is a gray zone first right from the first question we saw that there is a conflict between maternal interest and neonatal interest and so there is a gray zone uh, and the decisions are not black and white so do not place too much emphasis on gestational age dying is then some of the dictums that have been noted 
uh, are dying is generally not in the infant's best interest. Impairment does not necessarily equal poor quality of life. Just because the train has left the station doesn't mean you can't get off, which means that even if you start, you can stop. And we need to respect powerful emotions uh, and be aware of self-fulfilling prophecies. Time lag likely skews out all data and statistics can be very confusing sometimes. Like then we discuss the calculator and never abandon parents. So parents wish us has a big role in this. Actually, now we finances, go on to... That will come in the 10 commandments. I think which uh, one? finances. So in a private yeah. scenario, finance also should come in one of the commandments that uh, spending five, six lakhs and losing uh, is... That also the parental the uh, decisions, yeah, we have to respect the parental decisions, whatever they take. Any disagree, uh, disagree any uh, comments regarding this from all the pa panelists? I, I think uh, it's very important to uh, assess the gestational age. The gestational age becomes crucial when you get such a scenario. So exact uh, gestational age should be known by a first trimester ultrasonography. Uh, so that is very important, I feel. Thank you. Dr. Ajit, anything? Nothing. Okay, fine. So let's go on to the, uh, to, uh, just a few words, because now uh, this is again a quarter story. Every time ethics has been discussed, a 31-year-old uh, mother presented in UK at 30, uh, 23 weeks, counseling the 10% the, uh, of uh, chance of survival and 50% chance of disability was told to them. Where if the gestation goes up, the chance will increase, but the disability was 50%. She could adopt uh, about until 24 weeks. Uh, so she decided to terminate the pre pregnancy. Now, uh, in India, what is the scenario, madam? Uh, actually, there was a recent amendment of the MPP Act. And now it is possible to do the termination up to 24 weeks with the uh, consent of two registered medical practitioners. So what are the so That has been already published in the Gazette. Okay, what are the additional right uh, apart, apart actually, from what you're doing? Uh, yeah. Actually, oh. it is it was meant mainly for victims of rape and also for women for who had failure of uh, contraception, and that includes even unmarried women, and also in any situation where uh, the pregnancy is going to affect the mental health of the woman, and also in malformations, uh, the period of gestation could be even still higher provided the state forms, a, uh, the institution forms a medical board uh, comprising of an obstetrician and neonatologist and a sonologist to decide upon the uh, uh, seriousness of the anomaly and pregnancy can still be terminated a little bit higher uh, gestational age also. But the oh. ethical issue is actually the again the period of viability. If the baby is born and then the, uh, the dilemma of whether the baby should be resuscitated or not. Uh, so that is the dilemma regarding this MTP amendment. So it is not a blanket you can do, but with all these conditions only you can do after 20 yes. weeks. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, another area which we will just touch upon because of lack of time, just one question. Uh, so many times when you uh, diagnose a lethal, Bijoy was talking beautifully about various uh, uh, inter, uh, various parameters. Now, uh, when you diagnose a lethal malformation in the prenatal period, how are you going to? I would you uh, omit the term lethal mal malformation. Those are being de uh, described these days. How are you going to manage uh, these in your antenatal practice, Doctor Ajit? Uh, this question, uh, actually, this uh, the new amendment to the MTP rule is up to twenty four weeks is for other cases. If it is a needle anomaly or if it is a severe malformation, I think the, the gestational age is not a limit. So we can do it provided the Institutional Medical Board agrees. Uh, but again, the Institutional Medical Board, uh, how is the constitution of the Institutional Medical Board? Uh, all these things has to be defined. And even though it is published in the Gazette, uh, only after all these things are uh, defined properly, it will come into room. So till now, the old MTP rule up to 20 weeks is uh, only acceptable to us, uh, not acceptable, it is only valid. Uh, then again, uh, the government has to make to rule for all these things, then only it will come. 
then after that even uh, even after three four weeks if it is a severe abnormality we can terminate the pregnancy is there a gray area uh, yeah. actually uh, really actually our state government has already issued an order uh, to form a medical board to consider termination because many of these cases are going to the court and uh, once the decision comes then the there is a delay so uh, the our uh, government has already issued an order uh, to terminate the pregnancies after forming a medical board okay so i think uh, the issue is clear now we will go on to another common area of lawsuits and uh, a lot of misunderstanding the hi hi paradigm in the birth asphyxia now let's start with the case uh, uh, a 40 weeks pregnant mother is he, uh, not your case just walks into your delivery room uh, with history of loss of fetal movement for few hours we don't know anything about the previous antenatal details and how are you going to counsel the parents dr amija a very unfortunate situation after carrying for uh, uh, these 40 weeks Uh, the fetal loss actually i first i would like to do an ultrasonography uh, to find out whether it is a real intrauterine death and also another situation is uh, an acute situation where fetal heart disappears is abruptio placenta so i would try to rule out uh, uh, these uh, possibilities and once there is no uh, abruptio placenta that is premature separation of placenta i would like to give some time and uh, uh, so that i will talk to the parents and say that the fetal heart has already disappeared so now we have to think of uh, delivering and that to uh, most probably it always attempt for a vaginal delivery and uh, in, because i know that in many situations when the baby is dead the parents will come and ask the doctor why don't you do a cesarean section they don't know actually if that if there is a problem for the mother what will you do so please do a cesarean as far as possible but we should counsel them and tell that already the baby has uh, lost the life so we will aim for a vaginal delivery and before that we should give some time to accept and by that time we'll do her blood parameters the coagulation profile and once the patient has settled and accepted about that we'll uh, induce labor now uh, this mother was 40 weeks pregnant so when is the right time to deliver an uncomplicated pregnancy uh, because we now know, say that only the early term is the period when brain volume is not complete and term uh neonate means 39 and 40 weeks not before 39 weeks this is the standard uh, definition of a uh, difference between early term and term but is there any difference in the indian se- scenario do indian babies mature early and because most of these cases are at 40 weeks so is it that our definition is wrong or we should deliver before uh, 40 weeks or anything like that dr ajit this is a belief even though there is no much evidence we have there is a belief that that uh, the indian babies do mature and there is a concept that uh, we can consider induction of we can consider starting of induction of labor at 39 weeks i won't say deliver at 39 weeks after 39 weeks you can do a, a provisional examination stripping of the membrane and we can uh, take two or three days or uh, within 40 weeks plan delivery so that is the way usually we go but in western countries and all they don't recommend induction of labor before 40 weeks unless there is an obstetric indication so there is a how many weeks uh, would you uh, induce labor the, the, uh, very clear uh, this in 38 weeks 39 weeks 40 weeks never before that nine weeks after that nine weeks only we consider we start after induction 39 or 40 39 yeah. after that nine weeks we start induction process of india 41 No, no, no. Uh, let's uh, like let, let's hear from. It's not like that. We no, we no. start at thirty nine. I also agree. Take about four to five days. No, uh, let us. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, talk, uh, talk one at a time. <laughs> This is not a debate. Doctor, uh, yeah. okay, please carry on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, see, we, the, all this uh, professional bodies, all these things recommend delivery induction of labor only after forty weeks. Even there's some uh, US and all these things. They say uh, induction of labor only after forty one forty one weeks. but because of the indian babies mature there is a concept that is coming up so there is a place for considering induction of labor at, after 39 weeks uh, even the cesarean section rate the the meconium staining the everything is better if you deliver the baby after 39 weeks there is a concept that is coming up but that does not mean that if you start a induction uh, after 39 weeks within one or two days a patient should deliver so you can put a 4 days there then you can wait for two or three days then you can give prostaglandin so 
you can take four or five days after that nine weeks for completion of delivery. That is all. Okay. Any 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 other expert want to say anything? I would say elective CS thirty nine weeks plus. It should be done not before that. Thirty nine completed if, weeks. Yes. yes. And uh, but uh, induction of labor, you can just wait for forty plus. Yeah, that's great. I agree with Amit. Okay. Anyway, like uh, the point that uh, Dr. Ajit was making was uh, Indian babies might mature early and nobody want to land up with a stillbirth. There is not much of evidence. There is an emerging concern. Am I right? And yes. nothing yeah. is gained by waiting. And nothing is gained actually when okay. the baby is, is mature. And we have problems of fetal uh, placental insufficiency could be there. So we have to monitor such patients. So, ma'am, uh, I would like to ask, ma'am, ma'am, if induction leads to more cesarean uh, or just no, no. waiting. Uh, uh, leads to uh, more seizures and complications. That is another thing to be seen. No, to no, no, no. Actually, injections will not like lead to more seizures. Cesarean section rate would be less. So that's okay. That, uh, it was just my query as a common man. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> okay, fine. Let's let's go ahead. So now, uh, ba uh, finally, uh, ba baby was born severely depressed, revived after extensive resuscitation. Uh, you so said now, the baby uh, you, in uterine death. You said no, 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 no. Said no. Loss of fetal, loss fetal, of fetal, fetal, fetal movement. movement only. Okay, loss okay. of fetal oh. movements only. Okay, okay. So now <laughs> revived after extensive restoration. Now, Doctor Surender, how are you going to yeah. come? So parent? here comes uh, the, stick to uh, counseling. Okay. Yeah. So here comes the role of uh, counseling. So many times I've actually um, seen when uh, antenatally diagnosed, uh, parentally diagnosed as IUD. So. Uh, my residents are not resist resisting and the, the gynecologist is very happy that you need, you need not resist it. But we must resist it all babies irrespective of their, whether they were diagnosed IUD before or not. If it is a fresh stillbirth, people have to resist it for full 20 minutes. Now how are you going to counsel the parents? Counsel. Now I'm saying with the counseling part. Uh, since the baby was severely depressed, and the, their uh, resuscitation, post resuscitation care has to provide it to this uh, uh, ba uh, baby, and the parents have to be told about the the ongoing care which will be provided in NICU and the outcomes which can come. And depending on whether it, the baby turns out to be no HI, mild HI, moderate HI, or severe HI, and the uh, the kind of treatment option whether therapeutic hypothermia is given, not given, whether anotropes are required or not. So those kind of counseling would be required. But yes, family. Would would be required. Uh, there's no way to say that you have to. Your baby is going to die soon. So there are many. Since okay, the baby has right. revived no, after uh, resuscitation, again, there are many chances that baby will be okay. Almost 80, 90 percent that baby will be okay. What if the patient father is saying obstetrician negligence is there? I was showing. No, her no, no, we'll come to that. Uh, uh, Amit, please hold on. Please hold on. We'll come to the medical legal uh, the thing. So the uh, now uh, a specific question in such a case where the mother came with uh, man, loss of fetal movements and then immediately my, whatever means my baby was delivered. Now what is the role of examination of placenta? Something not not done sometimes. Before uh, answering that question, I would like to uh, oh. comment that actually we should use the term perinatal asphyxia rather than birth asphyxia. Because perfect, when we perfect, perfect. Uh, document as birth asphyxia, there is some blame on the obstetrician oh, yeah, sure. as to the uh, death of the baby if it happens. So uh, yes, definitely a placenta should be considered as the black box of pregnancy. So because it records all the events during pregnancy, labor, it is the organ which supplies nutrition, oxygen, everything. So definitely we examine the placenta macroscopically and look for uh, any hematomas, any uh, infarcts, calcification. Sometimes the size of the placenta is smaller when there is a growth restricted baby. And also in diabetes, the placenta could be boggy and looking plethoric. And uh, as Dr. Jyoti was telling, we do not usually send the placenta for a histology because ours being a referral institution, we get a lot of growth restricted babies. So sending the placenta for histology is not very practical, but uh, we can get uh, good uh, information like uh, fibrin uh, in the intervillous space and all that infarcts. Definitely the examination of the cord and placenta is important. Placentation has also got some role in uh, fetal well-being. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now, wh what are the any medical legal implications of, of uh, recording that you examine placenta and not examine placenta? 
we do we usually examine the placenta and uh, document it but uh, actually only conveys uh, the infarcts or calcification uh, any uh, abnormal uh, looking placenta that's all it may be the cause it may it can get some evidence regarding the cause uh, but uh, so far uh, uh, placenta has uh, and not created a problem for us in the medical okay. legal scenario okay fine so there is a difference between the theory and the practice or rather whatever we see in practice yes. isn't it madam okay fine now uh, amit you have decided to intubate and shift the baby to your nicu uh, and the baby has continuous seizures now you have i am going to give you two scenarios you have facility for therapeutic hypothermia will you cool this baby and second is you don't have facility for cooling and you decided not to offer cooling now how are you going to counsel the parents now and how are you going to bo document both the question is does the baby require cooling or not irrespective whether i have the facility or not correct uh, so i think given the scenario that uh, cooling is best beneficial only for moderate uh, asphyxia i would tell the family that this baby a uh, therapeutic uh, hypothermia is a condition uh, is a intervention for uh, asphyxiated babies but i would also like to know beforehand what is the cord blood abg on this patient and if we have facility for uh, aeg monitoring then i would attach the baby to aeg monitor because i have 6 hours to decide whether i have to start this intervention or not so i will use the first 1 to 2 hours in Uh, assessing the baby uh, in holistic manner so i'll have a abg with me i'll have inotropic support requirement uh, what is there for maintaining this baby and uh, if the baby requires how is the cardiac function of the baby and uh, how is the aeg recording of the baby so if these are all flat type aeg is there if the cord ph was 6.7 showing a base deficit of minus 30 my counseling would be different but if it was a very acute event and god ph is not too bad and uh, so then i basically would... you are trying to say that uh, you know if baby has moderate hie as defined by various criteria you yes. may consider cooling uh, yes. for a severe uh, uh, hie you would be cautious you would say that even for moderate hie the benefit is not 100% it's only uh, 60 to 70% so for severe hie you would not um and uh, offer it on a routine basis you can s offer it if they still insist am yes. i right yes yes, yes. okay now uh, the i'll take it to ne to next level and now there is some emerging data after the helix trial that cooling in resource limited set setting has to be cautious the effects are not as good even though this is still a deb debatable topic so would that affect your decision Of yeah i think the main reason why in uh, low middle income group uh, outcomes are worse because as such all out outcomes are worse off in lmic as compared to developed country it's no, not no, i'm not asking the, let's not go into cooling my question is will that affect your decision of cooling will you still the support this baby has moderate hypothermia and the, and the emerging evidence now say you have to be cautious so will you still cool or not yes i would cool because if i am treating him i better give him the best chance all right fine so now suppose the, the other scenario is you are working in a primary setup you don't have facility for cooling and transport from uh, mirat to uh, i know it's very near to delhi trichur. Road, but to trichur <laughs> trichur whatever you want to call it from a remote village to your nutama hospital is uh, more than 6 hours and you are in that remote place uh, uh, and uh, you then you, you you so you decide, what do you do you may you may not be able to cool in your center so how are you going to proceed how are you going to counsel the parents sir um, if my center has all other facility like if i am in such a remote center and i don't have facility for even blood pressure monitoring i i would definitely transfer him immediately because such a baby no there no you cannot even if you for transfer to for i am specifically it is for cooling and you know it won't reach a level 3 center in the next 6 hours so i would definitely begin the treatment with, with me and i can use say um, uh, cooling is not uh, for such a baby who is so sick cooling is not a panacea that uh, you know it will be uh, the, uh, we will be doing any harm to the baby if you don't cool so i would maintain his uh, hemodynamic status maintain his sugar and start treatment control his convulsions maintain blood pressure and uh, give rest of the therapy as uh, as you would give to a sick baby with asphyxia okay so now uh, uh, 
in such scenario there is likely to be lot of lawsuits happening actually birth asphyxia is one of the or rather perinatal asphyxia is one of the areas where maximum lawsuits keep happening so how do we prevent the unnecessary lawsuits dr ajit your comments we cannot completely prevent it because uh, the obstetricians are the mac uh, are getting the maximum uh, lawsuits for this thing and one request uh, as ambija madam mentioned is uh, don't use the terminology birth asphyxia use correct correct i am coming to that i i, I purposefully yeah. use the terminology there because that is the terminology people use we are coming to that fine so that is one of the things you would uh, like to do thing. Yeah. and again the documentation is the most important thing yeah. so what all things you have done in the annual period the ctg paper you have to preserve and all this monitoring eh, whatever thing you have done yeah, in the correct way then there won't be much problem and then you have to explain to the 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 relatives properly the parents properly and again that has to be documented properly and then we can reduce the lawsuits that's all i can say about that uh, what do you specifically document documentation is the antenatal management and the intrapartum management okay the, fine especially the ctg ultrasound report everything you have to document keep it now this uh, now this baby had a stomach cold baby is highly unstable uh, no brain activity following seizure but is very stable on ventilator or rather uh, not very stable but pulling on ventilator now when and will you and when will you withdraw support for this baby dr surender and what is the role of parents in this so withdrawal of support in indian scenario you are talking me Take yeah so i am talking is, about very much so about this so this is this so is not a hypothetical panel what is indian scenario so, so this is the most difficult things because most of the places don't have uh, ethical boards in their hospital because it requires uh, actually calling up a board which has a lay person chair person and lawyer uh, a, a social scientist uh, a theologist uh, a part of it and they get they are talking to family and then they it is being decided so most of the time having a board which then can help make a conscious decision of uh, withdrawal of support uh, is there but many a time we do ask them about non escalation of support whether it is still uh, means uh, not having the life sustaining interventions which you would do otherwise uh, is, is in that case but to say that we are actually disconnecting the ventilator is something uh, in india right now i think uh, medical legally it's still not possible for most of the centers uh, because uh, even for that mumbai nurse case also it took 30 years i don't know whether to for her to die what about babies uh, in uh, ventilators so in my hospital in government hospital um, they don't go out because uh, i know they are continuously seizing seizures are coming people dilated but they don't uh, give us permission for any time and we have not asked them they, they just don't take the baby away uh, whereas in private hospitals because of want of budget and things they they want they take the baby away so it is just not withdrawal of care it is just taking baby lama uh, in our scenarios and the parents role what is the role of parents parents actually. so parents role in here uh, yes the 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 decision making certainly should be given to them uh, the the infrastructure and the 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 process of actually having such a board needs to be created that pool needs to be there and the government and nnf has a role in that Uh, point point but we can certainly talk to the family we have documented that we have talked to the family and told them about the outcome and uh, we did some brain uh, we do those brain stem reflexes how good they are in a newborn is what we do and we we tell them we have then done, done those tests we have done an eeg and it is coming flat and all those things we can tell them but i don't know whether it is still makes a child uh, they can dis- disconnect it so how are you going to document this document yes the 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 we are document they are going to document the neurological status the pupil size the brain stem reflexes non response so those those tests we are going to document and we are uh, we are telling that we have told the uh, parents in our consent or your daily uh, those uh, information when we provide to them that has been those, those we signed together of oh, fine so i uh, just to uh, uh, give a brief about uh, the various perspective that we discussed of course this is the most common uh, allegation and the timing of injury in asphyxia is the one that is actually uh, going to be debated 
the plaintiff will try to prove that injury occurred in the intrapartum period whereas the defense uh, will argue that it occurred prenatally this is what happened this is why the terminology birth asphyxia should not be used even if you put it as perinatal asphyxia i'm not sure whether it will take away all the blame it can confuse a little bit that's all because the majority of the causes of these hypoxias are not in the in the intrapartum period probably investigations like mri if you do and you find deep brain injury new uh, and a deep uh, nuclear injury in the brain that may point more towards acute event and uh, and uh, periventricular lesion you may find uh, it may point more to, to a chronic problem that it's very difficult so that's why there is a need for a checklist that needs to be fulfilled in order to establish a re reasonable causal link between intrapartum asphyxial insult and subsequent long term this thing cooling is again another uh, there was it was a standardized practice for moderate hie but now some new evidence is coming so it, it again may sh shoot up to a debate and Uh, in all cases documentation of status of baby at birth uh, through neurology examination can be really helpful so uh, now uh, before i uh, uh, we, we conclude now i would request all the panelists to give short uh, take home messages for the audience anybody please go ahead dr mujam yes uh... Uh, as far as possible we need to follow uh, the recommendations and guidelines uh, so that uh, and document it properly so that we can avoid such uh, uh, medico legal issues following the, proper some... guidelines okay okay please go ahead please I go ahead say, dr ajit sir Okay, yeah, Dr. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Dr. Amit, uh, who are? Please, please, please. So I would say video recording of all conversation in which we were telling the patient is of vital importance. So otherwise, patient just say I was never told. क्या साइन करा दे वुड से कि हमें तो पता ही नहीं था किस चीज़ पे खाली पेपर पे साइन करा लिया था. So video record all what whatever you say. Most importantly. pre seizure counseling like in the second case is very important and video record that counseling as well there should be no discrepancy in two different people talking to that family that is the biggest cause of lawsuit so if obstetrician says one thing and the pediatrician says another thing so you would had it so counseling should also be done together and if we are doing it separately we should tell the other person what we have talked to the family if the patient has some concern about the obstetrician then we should inform the like I, patient may not say directly to ambujam madam but he may say to me ki madam uh, doc saab i had come to dr ambujam one day ago but she should not she did not say that my baby, uh, baby inside could be having some problem so was there some negligence there so i have to i should convey this concern of the father to the obstetrician so that she can allay in her way uh, this anxiety which this family has that is very important as well so communication with the family is important but with your colleagues of different specialty is also very important your aya your nurse should not be loose talkers they should not be saying anything stupid to the family so this is my main and everybody should be on board saying same word same language to the family okay dr surender and dr ajit uh, as a rnf member and uh, so we need to have somebody as already written we need to have a very clear policy on peri viability though it is still not our concern right now with the kind of uh, mortality uh, figures we have in our country uh, peri viability is uh, has not taken a kind a kind of a for first seat and uh, as part of nrp uh, trainer in, uh, national trainer i would like all fresh till birth to be resuscitated for 20 minutes so that at least one third of them can be saved and there is evidence for that dr ajit anti potter classes are very useful actually okay, to discuss all these issues so that is one the counseling and again if you uh, if you think that uh, the patient is going to deliver in the peri viable period involve the neonatologist even before the delivery that is another thing we can consider and again all even even in the time patients uh, perinatal period uh, actually the proper counseling sir sir, sir, sir we thought we are already informed 
the, the whole discussion today is we are already informed of a peri viable delivery being occurring so you have to inform yeah. us it, 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 so uh, the delivery before delivery itself uh, they can take a decision that is uh, the way okay so i think uh, Uh, everybody agrees that a joint decision making and parental counseling is very important and it's not a one time counseling that is probably what we realized we need to be a multi point counseling and unless we have our own local and regional uh, regional data what is going to happen this is what ambuja madam was tr- uh, trying to stress uh, probably if you look at uh, we have to rely on as at least the legal point we need to rely on the what is the published data so the uh, like you uh, uh, um the calculator which we said nrn calculator which probably may not be appropriate for us there are other and calculator as well there are other there are other calculator other there are other, I, mean, i just wanted to highlight well. one and which I, have I, some I just, which, are, which have some morbidities as well no i just i want to highlight none of these do the cater to your needs you need to have your own data your own uh, statistics and un- you need to accept and understand accept your limits have a local policy on periviable limits and uh, of course do no harm should be the abiding principle that we must have noticed there a lot of difference between the experts probably that is because there is no single right answer the con- the interest of the mother and the interest of the baby collide at some time so i i think we we'll, before we conclude do we have time for there are a lot of questions in the q and a box organizers do we discuss them or do we leave dr somshekar has a uh, reference given no there are i i know i i know i i just there are a lot of questions and some of them the idea is not to give uh, this thing there are a lot of quickly in 3 minutes it's 227 quickly in 3 minutes we'll conclude okay so now i will just ask uh, some specific question any any anybody can take please pay, uh, one person only should uh, talk so one of the questions asked by suraj sir now from uh, from now on after 24 weeks we still we call still birth and before that abortion i don't understand so uh, this actually is actually for abortion it's up to 20 weeks of pregnancy up to 20 weeks it is for, uh, twen- actually we take it okay. as abortion and we actually that- yeah the period of viability before it was 28 weeks now it is 26 weeks and the in between the area is actually it's a gray zone so uh, for documentation for entry in the register actually we take it as any fetus above 500 grams what is to be told in a court of law in periviable birth what ga- guidelines the real court? issue it's a real dilemma actually so this is a, this is something where all these points which are congru- i mean uh, the, the parental counseling documentation joint decision making are very very important and multi point counseling these are golden rule in all these gray areas because there are going to be gray areas that's why this is discussed as a panel there is nothing so, none of man- us Yes, Manoj, in, a, in a peri, it's such a peri, a peri con of uh, Haryana. The, I was there, and the the lawyer was uh, had come from Supreme Court. So she was telling, yes, uh, since uh, in a court of law, as Madam said, uh, the the babies are not viable, but you are still doing, and if something happens, the the litigation about the cost and everything will come up to whom. and they may say ki hame to bataya nahi tha and we were not told so if those things have been documented and you have provided them with information of the survival in us and australia and whatever information you are giving to them and they are agreeing with uh, with the idea of continuing with the care in your hospital with you together as a team then probably you are safe okay so that is exactly the reason why the, uh, the, we said parental counseling joint decision making multi point counseling and documentation all these are important that is the way you are going to defend in such scenario now another question in extreme preterm ma'am can obstetrician take a negative consent for lscs and negative consent for intrapartum monitoring is it legally valid in in an uh, uh, in extreme preterm what you mean is what uh, probably he means is between 26 and 28 weeks no 20 to 26 weeks uh, after 26 weeks we go with the monitoring but of course Uh, we discuss with the parents regarding uh, the uh, uh, need for cesarean section because if uh, uh, the if we, if we do a cesarean section she might be uh, having the morbidity of the cesarean the risk of the cesarean plus the uh, doubtful survival of the baby so actually it is a combined decision and cesarean is not done just for prematurity and whenever there is an indication like a fetal distress we have to discuss a lot 
with these uh, with the parents and then get uh, their consent so when it is uh, after a long period of infertility and all that definitely sometimes we have to go for a cesarean section so it has to be individualized depending upon the clinical situation and Now, the birth weight of the baby th thank you madam so it is a, anyway the the life of a baby is a property of the state so parents cannot just say that i don't want the baby but there are other factors like the financial ones that operate and yes. that actually influence the final decision but regarding the mode of delivery of course it has to be the decision has to be totally a professional decision now uh, about cooling i think uh, the i just some uh, two three questions there is no there should be no confusion this is just a some study helix trial that was done on few centers that said something doesn't mean that therapeutic hypothermia in moderate hi is still the standard of care so the letter doesn't uh, uh, actually uh, tell us that no you should not cool because of the new evidence so uh, cool, uh, cooling in moderate hi only is useful if you are going to do in mild hi it may not be uh, useful there is some debate still going on regarding this severe hi it may not alter the outcome much now uh, passive cooling dr monica has asked do we uh, do do that now i think we discuss now passive cooling should not be done Uh, uh because of the various reasons because the initial period as was uh, as is being stressed with the stabilization is more important and we have time time window 3 6 hours now there is a 3 hours so we have enough time first hour golden hour should be meant for stabilizing the baby not for offering passive cooling and then complicating it further uh any other question i have missed informed cus consent is an important document yes fine uh, in here in neonatology in the unit we should solve issues with local political and relatives including when issues uh, dr suraj is writing about 650 gram i am told about 500 gram uh i think she told about 500 gram not 650 gram okay so some of the you uh, know peri viable period still people do accept uh some sort of unless of course you are in that very very gray area but in uh, in, the, in a depressed baby unless we are properly i mean uh, and we are do properly documenting the whole procedure and both the obstetrician and the neonatologist are on the same page there are going to be issues the uh, it, it should not be a blame game and that will ultimately uh, i mean like uh, result in a lawsuit and as we just discussed the uh, uh, cause of But uh, asphyxia can be more so. Time is uh, is a perinatal event, is a uh, antenatal event, not a acute event. Now, uh, anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to say uh, what is what about this? After this new MTP guideline, twenty three weeks say actually abortion not very viable. and we have answered the yeah, already already answered i think passive cooling uh, anybody any other uh, the thing anybody want to do passive cooling that uh, expert the problem with i think uh, passive cooling is that you don't have the, uh, the uh, control over the temperature and what you are going to cause is a I mean, fluctuation that is the major reason why in the initial part of the helix trial they found that is not effective if you go if you are going to have fluctuations in temperature your cool, the outcome is not going to be good and passive uh, cooling you don't have any control so that is why passive cooling is discouraged probably it can be done under a study or something i don't know now uh, let us we'll conclude here uh, uh, so the all greek philosophy uh, uh, makes sense in the modern day practice the why we are all unhappy the root, uh, root of human tragedy is our difficulty in accepting the, our limit and the subsequent use of force we use force to try and solve problems when a baby is not salvageable we try to solve the problem that have no ultimate solution so probably uh, this needs to be kept in mind uh, so i would uh, uh, thank uh, the organizers for uh, allowing this and I, all the experts they had done exceptionally they, these were the most i was trying to since we had the galaxy of uh, experts i was trying to get the most difficult uh, set of questions so that is why the questions were very vague because other things are there but they had done an excellent job thank you all so much
uh, over to the moderators. Uh, sorry, over to the organizers. Vishnu, Vishnu, let me conclude. Yeah. So, on behalf of the Perinat Perinatology chapter, I thank our wonderful faculty team and all the more than 220 delegates who have logged, logged in on this Sunday and made this program a success. Thank you all. You are free to unmute yourself and speak. Thank you. Can we leave now? Thank you, Vishnu. Thank, thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Amit. Thank you, sir. It was an excellent And I must mention Ajit, sir, Ambuja, madam, and the K folk team who actively uh, was very ready and uh, willing to join us today in spite of a regional conference happening at Kannur, uh, the uh, annual meet of uh, Kannur branch, which is the host branch of our president, Ajit, sir. Thank you so much, sir, and madam, for being with us throughout the meeting today. And also SFM uh, represented by Jyoti Madam and uh, Dr. Vijay. Okay. And our dear leaders, Somshekar sir and uh, Ravi sir, Surinder sir, all from Central NNF. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Love, 2021 team. You have done a wonderful job. So good Thank teamwork. You. Thank you, sir. Excellent Thank host, IAP Vadagara. As Thank usual. You. Now she... Thank you. Thing. Yeah, sir. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all, sir. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can we look forward to many more? Yeah, and we to many more. <laughs> bye, everyone. Best of luck. Bye, sir. Bye, sir. Bye, bye. 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 bye.